Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. I'm going to get it right now. Is it okay? I don't, I don't know if the judge wants to change. Okay. Because one button turns them all on. That right there. Oh. And then I just, just to hear it. And irritate Robert. I don't check all of them.
and then the turn off button's right next.
I forgot what I was doing. It's the story of my life, Margaret. <laughs> okay. okay um, so <clears throat> the, this is what it's going to sound like, Jeff, in the courtroom. And hopefully you can hear okay. Okay, very good. So, so shall, shall we just leave this connection open right now? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, it's worked in the past, and so okay. it, um, if there's an opportunity to, um, Jeff, if you can clue in. Here, let me turn this off. turn my camera and mic off and then when when it looks like Jeff's presentation is live um, I'll re-engage okay sounds good okay thanks so much okay and Mar Margaret let me give you Dan's email address okay uh, he is Daniel D-A-N-I-E-L M-C at cctexas.com Okay, got it. Okay. Um, I'll email him right now. So y'all turn your mics off, and I'm going to go ahead and minimize this meeting. Okay, and so we're looking for some time close to 10, right? I After think so. Slowly. Okay. All right, thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Okay.
this mouth. Yeah. 
There's no light, because the light doesn't come on. Alright, we'll take it to Commissioners, your seating arrangement is just a swap. Commissioner Chesney recommended a circle, like playing poker. I recommended poker. that before, but and you didn't rotate. I said, let's rotate around. Okay, I didn't rotate. realize that. Yeah, when I sent you that email, that we were supposed to rotate each time. That way we'd be all Well, when they get here, we can talk about it. I can rotate with Brent. Swap with Brent? Yeah, and then just Brent, Brent goes up there. John comes here. John comes here. Okay, well, I'm just going to have to get you that other mic.
go. I've got the mics on this morning, and we apologize for the delay. For those of you at home, um, would like to call to order, and at this time ask you to please rise for the invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America and Texas flags. I don't think we have anybody here this morning. Would anybody like to, to say an invocation this morning? I, I appreciate that. It's, not, it's nice to rotate, I think. Commissioner, I think it's nice to rotate. Go ahead. Go ahead, Judge. Go ahead. Absolutely. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we're here today to give you thanks for everything you've given us. We're always asking for something. But today we're giving you thanks for praying for us when we need you, for taking care of those that are sick, for helping us pull through this virus uh, situation. Lord, we thank you for all the first responders, the nurses, health department that have been in the front lines. Thank you for those that are also in the front lines that are not first responders, but they're there. Lord, we thank that allow us to continue to do, do the right things, make the right decisions for the right reasons. And I know you've given us the strength to do the things we've done so far. I've asked you, Lord God, I'm giving you thanks one more time because you have prayed for us, you have blessed us, and we're here. And I can ask you, at the end, I ask you just to bless those that need, to, need your blessings. Lord God, Heavenly Father, pray in your name, we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Joe. Oh. Yeah. Get the really close. At this time, I'll note the time for the clerk. It's 9.13 a.m., and the date is May the 6th, 2020. We're at the Nueces County Courthouse on the third floor in Commissioner's Court. And for the clerk, I do certify that a quorum is present. All commissioners are present here. And safety briefing is next. Tyner, if you'd yield the podium to Timothy. Good morning, Judge. Good morning. Commissioners, ma'am. Uh, we're meeting today on the third floor of the Noasis County Courthouse, located at 901 Leopard Street. As we know, the restrooms are located on the right-hand side of the third floor atrium as you exit the courtroom. In addition, there's a fire extinguisher located at the rear of the courtroom to include five in the atrium area on the third floor alone. In the event of a cardiac emergency, there's an AED located on the right wall as you exit the courtroom next to the human resources. In the event that 911 needs to be dialed, Tyner Edward will be responsible for that. Individual certified, certified participants in CPR today are Dale and Margaret. In case of an evacuation, our egress route will be down the atrium stairs immediately outside the courtroom, proceeding through the double doors located on the leopard side and muster across the street in the CCISD parking lot. In case there is a, a need to shelter in place, we will remain in the building and await further instruction from the Noasis County Sheriff's Office. Our shared safety topics for today are preparing the Noasis County Courthouse for misdemeanor and felony jury trials on or about June 1 while maintaining social distancing practices and COVID-19 precautions. That concludes my brief. We thank you so much uh, for that. And I know you've been working with uh, the judges, both presidings, and it's, it's going to be a, a big undertaking to, to reopen our courthouse uh, in full swing. And so thank you for continuing to keep us safe, Tim. Yes, ma'am. At this time, we've got some minutes, and they are of April 22nd and April 27th. Two sets of minutes you've had a chance to review. Do Is there a motion to accept? So moved. Okay, okay, in a second. Motion and a second. All those in favor of aye. approval signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, everyone. On that, um, we now move towards resolutions and proclamations, and Tyner has three that uh, we would like to have read. Why don't we start with the London basketball program uh, recognizing the london boys basketball program for this their successful 2020 season whereas the london boys basketball program 
led by head coach Ron, is it lawyer? Lover. Lover finished a successful 2020 season with a district record of 12 and 0 and an overall record of 33 and 5. The team also finished the season as district champions, by district champions, area champions, regional quarterfinal champions, and re regional semifinalists. Whereas players from the London Boys Basketball Program were honored as follows. Noah Gonzalez, all academic team. Andre Gonzalez, second team all district and all academic team. J.R. Garza, honorable mention, all district and all academic team. Luke Kozalis, first team all district and all academic team. R.J. Moreno, first team all district. Uh, Navarro and Poteet, all tournament teams and London all-time assistant leader, assist leader. Joshua Chesney, academic all-district. Navarro, Poteet, and Cal Allen, all tournament teams. District MVP, and London all-time leading scorer. Ty Leonard, second team all-district, all academic team, and annual team leader in steals. Bryce Marshall, honorable mention, all-district. Patrick McNorton, Honorable mention, all district. Preston Kazalis, sixth man of the year, all academic team, Cal Allen, all tournament team, and most points scored by a freshman in one year. Pearson Kazalis, all academic team, and Ames Buchanan, all academic team. Whereas the London Boys Basketball Program players include seniors, uh, Andrew Mendoza, Noah Gonzalez, Andre Gonzalez, J.R. Garza, Luke Kozalis, R.J. Moreno, juniors, Joshua Chesney, and Ty Leonard, sophomores, Bryce Marshall, Patrick McNorton, and J.J. Rich, freshmen, Preston Kozalis, Pearson Kozalis, and Ames Buchanan. Coaching staff for the program are head coach Ron Lover, assistant coach John Harris, and athletic director Robbie Moreno. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Commissioner's Court of Nueces County that the court hereby re recognizes the London Boys Basketball Program for their athletic accomplishments and achievements. Judge, um, I think this is the original version. I'm going to make sure we have the right version because this was the, there was another final one. So before we pass it, do, where are the signed ones? They're right over here. Let me just look real quick. I'm sorry. There was some changes to it. Let me just make sure before we pass that. Yeah, we can get that corrected, Commission. Yeah, no, I think it's corrected in the ones we signed. Yeah, this is the, the, the ones that you read had some information not in it, but the ones that are signed are the correct ones, so would move passage for that, <coughs> uh, for that resolution. And I'll second. Thank you. And obviously, we were certainly looking forward to um, uh, having them up here. Um, kind of a bummer, but that's coronavirus that we live in today. Uh, we'll certainly get this to them. A uh, very outstanding year <clears throat> for uh, for London. Um, there were some other honors that were given later for uh, other folks that were in here. Uh, some of them were first time um, in London history, including my son, who was named to the All-State team, which was first time in London history as well. So, No, it, it was an incredible, incredible year for boys basketball, I think in Corpus Christi and the surrounding areas. Uh, but to have you know, London and Ray and Miller just do so well. But we really, uh, we are missing having, I would say, the showcase of having them up here. And so I don't know if there is an opportunity, Commissioner, but I'm still kind of hoping for it. And if, if it, it presents itself, please find a way to bring them up here. Even if it's um, not in court, we can still do something in the atrium. There's got to be something we can do yeah, if, if like that to, lends itself, I'd okay? Like do that. I have several that I pushed off, including the Vets girls uh, basketball team, the Flower Bluff basketball team, the Flower Bluff swim team. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we just didn't quite get them in here in time yeah. um, because we kind of all shut down. And it's an unfortunate thing because I know um, all these – young folks were looking forward to being up here and right. getting the recognition and, and um, all of these programs that we're recognizing today really appreciate it. So, uh, Well, today we saw the magic of video and uh, it's kind of an inside joke for those of you listening at home, but the point is, is that perhaps we can do something, a congratulatory video for a lot of these teams where we just, you know, create personal messages and we can do that and launch. I think that's really appropriate. If anyone's interested, maybe we can do that. I, they need to hear it. And when you get it on the social media, then the public hears it too. But 
and you know, you, you had a good suggestion, and um, maybe um, it's not just for London. I mean, it, right? I, not for I, just I, for London. No, no, I mean, uh, I know you're speaking at the the London graduation, and so oh. I, I know I'll, I'll I will be there as well. And and before we do that, maybe they'll give you five minutes, and I can walk up and we can do it there because it I, is it is a big deal, and it should be. And maybe we could call Flower Bluff and ask them to I, come do a quick little deal. They're all going to have one. Right. And Why don't we try that? Yeah, that's um, a great idea. Just and a I'll, little bit of legwork on your part. I, I'll I reach appreciate out. it. Yeah, absolutely. And and I'll, and vets too. Um, yeah, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Whoever has a school district that we did not we did not get to honor, if commissioners of anybody, let's let's work through their through their um, principals and through their graduation ceremonies. At least for the seniors, um, we can present whatever resolutions that we had. I think that's a, a really smart just, idea. I think just reading it, I think it'll be neat, and you know, it can be just something that we say. Look, this was something we wanted to to, to do, but. We're here, and we want to recognize some, you know, kids that didn't get recognized, and we thought it was important. And uh, you can just, you know, just, you can just read the resolution. I think it'd be neat. I, I, think, be neat I, I think it's great, and then the audience is the right audience too, Absolutely. the parents and Absolutely. loved ones. Okay, great. I think we did. We vote. Did we say aye? Uh, all those in favor of passing that resolution, uh, please signify by saying aye. Aye. And then Tyner, would you read the next one, which is about the Flower Bluff? the girls basketball program. Yes, Judge. Recognizing the Flower Bluff girls basketball program for their successful 2020 season. Whereas the Flower Bluff girls basketball program, led by head coach James McMinn, finished a successful 2020 season with a district record of 12 and 0 and an overall record of 27 and 9. The team also finished the season as district champions, by district champions, area champions regional quarterfinal champions, and regional, regional semifinalists, whereas players from the Flower Bluff Girls Basketball Program were honored as follows. Kennedy Curtis, first all-team district. Lauren Fuller, academic all-district. Bella Bertero, defensive MVP and academic all-district. Emily Clark, academic all-district. Gloria Gurren, Offensive MVP and Academic All-District. Kennedy Orzachowski, Second Team All-District and Academic All-District. Ella Burnett, All-District Honorable Mention and Academic All-District. Megan Bazan, First Team All-District and Academic All-District. Katie Gurren, Academic All-District. Mary Crossland, Academic All-District. Karina Cor Reed, Academic All-District. Anna Widrick, all district honorable mention and academic all district. Meredith Zay, second team all district and academic all district. Taylor Zay, academic all district and Yasmin Nunez, academic all district. Whereas the Flower Bluff Girls basketball pro program players include seniors Claire Naismith, Maggie Harrell, Gloria Gurren, Ella Burnett, Megan Bazan, Mary Crossland, Karina Reed, Anna Widrick and Meredith Zay, juniors Emily Clark and Kennedy Orzachowski, sophomores Kennedy Curtis, Lauren Fuller, Bella Bertero, Katie Gurren, and Peyton uh, Baklick. Student managers Taylor Zay, Yasmin Nunez, and the coaching staff for the Flower Bluff Girls Basketball Program are head coach James McMinn, assistant coaches Amanda Gonzalez, Floressa Williams Basie and Kristen Rodriguez. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Commissioner's Court of Nueces County that the court hereby recognizes the Flower Bluff Girls Basketball Program for their athletic accomplishments and achievements. Judge, I, I would move approval. Okay. I've got a motion and a second. And, and briefly, um, the same judge, um, Coach McMahon, who you know, I think, was a uh, Ray High School graduate, went to school with me. Uh, he actually played on the Ray basketball team while I sat the bench most of the time. Uh, so James and I have been <laughs> friends a long, long time, and he's been a, a huge success uh, in Flower Bluff. And those that, the Flower Bluff girls program has just been outstanding for many, many, many years. And um, it's almost like a regular that we have them in here. So again, this is um, a disappointing thing. We had them scheduled earlier, and then we I put it off for same as with the others for about a month, hoping we might be able to get them back in here, but when the governor canceled school, we went ahead and wanted to get them passed. We're going to get them framed. 
again, I will reach out to uh, Flower Bluff to see if, you know, maybe you and I can go out there for five minutes and, you know, do the same thing at their graduation. I think that would mean a lot. And if they can't squeeze it in, then they can't, but we'll at least ask. But again, these, these young ladies are phenomenal representatives of this community uh, as student athletes. And I stress the word students because um, I know many, many of these young ladies personally and their families. And uh, so this is just uh, another, another big feather in the Flower Bluff girls basketball programs cap. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we just have, <laughs> we've just become, you know, a powerhouse in basketball where I would say, you know, 10 years ago, you might have one team rise to the top and now it's just everybody. And so when you get into the playoffs, you're playing literally your friends. And so again, I, I concur. Let's try to make those happen. But for all of those listening that have uh, friends, um, or children at Flower Bluff, we just send our heartfelt congratulations for an outstanding season, fantastic grit on the court, and really um, just as an example of, of how to be a, a student athlete, I think it's, it's done very well. As they say, go Title IX. I love these programs. People forget that when we were in school, we didn't, we didn't have these great programs for girls. And uh, they existed, but not to the extent that they do now with the support and the scholarships. And it just wasn't that long ago. So we have come a long way, baby. And I'm, la I'm happy to have uh, the girls recognized here today. Let's move on to the swim team. Oh, wait. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Let's move on to the swim team. Also from Flower Bluff. Recognizing the Flower Bluff, uh, the Flower Bluff swim team program for their successful 2020 season. Whereas the Flower Bluff swim team program, led by head coach Brian Hutchinson, finished a successful 2020 season where the Flower Bluff men's swim team placed second in their district, third in their region, and sent six team members to the state championship. And the Flower Bluff women's swim team won both their district and their region and sent nine team members to the state championship where they placed eighth. Whereas members of the Flower Bluff swim team program were honored as follows. Cameron Ainsworth, state qualifier. Craig Bray, district swimmer. District record in the 50 and 100 free. Regional swimmer. Region record in the 50 and the 100 free. State champion runner-up in the 100 free team. State champion in the 50 free. Josh Kautzenberis, state qualifier. School record in the 100 breaststroke. Hannah Hooper, state qualifier. Kira Howard, state qualifier. Rachel Huang, district swimmer, region swimmer, and state qualifier. Kylie Hutchinson, state qualifier. Onachi Isofia, state qualifier. Lauren Lindemann, state qualifier. Gabriela Lopez, state qualifier. Jennifer Pena, state qualifier and Lisa Urig, state qualifier. Whereas the Flower Bluff men's swim team includes seniors, Craig Bray, Ray Favela, Daniel Garza, George Gerbert, Josh Kautzenberis, juniors, Tucker Garrett, Gage Nelson, Josh Ogden, Grayson White, sophomores, Cameron Ainsworth, Tanner Gilbreth, Jordan Lopez, freshman, Nicholas Ames, and Corbin Griffin. The Flower Bluff women's swim team members include seniors Lauren Lindemann, Gabriela Lopez, juniors Hannah Hooper, Kira Howard, Onache Isofia, Mia Militello, Olivia Rue, Micaela Rodriguez, Amanda Stotes, Maya Vagadez, sophomores Victoria Bowles, Kylie Hutchinson, August Mesmer, Madeline Robinson, Samantha Robinson, and Lisa Urich. Freshman Grace Garza, Christabel Martin, Jennifer Pena, Gabriel Rodriguez, and Julia Valeski. Coaching staff for the Flower Bluff swim team program are head coach Brian Hutchinson, assistant coach Juan Zapata, and diving coach Dan Murphy. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Commissioner's Court of Nueces County that the court hereby recognizes the Flower Bluff swim, swim team program for their athletic accomplishments and achievements. Moved. Second. Second. Motion and a second. Judge, same um, conversation. Uh, these these swimmers were phenomenal. Um, the, 
you know, we don't often have a lot of teams of any uh, go to state with the level, uh, with the go to state period, and certainly with the number of students that went to state in the swim meet for, for Flower Bluff. Uh, thanks to Sheriff Hooper, who in, who told me they were having a big send off, I was able to go out there again before all the uh, the world changed and and uh, be there for their send off. It was it was a great deal. They had people lined up all up and down Waldron Road there in front of the school, and it was really a cool deal for for people to to see. And w was able to go out and talk to the coach and talk to the kids and wish them well. And and I do know, and I don't know how all of them have done. I do know Craig Bray, who was the all-state swimmer that was probably the, the the leader of that team. I think he recently it was something on Facebook that he recently signed to swim at Texas A&M. Uh, so, uh, you know, certainly that's an incredible f feat as well. And, and I don't know how all the rest of these folks have done. I just will tell you that, again, it's just outstanding how well. And Coach Hutchinson out there has just been a, a leader. And I'm not sure we've uh, – honestly, this may be – it's really, really – these are all sad, but it's really a bummer because I think this was probably the first time the swim team was going to be recognized and they've had – incredible success for many, many years. So um, pleased to do that. And, and again, I will reach out to Dr. Freeman, uh, London, I mean, the, uh, excuse Flower me, form, formerly London ISD superintendent, now Flower Bluff, and see if we can do the same thing if, if your schedule permits that as well, Judge. So uh, would move passage on that. And I think I did get a second. Thank you. Yes, I think we seconded and, and I can't wait to be able to greet them. Um, I think it was not too long ago, we actually had a Wendy's Heisman diver um, was the most prolific diver in, in the country. And swimming and diving, of course, being close to the water, have always been favorite sports um, for the coastal bend. But to be able to do it so consistently, consistently makes us unique. And so uh, we wish them the best. And I really do, I think we ought to really concentrate on doing virtual messages to our seniors. I know that Del Mar is running a program for this, and I want to, I'm going to flip it to you so that all of you can do it. I was asked to do a virtual congratulatory message for, for those kids at Del Mar. Let's do that for all our seniors. Uh, I think that's something that's really important. And, and I, while it is, I think you said, is a bummer and it's very hard, it's a very hard lesson, it's a very valuable one too. And I think that um, like the greatest generation way above us, for me it was and my grandparents would have been members of that generation. Um, they learned sacrifice in a way that our generation cannot even begin to understand. But these kids that have gone through this moment in time, understanding that they have real loss, they also most likely will contribute in a way to our society like no other generation. So everything we ever heard about millennials and Generation Zs, guess what? It just changed. They no longer are going to get the um, basement designation or living in your parents' basement or whatever that theory is. They now are going to be part of that generation that has experienced this and in a way, like I said, where, where true sacrifice had to be made. Losing the opportunity to go to school, uh, athletics, rites of passage um, that are associated with that last year of high school and that transition to college. For some, not being able to uh, receive scholarships, internships, applications. Um, there is tremendous loss there. So for what it's worth, um, there's no way we could possibly compensate for that. But we can point out that this experience, if they choose to make it so, doesn't have to be anything but um, empowering for them. But they're, they don't feel it right now, and we don't feel it right now. But I think as leaders, we have to be able to message that. So let's see what we can do virtually to wish them congratulations. At this time, I'm going to ask Edward um, nothing. I've got a, um, all those in favor of passing the Flower Bluff Swim Club resolution. Please signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign. Uh, we've got no public comment at this time, so I'd like to move on to the consent agenda. There's items uh, listed A through S, A through S. And at this time, I'd like to hear if there are any that need to be removed. Dale? Letter C is in cat. Okay. Any is that for tabling, Dale? Just a discussion. Okay. C is in cat. It just needs to be discussed. Are there any others that need to be removed because they're not ready, or there is a discussion? Yes. S. All right. S. S is in Sam. Okay. All righty. Let's have an, a, a motion for the approval of all A through S, with the exclusion of C and S. So moved. 
And all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign. On C, Dale, tell us about the uh, special motions list. Yes, sir. There was just a small little error in one of the calculations on page one, item number two for LJA Engineering Corp Corporation, the one considering the uh, County Road 69. If you look at the balance, there was a balance there for 14676 The correct amount is 14976 so I just want to make that correction. So moved. I think we need to make, yes, that correction. Uh, I'll second that. And all those in favor, oh, wait, excuse me. Any discussion, any other concern there? Commissioners, okay, hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye with that correction. Aye. aye. Okay, that's corrected. Now let's move to, to letter S, and um, that's the approval. And Tyner, you've got a, some information, and I do too. The approval of the agreement with Rose Medical Management for temperature checks. Really, it's more of a ratification. Maybe Michael can come in and explain. This is... Um, Rose Medical Management has been the provider of our fever checks downstairs, and we have them occupied through the month of May. After May, we expect to have um, <clears throat> new plans that are helping um, us reopen the courthouse. Those plans are being developed in conjunction with um, kind of a good team, I would think, uh, Sheriff Hooper, because he runs courthouse security, and also um, the presiding judge, Judge Missy Maderi, who the Supreme Court and really through OCA has des been designated as the uh, fifth region's uh, judge to help uh, create the plan that we will then adopt and implement uh, for this reopening. There are no jury trials at this time, and we don't expect them until um, – sometime maybe in, in well, we don't know just yet. could be June, but it most likely is July. And um, we do have essential hearings going on, but everything is being done remote. So right now we have a good system, but we know that that system is going to change. And when that system changes, we'll be having a lot more people in the courthouse. So um, with that, um, let me ask Michael to just stand ready for the question. Commissioner? I'm sorry, did, who pulled it? Commissioner? I did. Yes. Do you have a? Yeah, I just wanted to, the amount of that, because I didn't, there was no backup on that, so. Uh, okay, so on how the figure, how we came right. up with the figure. So what we understand is there are three employees that are providing this service. They're providing it for a period of around nine hours per day over a 28-day period for the business days that they're working for us. And at that rate of $35 an hour, that's how you arrive at the 26460 as a max. If, if, we, uh, if we cease to need the services for the full amount of time, then that would be reduced by what they actually work. So we're only paying for the actual hours worked. Michael, can you also uh, go over, in case anyone missed it, it's not just this location. We also have these fever checks at the detention center. I'm sorry, county court at law number five. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Tyner. And, uh, Calderon. And, and Calderon. And so the nine hours a day is maximum. We're not actually doing temperature checks. Correct. Nine hours at the other locations. Like at Calderon, it's Calderon. just in the morning, for instance. One, one hour in the morning. Right. So there's no way we're going to reach that high of a figure. But if for some reason, you know, things blow up and testing's required all day, but right now we're only doing it one hour at Calderon. What you're saying it's 26,460 for all locations? Yes, that's as a every, maximum. It, that's a maximum. Uh, three employees, nine hours a day. But the, so there's no way we're going to reach twenty six thousand. Now here at the courthouse, I do want you to know they are here all day, and but that's the nature of our courthouse, right? That we've got all these people coming and going. But at Calderon, it's not that way. At County Court at Law Number Five, uh, remind me, I think it's in a couple of hours. And, and what was the funding mechanism? I'm sorry. It's an emergency management. It, this, so, yeah, just so you know, I'm committed to bringing you things that are, quite frankly, already been processed through the emergency management piece of it, but I want you guys to be able to see when there's impactful dollars or it's affecting our courthouse, our way of life, you know, but it, it comes through the, we have set aside $2 million for our COVID response and this gets processed through EOC all the way to Michael's office, which is logistics. I'm sorry, well, procurement, really. Uh, sorry, not logistics. In the EOC. Right. I'm the logistics section chief. 
the uh, the item here is below 50,000 this is an item that we normally would not be required to come to court um, but because of the nature of it being a contract that we're going to sign with them uh, that requires the judge's signature and that's why we bring it before you but it's also under chapter 262 024 that we have discretionary exemptions for items necessary to preserve and protect the public health and this is one of those items but we right. The judge wanted to make sure that you guys are aware of, of some of the things. I just think it's important for you guys to know that we're doing it, that our plan is to keep it up for 30, for this, through May 30th. The only thing that I have is, I mean, it, that's great, but I'm saying, we live, there's the back, a lot of items here don't have backups, you know, and we should have the backups so everything and ex explaining everything. If there was a backup explaining, I wouldn't be asking a lot of questions, right? But a lot of that, we're getting to where we, we're not even putting backups to a lot of things now. I don't know why, but we always had backups for everything before. So, you know, we'll, can, it, can we help with that, Tyner? Yeah, sure. I think it's reasonable. Um, um, when I was doing the agenda um, Thursday and Friday, that's as late as I got into um, uh, doing this item. And um, I, uh, Belinda had a draft, and she got it to me on uh, late Friday. And me and Michael got together and crunched the numbers. And so I put it together um, on Friday and I sent it to Rose Medical. I tracked down that company and I never heard back from them. So I didn't get it out to the court until uh, yesterday. Oh, okay. I, I, I uh, emailed it um, yesterday to uh, everybody. So I, I apologize if I didn't describe uh, what it was yesterday. Thank you. Well, and, I, and I still have not heard back from Rose Medical. Right. So we'll do, we'll try to do our best to make sure that, you know, and if you need backup, if you don't mind, just text Tyner, hey, this is missing something. No, we do. We're yeah. Do. So, um, but again, I, I want you to know that, like I said, I, it feels good to be able to say, hey, look, this is what's going, this is what we're doing. And, and also you should know that as we talk about uh, temperatures, um, when we get to the COVID piece of it, um, that part of the agenda item, I'll loop back in so you'll know, because COVID's not disappearing after May 30th. So you might be wondering, well, what's the plan? Let us develop that with you into that next agenda item. Just because this agenda is pretty strict to, to, to this particular contract. And I think that they've done a good job. I know it makes me feel good, and I think they're just incredibly pleasant and very professional. And thanks to the sheriff's deputies who are down there with with them, they do a great job of saying, how can we help you, or where are you going? Or it's really allowed for a very uh, smart, safe way to do business in the courthouse. I tell everybody, I feel, they say you go out every day. I said, I feel so good and so safe in our courthouse not just because of the sanitation and the hygiene that we practice here, but just because of the sheriff's deputies and, and that, that desk that we have that kind of captures everybody. But it starts with that fever check. One more question. So yeah. This stops on May? May 3rd. May 29th, is that correct? Or May 30th? May 29th. 29th, okay. Yeah, May 29th. It's a Friday. It's sorry. A, I'm sorry. It's a May 29th. That, that this contract will end on. Are we trying to get another contract or what? No, saying when we get to the COVID agenda item, I don't mind talking about it now, Belinda, but I didn't know if yeah, we're, we're just I'm channeling Laura right now. I'm channeling Laura to try to keep us. I was going to address that in, in the agenda item that has to do with COVID. Yeah. But the answer is yes, we're working yeah, on a plan. Yeah, I think we're just trying to align this up with what we're currently asking for from Correct. during this time. And when the time for the service is no longer required, then we would not continue to have this. So I recommend approval. Thank you for recommendation. And is there a first? Uh, yes, thank you. Is there a motion and a second? Okay, I'll second. And all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Um, that concludes the consent agenda, and we'll move into the regular agenda items now. And I know that he's here because I saw him in the background, and the first item is a very important item, and that's to receive a presentation by Richter Architects to discuss the findings of the forensic study of the Nueces County Courthouse exterior veneer. And then the second one is also related, and so one and two is related, and he's walking this way, and you'll remember... My goodness, I guess it's been months now, but a few months ago, 
we charged David Richter and Richter Architects to um, figure out what's going on with the exterior of our building. You'll recall that we, ha we were having pieces of the travertine fall uh, away from the building. And in fact, it caused damage to our, um, our atrium glass. There are many pieces that by the naked eye, you can see that they are very much threatening to come down. And so we asked him to please make a, a forensic investigation and a study and that study has come forth and you all were provided a copy of that study and we now have David Richter to tell us more about it for you to ask questions but just know that you're going to get this presentation but be thinking because the second item is a discuss and consider approval of the Nueces County with Richter uh, with Nueces County and Richter Architects uh, for doing something about what you're about to hear is a pretty big problem. David, welcome. I'm sorry it's under these circumstances talking about a problem, but uh, it feels good to at least know what we've got and uh, what the possible remedy is. Thank you, Judge, Commission. Yes, sir. Uh, it, it, I'm going to just summarize the report quickly and then be available for questions. I think that may be the better way to, uh, to discuss it all. Uh, the, we, we hired a consulting firm out of Dallas, CDC, Curtin Wall Design Consultants, a nationally known firm uh, for uh, uh, forensic and, and design, uh, both, both design and forensic work related to uh, curtain walls and building envelopes, mostly taller buildings, larger scale buildings um, all around the country. We've used them for some very large projects in the past and have a high degree of confidence in them. And in fact, they're doing some work with us in El Paso on the federal courthouse there on some remediation that we've been called in to assist with. So the report that when they came down, they, they uh, did some uh, removal to, uh, to identify what was happening behind the surface and discovered that there are places where um, moisture has penetrated through the travertine stone and has uh, saturated some of the substrate, some of the uh, 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 setting bed, for lack of a better term, a, a kind of a, a layer of concrete uh, that's just behind the travertine and degraded it a, a bit. There are also places where it's penetrated into reinforcing uh, uh, st uh, steel that actually was it originally galvanized. And even, uh, even with it being galvanized over a period of 45 years of having a lot of moisture saturation, it has rusted and is popping, expanding, and starting to pop off some of the face of the, of the structure. Uh, the, there are also places where uh, weld plates, which secure the precast concrete panels, there's about 600 or so of these panels, uh, is rusting and, and, and compromised structurally. So that's obviously a very serious situation. We don't think, uh, we don't think that there's any uh, place where there's a risk of a panel falling off, but we certainly don't want to delay uh, remedy because each panel has like four of these anchors and uh, there's no indication that there's any place where the rusting is so extreme that it would, that it would be like uh, dangerous. But it, but it could be and so we want to move expeditiously. So that's another part of, uh, of the problem. Uh, <clears throat> the building itself uh, when it was first built, had waterproofing applied to the inside face of the concrete, uh, which was done at that time. It's not so much done today uh, because it's, there are better ways to waterproof uh, in, with current technologies. But that waterproofing on the back side of the concrete means that that reinforcing steel and the, some of those well plates and anchors are essentially on the outside face of the waterproofing, meaning subject to moisture. So we think that, uh, that this, this rather urgent concern is also an opportunity to, uh, to remedy uh, issues with waterproofing in the building. And I understand, although I haven't observed this as it wasn't part of the, the, the report, but that there are places where moisture intrusion has existed for some time around the courthouse on this perimeter, and it's very likely related to these conditions. Uh, also, the caulking, uh, by virtue of its age, I don't know that it's ever been replaced. The usually caulking is only good for 
15 or 20 years, and here we are 40, 45 years into the building. So, uh, you know, all of the sealants of the building uh, need to be need to be replaced because they contribute to moisture intrusion. So the 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 uh, the we believe from the report that the in general the proper way forward is to strip off all of the the uh, travertine tile to expose the extent of the condition. So we know we we think we know pretty clearly what the types of of uh, defects are of damage is, exists. What we don't know is how how extensive it is because it, because it's hidden. The first case of stripping off all of that tile and all of the soft degraded cement that's loose to get down to bare sound structure will clearly expose the conditions and identify what remedies need to happen where. We believe that we have a clear enough view of where those of, of the nature of that to do a set of and if judge I may be jumping a little into the next if that's okay I mean yeah I, I think it's all it, kind of goes together <laughs> sure if it's background so, go ahead yeah it's but it's so I mean the report this 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 is suggests the, the path forward which is part of the second item but uh, the uh, we think we have identified clearly enough the various remedies to uh, to come up with an estimated scope for bidding purposes and to bid unit costs for competitive pricing. So we may say there we may identify to bid to replace 50 well plates and give us a price if there are more of competitive price if there are more. And so we think that even though there are very significant unknowns. Uh, going into this project, we think we know enough to put together a biddable set of specifications so that you can go uh, to qualified contractors and get competitive pricing, which is very critical because when you do a project like this, if you hire a contractor uh, on a time and materials basis, you're you know you're you're at risk of 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 not uh, benefiting from a uh, competitive marketplace, which we actually have right now. So, um, so we, that's that. That in general, that's where we are. Uh, if you have any questions about the particulars of the report, I guess that would be the first thing, and then, and then later we can talk more about uh, what we think the, the the remedy is. I think the one thing that, and commissioners, I have <clears throat> had the opportunity to meet with uh, David, and go over the report which was provided to all of you. Um, the one thing that I was concerned about was the material itself. You know, it looks, you know, any building that has the 1977 uh, vintage, you wonder, is it possible to go find this material again? And so one of the things that I want to share with you is that the travertine, uh, which is, I guess, in the marble family. It is. <laughs> it's a marble base. Um, it is available, and it's still competitive in the sense that we haven't priced ourselves out of the market, marbles, that travertine is still available. Do you want to speak to that? Yes, yes thank, you. thank you for prompting that, Judge. Uh, yeah, the, one of the first things we did is we looked to see if the, if the tile, we call it a tile, but it's a stone tile, is available. Uh, we found it readily available in a slightly smaller size. The, the tiles that we have on this building are like an inch and a half by four inches. And, and for a, with a slightly smaller tile, they, they sell the same thing. They may, it may be available in exactly the same size. But we, we think that the pr appropriate thing to do uh, is to respect the original design. And, and we recognize that sometimes people tire of a design after 45 years and think it mm. could be better, something else. But there have been more mis mistakes made over time, architectural mistakes, by changing history than by respecting it. And uh, and uh, I'm going to have to steal that line from you. I oh, like that. Oh gosh, you're going to use that one to come back to haunt me. Like, it is. I like agree, that one. I'm not going to agree with it because it'll haunt me. Like <laughs> <laughs> um, but but the bottom line is is that that was a concern of mine, and at least that's not. But go ahead, C Carolyn's Cost thinking. Can I, can, oh. Okay, so sorry, the, Carolyn first. The travertine is only on what sections? It's just some columns. It's it's the corners. Okay. If you, if you look at the at the tower of the building. Uh, the white uh, precast with the gold windows mm -hmm. 
is one type of precast, and that's not in the scope of this work. That 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 part, the kind of curved part around the windows. But at each corner, there's the curved part that 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 there are kind of what we would call flutes or half rounds. There's like three half round sections at each corner okay. that's completely clad with travertine top to bottom. That's the part we're talking okay. about. I just, I'm going to throw this out there. I love history. I love whole old historical buildings. But with that being said, you really can't tell from the street that it's tra travertine. I can't. So I judge, agree. my question would just be this, because we have so many needs and so many things we want to yeah. do. Can we look at another option? And I don't know if this will work, but just another option like stucco. I don't know. But look at something else, and then you could actually paint it and we wouldn't have a building that's one solid color it would be more attractive and more modern if you could use maybe some other colors one or two color I so, like decorating so, so I'm just seeing that you could do something different and just look at another option it would be cheaper to do that than it would be the travertine so David will you because we I asked the same question um, and David's gonna give an interesting answer because one of the things that we learned that I learned but I want you to address it is that 60% of the, of the travertine is impacted, but not 100%. That's so we actually ran the numbers, and why don't you share with Commissioner, because I think what you're hearing in the, in the directive is we want to, at least I want to fix it, but what is the most cost-efficient way to do that? We're, we're okay if it's not travertine, and tell, tell the court what, what you discovered. We can, uh, in the course of developing the design, which is, the, of course, let me let me try to clarify the stages. Of course, the the forensic report that we're that I'm summarizing right now is sort of step one. Step two is to take that forward into a design. Uh, so now we're talking obviously about the design. Uh, the the area affected by these the this these defects is really the the tower itself. There is a very significant amount of the travertine around the the low portion of the building below the terraces and even in the original jail not the Waco Street jail but the original six-story jail is all clad in the same travertine uh, stone so by the time you consider the impact the, the quantities of the jail and all the ground floor uh, walls and fascias uh, my guess is it would be at best 60 percent it might even be only 50 percent so there is this there and and the intention is to not change the rest of it because that would be a lot of cost that is probably not at all warranted at this time. So we can look at alternatives, okay? And I'm not I'm not dismissing that out of hand by any means. I think it's all you know. It never hurts to do diligence and to think about w whether there is a better way. Um, but my gut, and and we haven't we haven't run numbers on this, is that. Uh, the material itself is not expensive. It's uh, it's like less than five dollars a square foot for just the tile, which is quite quite economical for that material, and uh, and it's not particularly expensive to apply. Thin set and it goes and doesn't even, doesn't even get grouted. So I think it's entirely possible that it may be competitive to stucco. Uh, we we will study that because I think your point is valid, and I think. You, you deserve to see right the analysis yep, the he analysis. again I'm the same I'm in the same mind whatever works to save the dollars as long as we fix it right it, the exterior is not as important the problem is is that it would be better if it were hundred percent impacted <laughs> in other words the fact that it's only 50 to 60 percent it's actually cheaper maybe to go back with that material otherwise you'd have to remove everything so that's the analysis that I'm glad you said it because I think now he knows that that's definitely we want that analysis so we can make the best decision and also so that if we go this route the public understands hey they went back with this material because that was the most cost effective where that's that's the will I think of everybody is to to make sure any analysis brings the best the best dollar amount how about uh, didn't somebody else have a question I did. thank you um, that's a great point, Commissioner Vaughn. I appreciate you bringing that up. I, I'd like to see that analysis, but that's a great response. I didn't realize that's interesting to note that that material is um, competi potentially competitive with stucco. I want to make sure what we're doing here, and, and it's kind of my theme with you, David, and we've talked privately about it, and I've brought it up in meetings. I, I Again, 
my, my perspective is we need to do, in my opinion, what has to happen right now and nothing more. And, and I get that there's always opportunities when you're doing this to look at different scopes and different things. And But as Commissioner Vaughn said and Judge has, we've all talked about how times are tough right now and we certainly want to be cognizant of spending money only where we have to, especially always, but especially now, um, you know, I think we're in the um, need zone and not the want zone, my, my personal opinion. So is I think what you're saying is this is all needed and these aren't wants. These are, look, we need to do this to make sure the structural integrity is maintained and things don't start falling apart and and we don't, you know, kick the can down the curb on preventative maintenance. Is that a correct assessment? That is, that is, uh, if anything, understated. Okay. This, this is not just a need. This is an urgent need. Okay. That affects life safety and not just the, the durability and maintenance of the courthouse. It is, a, it's a, it is a very serious problem that has to be addressed in some way. And the, and the way, and, and you, like anything, uh, you either you either put a Band-Aid on it or you go to the core of the problem and fix the core of the problem. And this, honestly, is not a, this is not a problem that can be solved with a Band-Aid. It has to be dealt with at a substantive level. And we've hired you to give us those recommendations, and I completely trust your recommendation on that. And But I think it's just very important that we reiterate those kind of things to the public, especially in these dire times that, look, we are really, we always do, but we are really, really trying to stay off the want list and just work on the need and, as you said, the urgent need list uh, because certainly uh, that, we know that has to happen uh, and I know we're, you know, that's going to be kind of the, my theme going forward with the ADA work and anything we do inside the courthouse, whether that, you know, and I think, well, I don't, I'll, that's what I think. I don't know what anybody else thinks. Um, and so that's going to be kind of my, and you can answer that as you're presenting other things, knowing that's going to be my question, that I don't have to ask a question. So you can just put it forth and say, this is an absolute need. And, well, this may border on the want, and you've got to decide, but that's going to be my right. question. And, and anything in the capital improvement uh, uh, plan that was developed, it really does separate immediate needs versus future needs. I think we've done a super job so far mm -hmm. on our CIA. On immediate plan. needs. I, I yeah. And this one is in there, so I just want to share that with the audience, is that this one was in there, and that's why we we were all we already going to address the exterior, and then that piece fell down, and it became an uh-oh. And I will say that it doesn't give me pleasure to say this, but it's my responsibility to tell everybody that we're also in hurricane season almost, and um, because NOAA issued a warning yesterday that 2020 is going to track higher than average hurricanes, <clears throat> that's their prediction, that is of concern. The other thing is, and I, told, I respect your uh, position, and I'm going to echo the taxpayer um, concern. The taxpayer is counting on us to make sure this, this project gets done. I'll tell you why, because it's going to cost the taxpayer much, much more if we allow the water to continue to invade the way it's invading. And it's also creating a public health um, issue for the fourth floor with moisture, humidity, and mold. We now can take a nexus between what we've discovered through this forensic study and what's happening. And you may have said, I didn't need a fancy Dallas engineer to tell me. I could have told you the water was coming. But you know what? We need it. We have to have that in order to satisfy the expenditure. And so now I can tell you that mold, that mildew, and those problems are directly related to water invasion. And it is not just the exterior. We could all live with something ugly right now. It's the idea that that rebar, the integrity of that rebar is affected. That makes it um, urgent. And so the funding source for this, when we get to it, just to keep this in your mind, is because it's part of our capital improvement plan and because it's urgent, it would fall perfectly in the CO 2019. And there is, that's what those dollars were, were meant for. They were meant for this courthouse uh, to give it the life that it needs to last another maybe you know a couple decades because we're not going to have the funds to build a new courthouse, so we've got to maintain the integrity of this one so it does last. So this is the exact type of program that a taxpayer 
should uh, celebrate that we are able to address it so that it doesn't cost us twice as much in the future and that um, and that we have the right reports to, to get the right uh, bid. And I want to emphasize what David said because we really hammered it home. And he said, I'm right there with you. And that is in order to get competitive bids, you know, there is a process for that. And we need to be able to be a part of that process. We don't want to say we have X dollars to go do work here. We need to create that competitive nature so that we can get the most experienced work. And by the way, there are people who are really experienced in this exact um, genre. And, and I'm gonna, you're going to learn more about that. Juan looks like he's itching to say something. So I'm going to bring him in, our county engineer. Come on in, Juan. I know you want to address something here. Yes, ma'am. Go morning, ahead. Good morning, Judge. And good morning. Yes, I just wanted to add, uh, Judge and Commissioners, is that at the same time, we are going to be looking at the expansion joints uh, of the, of the precast structure because those do need to get replaced. And also the, wit the window seals are going to have to get uh, resealed. So those, these are additional stuff that we're going to have to do in order to make sure that we don't get water penetrating into the building. And of course, it's kind of like what the judge said. I mean, in the maintenance costs, I mean, uh, we are having a lot of water that's protruding through the building and damaging the drywall and also the carpet. So that'll also keep some of this maintenance costs low, uh, reduce our maintenance costs in the building also. So I just wanted to add that to it. Have we, have we put a better amount of what roughly you think it will cost? Uh, no, that's exactly what we don't want to do. <laughs> Because in order to get the competitive bids, we want to make sure that we can actually get the competitive bids. But there is a range that um, that we can do. But I, I don't want to. Well, I mean, I'm, not, I'm just asking a, a rough figure. I'm not asking. Right. That. Okay. Fair enough. David, do you want to? The penny number, but I'm just saying because if we're going to vote on something, I mean, I got to make sure what you know what we're going to vote on. And, and well, we're not going to vote on anything except for the uh, the next item, which is going to be presented to you, which is to do, um, I'll let David introduce the, do you, or first let me just ask, do you want to address that in, in a range or would you, can we address it in the second item, which we can move from the presentation to the discuss and consider? Judge, can I yeah. just say this before yeah. he says anything? I really have a concern about us even doing a range because I think people see the range and then they say, okay, I can go up to $50,000 and then that's where they're going to hit. So I would rethink it, Jack. I mean, it's up to you, but that, that's the way it works. The public's going to look at it, and they're going to say, this is how much they say we can go. Well, if it was something we could look at ourselves, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. And you know, and I can do that. We can do that with you, no no doubt. But what you're going to get presented with is a contract, but it's not for the overall work. It's just for the piece that I'm going to move us out of the presentation, okay, because you can still ask questions. And let's move us into number two, which is discuss and consider the approval between Nueces County so you can see numbers. The second one has numbers attached to it, if you'll look at your book, uh, and Richter Associates for the project. Juan, do you want to kind of introduce it? And let's look at our board book, and you can see some, some numbers there on number two. Uh, Judge, uh, Commissioner. Did, did we get a copy of the agreement? I'm sorry, I didn't get a copy. Was there a copy of the agreement sent to us? Yes, there should, there, there should have been one in, attached. Should be here. Give me a second. Let me help find it. Big book? Yeah. You're talking about the, the agreement with... The supplemental agreement. Supplemental agreement, supplemental agreement should be there. Yes, sir. It's it's right here. Um, let me. I'm going to go ahead and give it to you because I happen to have it in my hands. It, it does include some architectural uh, services. Because I've already looked at it. Here some structural services. I think there was a. In there too. There was and a then, fee schedule that has an estimated amount of. Yeah. That's okay to discuss because it's in the book and and all of that. We just seventy four, seventy nine, and then twenty five, one thirty five, and then. Thirty-six oh three five five. There was different. It broke it down the way I saw it in different capacities, Thank and, you, and I, it's I get what screens. Commissioner Gonzalez is asking because we're spending a, lo a lot of money on um, architectural. What's it going to cost us for construction, or, or what's an estimate? So well, you can you can usually use uh, an estimate of ten to twelve percent, but again, we don't really know what we're getting into. But it's typically a ten to twelve percent, but. Again, this is the piece that you really need to look at first. You're still going to have authority to the, do the next piece, and it needs to be presented to you. You you won't be married to anything right now, but this is what we need to do in order to to get us going. What I would recommend, Judge, is mm -hmm. once, once the architect, if the architect, architect gets the uh, supplemental agreement approved, 
Um, I would recommend that after they pre they prepare plans that are about 75% complete, uh, the car architect can come in and, and put a cost estimate together for it, and then we can meet with the in, with the judge and, and the commissioners individually to uh, to to evaluate the cost or to show the, what the cost is at that well, time. Let me so one and I, I get because I I'm, I'm I get what both commissioners are saying. It's 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 always a little nerve nerve wracking. Like when we brought forth the, the London Road stuff, we kind of had an idea and we gave the commissioners an idea of what we thought it was going to cost so that they knew that it was going to be uh, what we thought based on your cost estimate. Is there any reason that we can't, do, that we couldn't do some sort of cost estimate that's, that's not held in blood, but that's, you know what I mean, that gives us an idea of what we're doing before we spend the money on fees? The, the only reason about that, Commissioner, is yes, that the reports already, the findings, some of the findings have been already evaluated. However, they have to still have to do some additional evaluations. I mean, the cost can vary from maybe 50 to 20 percent of the estimated cost that they probably that probably Richter can tell you right now. So, my recommendation would be that let, let's get to 75 percent completion of the project of, of the of the design phase of it. At that point in time, we can have a more detailed cost estimate and present it to, individually to commissioners. Also, and, but but I think. I'm not trying to speak for anybody, but what it's and I because I they're right. I mean, we're we're, if, we're looking at committing been, basically spending over three hundred thousand dollars in fees today, in a sense, and yet we don't know exactly what the cost is, and it's if, a little nerve wracking. Well, again, use the ten to twelve percent rule. I do your it. math, and that's going to be a good guess as to where you're going to be in the, in a beginning range. Me. But but make no mistake, um, you're going to get a chance to see and work with. One one on one. Once those seventy five percent plans are drawn, here's the situation: we know a lot, but we're going to know more once we go hire these experts that are listed here um, to absolutely start designing. Yes, ma'am. How we're going to write this RFP? And, and looking at the cost, commissioner, for the engineering and uh, architectural, we we looked at them, uh, we evaluated them to make sure that, of course, construction costs, engineering costs, are Kind of like we talked about, it's about, you know, 10% to 15%, pretty much of the total construction. So basically what you're saying, in essence, then, is we're looking at about a $3 million project just for the veneer and the, I'm sorry, not just for the veneer, for the veneer, for the, or is this just for the veneer? And No, and there's some peer review and interior design on the fourth and fifth floor, but I thought we didn't pass the fourth and fifth floor those, stuff. Those are, those were, yes, sir. The, the, the one we're looking at right now is the, um, is the veneer part of it. This veneer, right? Yes, sir. Because, yes, sir. okay. But, but so if it's $275,000 estimated cost. And for just, you know, we did veneer. do, just clarifying the record, we did four and five already. That's already passed, and we've already done that. What you didn't approve was floor six, just Sorry, for clarification. Thank you. I appreciate that. No, my apologies. So, so yes, yeah, so basically what you're saying is you're thinking it's going to be somewhere in the two, seven to three million range just for the veneer. Approximately. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna a lot of money. Just making sure everybody knows. I mean, yeah, this is what happens when your building is falling down. <laughs> I, I really, I, I try to like softball it. I try to protect this court and it just doesn't work. So let's just talk about it since it's already out. That's right. It's going to be that plus it could be more. And it's going to, and you should not count on those numbers because you don't know yet what's happening. But what you can understand is that your architect just told you three things that should scare you tremendously, that it's urgent that you have a problem with your rebar, that you have a problem with your setting, and you have a problem with your joints. And this is this is nothing to mess around with. And Can I add something? Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in, in the evaluation of the building, and, and you're really, really looking at, if you're really looking at this, is that the longer we wait, com judging commissioners, the longer the cost is, I mean, the more the cost is going to be. I mean, it's just going to get more deteriorated. Uh, no, and let me tell you, I, the numbers are what the numbers are, and, and he's telling us it's an urgent need. I just like for people to know. That's that's it, and I know you do too, and everybody on this court doesn't, so I, I don't want to – I just want people to know we're not just talking about spending I mean, money on the fees. We're talking that this is going to eventually lead to a right. two to three million, maybe more project that comes out of those CIPs. And, again, I think this court has done a phenomenal job uh, of, of uh, using those CIP funds so far for – 
uh, needed needed projects and I think mm -hmm. this is a needed project so I just want to make sure we're yeah clear. And I, I'm no I know I just don't like to, to do talk that. about dollars when there there's too many unknowns you know that's the problem and then it winds up getting misinterpreted that that's the cost and then of course it winds up getting signaled as Commissioner Vaughn just said that that's what we're willing you know that's the range what we need to know is whether or not this court deems it necessary to move forward on this project and that's really what's up for your, your consideration today well and but i think regardless of whether we like it or not we know we have to do it for safety reasons and i think lesson learned down the road for this court because it wasn't done in and i don't mean to blame but when you don't maintain something it deteriorates and it costs more down the road and so regardless we're, we're going to have to do it you know I, I i i agree that we don't need to pigeonhole ourselves into a certain number but you know I think of the city bond that was passed in maybe it was 08 before we did the Broadway treatment plant and we saved something like 10 million dollars because the economy tanked right after right after 08 so uh, economy's still okay but there are factors of of it that are doing horribly uh, you know look at cost of oil and gas and that was a big saver for us in, in road production and that may help us in another area for the county budget but I'm just saying is that I I don't mind talking kind of general areas because I think in the end there will be companies that are hungry enough I think the economy is bad enough to where we are going to um, recognize a substantial savings and you know like any competitive bid we don't like them we can bump them out right I mean we don't have to accept it so um, I mean, I have no problem going forward with it, and I'm hoping that it's unfortunate the economy is doing what it is, but to the advantage of stretching out every taxpayer dollar that we can, then I don't have a problem in, in going out with the bid and saying, hopefully there will be a company that, you know, is reputable, has great, you know, time, you know, service so the project's completed on time and cost savings, that they can deliver something to us at a lower cost than maybe even what we're estimating or, or kind of think that we are now. So that's what I'm kind of thinking, as, not only with this big project, but other projects that we have, is that look at how we are dealing right now uh, with the economy, and that may kind of help us at least in this extent. Thank you, Commissioner. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner. No, no. Okay. Um, uh, Juan, keep going. I know. I know we interrupted you. Judging commissioners, Public Works is recommending the approval of uh, supplemental agreement number one between Noises County and Richter Architects for the courthouse miscellaneous project, which is the extra veneer. So, Public Works is recommending the uh, contract. Uh, Juan, let me ask you a question. I think I just heard you say that we will approve it, but you already done some of the work already. No, sir. The the findings, the 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 evaluation that, that that was done, it was to identify what the, you know. They have to do some testing on the veneer. Uh, they still have to provide the details, the specifications, and to tell the contractor how to fix each. Well, of you ha we haven't touched that area yet. No, sir. We have not. No, sir. How long is it going to take to do the design? Uh, Richter, do you want to talk about that? We're estimating about three months. Well, let me ask you this. Three months. Because you yeah. just said it was an urgent need that affects life safety. Yeah. Can you not move it quicker than that? Because just like she said, we've got hurricane season coming. We've got scaffolds sitting up there. It's going to cost if they have to be moved with heavy winds or whatever. Can that not be moved quicker? Yeah, we probably can. And the reason I'm hesitating is because I have to, I have to mobilize more than just my staff. Mm -hmm. We have to get, get with the design engineers on it and develop a critical path schedule as to what needs to happen for them to agree and, and we have some we have some mm -hmm. stages of review with the engineering department here uh, so there are there you know as quickly as we're going to try to move there are uh, it's a it's a fairly significant effort and uh, I'm just hesitant to say we could do it faster than a couple of months maybe something like that yeah because you see how urgent you're telling oh, totally. us how urgent we're no actually <laughs> We're prepared to put this to the front of the list. I mean, this mm -hmm. is this and is a David. That's a good point. I, it's good for the court to know it's not just Richter that's going to be working on this. When you see this contract, maybe that's something we should point out. It, it's going to be a team. That's correct. And Friesen Nichols is our structural engineer. Right. 
they have a local office, but they're headquartered in Fort Worth, and they have experts in Fort Worth that they're going to be working on it, along with Shane Torno, who leads the local office. So it's a it's a team, and then CDC is going to be involved as a QC uh, peer reviewer. Quality control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, so there are you know three main players in terms of firms involved, and as well as you, the uh, the county, and uh, and the other thing I think it's important to say is because in Nor it's it's actually rather difficult to get competitive bids for things that you can't see, okay, for things that are mm -hmm. unknown. And so that's, that makes this more challenging. If we were to just go out and hire a, a, a construction manager, cost plus, which is a, which is a possibility, uh, it, uh, you know, to do this work, and then they just start work, and then as they uncover things, they develop pricing and give you the pricing, you, you could go much quicker. But you would have you would not have the benefit of of competition in the marketplace at the either at the general or at the subcontract level, and you would not have much of a clue as to what it's going to cost until it's done. And so what we're going to do is to is to develop a whole series of unit costs, some of which may not even be deployed. We may anticipate a certain remedy, and in the end not find the problem to match the remedy. But we designed it anyway and bid it so much per per piece per unit and estimated and, and if in the end when they take it off it's not there you don't pay for it <coughs> and so you get another bite of the apple in other words and, and, and actually on, on very small increments because this will be bid on a on a unit cost basis for all of the parts of the remediation the the only things that will probably be built bid as a fixed sum would be the actual replacement of the tile itself because we know the quantity it's all coming off it's all going back on and so and the and the caulking this the sealant joints we know the quantities of sealant joints that'll be a hard number so we'll have a, t a hard bottom line number on all of those but the but uh, the rusted rebar behind no we can't say how many or this the well plates or if there's any kind of structural reinforcing to the panels if some of the panels are degraded to where we need to put a steel beam behind them, we're going to pr get a price for a steel beam, so a competitive price. So if we have to put in 10 of them, we'll, we'll have a competitive price. <clears throat> so it's a tricky thing, but it's the way that you will get your best price, and you will get uh, a chance to look at it at a detail level. You'll go, oh, yeah, that, that rebar looks bad, and I got five prices, and this was the best price. So, you know. And I understand all that, but I also understand this. If you don't put a thumb in the backs to get it done, it could go longer. And I'm not stupid, I, and I know that's what happens, and it happens with government all the time. So I'm just saying it should be a priority for you guys because you said it was an urgent safety hazard. So to me, that's important that we... And I just Clarify want to address that. it, and we can address it even in more detail later, because I know you're going to want to meet with Juan and, and have him give you this detail, but let me just kind of present that one of the concerns that you raised, uh, Juan has also been thinking about it with, with Richter, and that is is that the, the best thing going forward in hurricane season is to get this scaffolding removed and to net this courthouse. And that way we can move as fast as we can from the team but also con the concern that I have during hurricane season is things falling and, um, again, loss of property, loss of life, or, you know, getting somebody injured. So we want to make sure that um, we're, we've got a, a mechanism going forward. Yeah. And that netting is going to be really important. The scaffolding does you some good, and it's done us good, and it's actually withheld 50-mile-per-hour winds that we've clocked. But at the same time, there's going to be, once we know we're going to go this route, then we need to change directions to protect for safety. And also, it's going to be the better mechanism for this, um, the work that David and, and his team are going to propose. So I just want you to know Juan's working on that as well. I have another concern that I I've always have concern about when do projects of using local people. And because, you know, I've experienced that we use people out of the, the county, it's always hard, you know, they don't come back enough, they're not here enough, you know, it, it takes longer for them to come down here and do the work. I, I think, you know, and now I'm only hearing people from out of, from out of the county, but I hope, I hope we're going to take this in consideration and say, 
Uh, there's got to be people locally, I guarantee you, that they can do just about the same kind of job. Well, Richter is local, and Freeze and Nichols is local, and the third company is... Um, you said they're about Fort Worth. CGC, they're not, but, they're it, but CGC, yeah. But they have a very small part in it. But let me tell you what we need to ask ourselves, and I'm all for local. You need to ask yourself, are you an expert? Um, because if you're not an expert, then you're going to have a problem. So we need to find the people who do this work. But most of these guys, particularly Freeze and Nichols, and, of course, David is local. He's right around the corner. Um, most of the people they hire on subs are local. Uh, but the people that uh, – so in this project, everybody's local except for a very small specialist that, that's got a very small piece of this design team. But I, I, do, I do think that most of the subs are all local because it makes sense for them. <laughs> you know, to work that way. And we do, you know, we, we certainly desire that to happen, but we do have to, uh, we do, well, let me say, we recommend establishing in the specifications uh, experience qualifications because it is specialized work and you don't want a contractor who's doing this for the first time. You want somebody who's done it before. And then, to the extent possible, you, you get local. And invariably, you get lo local workers, but we, you know, it's it's low bid. It's like you you establish the qualifications, and then it's low bid. Whoever's whoever's less. So. Okay, so having that and having the the amount before us, one, uh, can you go ahead and state it again for the record for the clerk that you're recommending approval of something, and then I'll look for a motion. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Polar Works is recommending uh, approval of the supplemental agreement between Noises County and Richter Architects for the courthouse miscellaneous project for the exterior veneer. In the amount of two hundred sixteen thousand five eighty nine, that's the total amount. Okay, and I think I've got a motion and a, a second. All second, and all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Post same sign. Okay, we will get to work on this courthouse, and let's plan on having you know normal reports. Juan, on status update, and also commissioners reach out to Juan, and he can give you a lot more information with regards to details um, as we progress. We're also, of course, having, we have a project manager for the courthouse. You can reach out to them as well once we get going. Okay, Tyner, um, we'll have to change the screen here. Maybe we can put up those maps to receive item number three. Item number three is receive a presentation from Jeff Barton. Hey, Jeff, I saw you out there, welcome. Gap strategies on the possible opportunities relating to the Harbor Bridge right-of-way abandonment. Discuss and consider adopting an order granting an exemption um, under Section 262.024 of the Texas Local Government Code. Just to remind everybody, that's a procurement uh, provision that allows us to hire professional services directly. Planning is a professional service under the code. And uh, Jeff will tell you a little bit about his background. But uh, once a commissioner, always a commissioner. So I shouldn't have said Jeff. I should say uh, he's one of us guys. He's a former county commissioner uh, from Hayes County, and um, but is a is a professional planner. And in this case, um, I've asked him to come in. I put this on the agenda because it just turns out that it's sometimes time. Sometimes it's just time to, to do, address something. We've been working on this project as a coalition for a year now with the city of Corpus Christi and the port of Corpus Christi. And in, I was able to send through Tyner uh, the notes that uh, Jeff Pollock, because he's been our Scrivener, has prepared over time to show that we've been working as a coalition and working also with TxDOT and um, but this is for uh, the approval of professional planning services related to the proposed abandonment of right-of-way of the Harbor Bridge project. And I think you're going to see that, uh, oh, wow, got a great visual here. And the only thing I want to set the stage, uh, you'll understand this, uh, Jeff, I always talk about funding source first. It allows for the ears to hear better. There is a funding source here, and that's CO 2019. We were very strategic in putting dollars for um, these types of works knowing that they were coming down the pike. And so the source is CO 2019, the same uh, bucket, if you will, of dollars that we used for our drainage plan would be the same bucket that these dollars would be 
you should know because it's a professional services, you're going to be asked to go forward and allow the county attorney and myself to negotiate the contract. It will then come back to you for ratification. So that would be the process. And now we get to say, let's talk about this great, this great right of way opportunity that we have. Well, thank you, Judge. Uh, commissioners, it's always a pleasure to be uh, back in Commissioner's Court, especially if uh, I'm not having to be the one up on the dais. <laughs> uh, again, uh, Jeff Barton, and let's see, uh, Tyner, does this, oh, there it is. I was looking at the wrong, wrong screen. I, I want to tell you just a little bit about our uh, qualifications and the team we've put together and how we approach uh, this kind of project. I'll start off with a little bit about who we are and what we do. Again, uh, we're a firm that works in a broad array of urban planning and economic development issues with background in urban infrastructure and infrastructure planning, uh, mapping, and public engagement. Uh, we, are, we particularly love working with counties. We've worked with cities across the state, but, but counties are our real sweet spot for reasons that I think will become evident to you as, the, uh, as we move forward. GAP Strategies has brought in a couple of people from other firms uh, to help us with this project from a uh, really noted uh, landscape architecture firm, uh, TBG, and from uh, Siglo Group. Here's the team that would be working with you primarily. Uh, as the judge mentioned, I spent uh, 12 years in prison as a county commissioner. Um, uh, with me today is uh, Sarah Bosa uh, here, who's a uh, graduate in planning and construction technology and management at Texas State University. Uh, Rob Parsons has got his uh, master's in urban planning. And then you've got uh, Tom Forrest, who will be talking about a little bit later. He was the interim director of the Texas State Facilities Commission, has a lot of experience in public-private partnerships and mixed-use development, both with the state of Texas and in private practice and in the planning profession. Jonathan Ogren is a lecturer at the University of Texas uh, uh, School of Architecture, Andres Gonzalez, and um, my partner, uh, my business partner, Kara Bishop Buffington, who's worked for cities as far away as Boston and for counties all around the state of Texas and worked with me at Hayes County. Just a quick question. It's kind of a personal question. Is, is, is Kara Buffington related to a Blake Buffington? Uh, they, she, her husband is uh, the, the developer. I went to law school with them, and I just can't. It's just, it's just personal. I'm, yeah, yeah uh, they are. My understanding is that they are uh, like or third or fourth cousins. No big deal. Just uh -huh. okay. Yes. I was just going to tell you. Her something. husband, not her. Yeah. Okay. So, um, she gets that question a lot. I think he's he's kind of gets around. Yeah. Well, his you know funny story, Judge. His sister was married to Randy Quaid for oh. a while, long time. That was his wife. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, uh -huh. anyway, sorry, yeah. just was going to tell you to tell Blake hello if that was She her. claims, she, yeah, she makes a lot of that on bar bets. There you so. go. That's right. Uh, I really, our, our focus, I think, is very on target for what you're needing to do here in the Gateway Project, really county management. We've worked directly with MPOs. I was on the board of an MPO, uh, in addition to being on the commissioner's court for 12 years. Uh, we work a lot with TxDOT. We've done strategic plans for counties around the state. We've worked on development codes. We like to think we're, if not the, at least one of the uh, premier firms in Texas to work with counties on uh, how to manage subdivision and development rules and what counties can and cannot do in either bringing in and incentivizing development and managing uh, development as well as what cities can do. We do mixed use development. I've worked with Fortune 500 companies on both bringing in development and managing things like uh, HEB and Walmart projects all around the state. So we've got a lot of experience in the private sector and with things like Vitruvian Park in Dallas, which is a $1 billion mixed-use development uh, in Dallas, and downtown and historic plans, things like Terzas and other uh, innovative ways to incentivize economic development plans in downtown uh, areas. And along the way, we've won our share of professional awards from the American Planning Association and the uh, American Society of Public Administrators or members of the kind of standard professional organizations and have been pretty involved there. That's won us, uh, frankly, some praise from uh, clients like Commissioner Debbie Gonzalez Inglesby, the former president of the County Judges and Commissioners Association for the South Texas uh, region, things that we're proud to have earned. And uh, I want to talk very briefly about why we think we're just an especially good fit for Nueces County. 
I spoke to having earned our chops working for local government. I was a commissioner in Hayes County in addition to this private practice, but we also have experience uh, here in the Coastal Bend working for places like Aransas Pass, but specifically in Corpus Christi. Tom Forrest, who's a senior project manager for us, uh, was, uh, was uh, for a while the president of the Heart of Corpus Downtown Revitalization Program. For a number of years, he worked five years as special project manager for the city of Corpus Christi, so he knows his way around Corpus and was in on some of the origins of talking about revitalization in Corpus back in the 1990s. Rob Parsons, who's on our team, who you saw his picture, worked with Scott Polikoff on the C District plan, and although he wasn't to, uh, a principal in it, did work also on the North Beach plan, a little bit commissioner and familiar with, and uh, I've known Scott Polikoff for 25 years, so we have some exposure to what went on there in North Beach. I mentioned the Vitruvian Park project in Addison. Uh, one of our members is a former city manager of the city of Addison. So we've been very directly involved in local government on your side of the table, and we've worked all across the state for clients helping them do a variety of projects, as I alluded to earlier. From Bear County into the Valley, and for places like the University of Texas at San Antonio that hired us to help with smaller local governments, teaching them how to approach economic development and um, how to manage growth in their counties in the Eagleford Shale and other places. We also think one of the things that sets us apart is our ability to work with stakeholders, both public stakeholders and your citizens, because nothing can be successful if you don't bring your citizens along. I heard you talking, uh, Commissioner, about the importance of really letting your constituency know what's going on in projects, how critical that is to the excess of anything. And that's really one of the things that we think sets us apart as planners, that we don't do plans in isolation, but we really recognize the absolute critical importance of bringing uh, citizens along and making sure that they're informed every step of the way, whether that's the, the public partners that you have in a project or the people who are paying the taxes, because after all, that's how and why government exists and how it works. So we make that uh, a, a first wrong priority all along the way. We'd want to talk to you about how much you want to engage that in this project, but you'll see from the people we've worked for that they recognize that that is really one of the things that uh, I think we do best and one of the things that really does set us apart because we incorporate it from the very beginning of the project. Also, I'll mention that um, uh, four of the, pe three of the people on the team uh, are uh, native Spanish speakers. Uh, I am not, pero yo puedo hablar en español también si necesito. Uh, and, uh, bien, muy bien. That was good. Uh, so, uh, Sarah likes to claim that being a native speaker, she speaks better than me, and I, we, we argue about that occasionally. Uh, we, we really do have a team tailored for Nueces County. You're not going to see us bait and switch and see uh, junior members who you've never seen before show up. You're going to see me and other folks who are on that slideshow throughout the process. We really believe in building relationships, and we're tremendously excited about helping you create and implement really a county vision that can create this real landmark for uh, downtown Corpus and for Nueces County. We're inspired by the kinds of innovative projects we've seen elsewhere in Texas. You know, the, the Pearl Project, I think, is, is really potentially an inspiration. What they've done in Dallas around Clyde Warren Park, Discovery Green maybe in Houston offers some examples. There's other places around the country like the uh, Rose Kendi Greenway in Boston, what they've done in Rochester. There's really some great examples to learn from, but you can do something in Corpus that's unique and that is really a model for the rest of the country. I know that the Port Authority has its own ideas about um, what can be done here. We're, we're tremendously excited about it, and we can build on the work that's already been done. We don't have to completely reinvent the wheel, what you've done with the C District plan, what you've done with the North Beach Initiative that you've worked on, Commissioner, and uh, Mr. Polikoff and the city has worked on with a UDAP plan that AIA started in 2014. I've read that, a great plan. It doesn't have the kind of specifics and how you get from point A to B, but it's a great visionary plan to at least you know, start from and get some ideas from what the city and the Port Authority have done and, of course, what the Right Away Coalition has been working on over the last year. Um, and just, just just to touch on that, well, I'll get to that in a moment. Just, I'll talk a little bit about what GAP Strategies done, does and how we approach projects. A lot of 
firms get into thinking about very doctrinaire, you know, rigid planning principles. And one of the things that what we kind of call the gap strategies way is that really communities come first. Every community is really unique. You have this very special culture in Nueces County and in Corpus, and that's critical to us that we really leverage the strengths that already exist here and allow for flexibility to create something that really is unique to the, to the corpus character so that we build a real vision here. You've started on that vision, but you don't yet have a county vision. You have these other visions that have been developed, so we want to uh, mesh those visions together to create this county vision. That's what we've done successfully in other places that it, where we've built partnerships between the community and different partners. And it, again, has created these kinds of endorsements that we see from other public officials that we've worked for. Um, in some way, we really do believe that we bring some unique professional qualifications for this particular job and the right approach to a plan that can help you uh, create what you're looking for here, uh, a commitment to a community-based plan and a, real, a plan that really brings you character. I think if you talk about specifics, talking to the Port Authority, you maybe need some help in creating some detailed parcel level maps that will help you immediately get in and address how you're going to talk to TxDOT about dedications that get you the scaled exhibits and GIS files and the, and the narrative that you need to address uh, justifications for aggregating sites around the old courthouse uh, that will get you those files and allow you to make a claim for the county with TxDOT and cooperate and coordinate with the city and uh, the, the uh, Port Authority. Uh, you need to begin to outline a process for future budget years and out years how you're going to create some phasing to attract really not just local caliber or statewide caliber, but national and world-class caliber mixed-use developers or a public-private partnership that will give you the kind of uh, mixed-use development you want. I heard you talking in the previous item about getting return for taxpayers and having to spend some dollars. And, and, and the good news is this is the chance to really create an income stream for New Aces County and Corpus Christi that lasts for generations to come. That's not only beautiful and creates an attraction for Corpus, but I've, I've heard you say, Judge, something that really changes the face of New Aces County and Corpus Christi, creates this destination but also creates real economic development jobs and income uh, for, for Corpus and Nueces County. And to create some visualization so that you can understand and you and your citizens can get this picture of meshing these plans that already exist and coming to some idea as a commissioner's court and as a county of really how you want to shape this and, and what you want things to look like so that not only you have that idea, but as you put things out to bid and build a future team and future phases, what the, what the people who are maybe bidding on that project know what you're looking for. And um, beginning to uh, uh, really put that into uh, pictures and working with your targeted stakeholders and your public to uh, phase that in so that next budget year you have a, a, a clear idea how and that works. And so perfect segue, I, I don't know if we need them, but I just wanted the commissioners to know I think they're listening in. I think Tyner actually just went to make sure that they're on. But Dan McGinn is the city planner uh, that has been working with the Right Away Coalition, and I believe he's on the phone or at least, you know, through technology participating. And Jeff Pollack is also on the GoTo meeting, and he represents the um, the urban planner, if you will, uh, also former MPO director here in, in the Coastal Bend, and he is working with the Port of Corpus Christi. So because our county does not have a planner, that we don't have a planning department or, or anything of the like, um, the city and the county and the port, uh, and I gave you guys the notes, I tried not to bury you with with documentation but i gave you three highlights of summaries that jeff pollack put together for us and you'll notice that the first one came in september of 2019 and we had our first meeting in june of 2019 and it was all a result of the two maps that you have before you uh, the maps that you have before you are certified by TxDOT as being the most accurate representation of 2020 title today. And so when the Harbor Bridge comes down, what you're looking at 
and what Jeff Barton, who's here, has been given a copy of. These are the maps that designate the right-of-way reversion. What does that mean uh, for those of you at home? It means that uh, when the when the bridge um, has when we have a new bridge, we'll have a new way of accessing that bridge, and and it doesn't include the way we do it now. <clears throat> and so all of that concrete needs to be removed. And when it does, the rule basically says that. If you own the land before, you're going to get that land back. And so what your maps show you is everything in yellow reverts by law, by title, back to the Port of Corpus Christi. And the reason that they have such clear title is because it was their land to begin with. And they gave up that easement to build the new Harbor Bridge. So now that it's no longer needed, they will get that back. But what's exciting about this map is that everything in dark blue, by the way, it almost looks purple, that is distinctly city. Okay, so everything in that dark purple goes back to the city. It's, again, it's like the port. There's, it's clean and clear title. But what's exciting is everything that's in green and in light blue is either public dedication um, or uh, TxDOT owns it right now. And so I gave Jeff, because he is an expert in this field, the opportunity to look at these maps and we discuss the process. And just to remind you, we've had this, op I think we've talked about it before, but the process is such that we can petition as a coalition, TxDOT commission, no legislation is ne needed, and we can develop a plan, and rather than purchase this land back, we can ask the TxDOT give us this land. There are different processes that TxDOT uses. Because of COVID-19, there is going to be an extra urgency for economic development. Because of the energy crisis and the volatility, there's going to be an extra urgency for di diversification. There is, there's always been a great case, in my opinion, because we started this, actually, we started it last February in the legislative session, but we got organized in June as a coalition. Judge, what does public dedication mean? I mean, in other words... What does it mean? Uh, it means that it can be given to uh, any, any public jurisdiction. So none of... It could be the city. It could be a public jurisdiction. So none of this is clear, as you've said. County. That's correct. County. Except for... That's correct. None of it's clear county land. It's just you... It's up for grabs. <laughs> Okay, but it's right. So, so the city's going to take theirs, and the port's going to obviously want theirs. Cause and then the th and then the three of us want to come up with a plan. The three of us being the the, po the Poca, the city. I know the port, the city, and the county formed a coalition a year ago with all the other stakeholders, MPO, TxDOT, everybody, and we actually offered to run title to figure it out, and TxDOT said, "No, let us help you." And so is, is is mm -hmm. the presentation today inclusive of POCA and the city being involved? So, so, yes, they all would work together, and that's what Jeff and Dan McGinn are on the phone for. Now, the city hired Asakura Robinson, a very famous and well-known uh, planner, a national planner, and they are working on a downtown vision along with Dan McGinn and they didn't know about this. We brought it to their attention, and they're going to be incorporating, obviously, this inside their plan. Oh, wait, when you say they've, they've, they've hired Asakura Robinson... To do a downtown vision plan? But not to include this? It did not include it. So will this uh, presentation today from Mr. Barton, mm -hmm. will the city participate with us financially? Yes. Financially? No, they have their own, which is Dan McGinn. They have their own planning department, their own operation. The port also has their own planning department. It's represented by Jeff Pollock, and we need our own too. <laughs> and that's what Jeff Barton represents. He represents somebody of equal skill set. Um, sorry, Jeff, I'm trying to be equal here and not get in trouble with my friend Jeff Pollock. If they weren't on the phone, I'd say he's the best, but we've got three fantastic, uh, you know, uh, folks that would be working together. We would submit, if you'll read the notes, that the plan is, and our senator is kind of been representing us in this, we would represent a unified plan that all three jurisdictions would agree to. That's the goal. And this plan would be brought before Chairman Bug and the Tech Stock Commission 
in hopes that we can be granted this easement given that we have a strong economic development plan uh, for the purpose of this land. But there's a lot to work on. There's actually roadways, MPO. Um, this really is, is in Carolyn's uh, precinct. There's a lot of you know, issues that she's had to face with the Hillcrest community in trying to get this area redeveloped and make certain that there's never a cut again right, that they are incorporated. And this is just a tremendous amount of acreage. And I'm sorry I don't remember. I bet someone on the phone could tell me how much acreage this is. But the idea is, is, you know, what are you going to do with it? And it would be nice to wait. Of course, everyone always wants to wait. But if you wait, you're going to A, miss the boat, B, not be ready in time. As it is, I think we're kind of late to the party. But the, co the goal is is to figure out how the county, the city, and the port want to participate. And if you're wondering why would we want to do that, the answer is plain and simple, great, whole, cold, hard cash. Our ad valorem depends upon growth and development. This is our opportunity to help shape that. In addition, we do own land in this sector, and it's the Nueces County Courthouse land, and it's why five different developers are waiting for our engineers to do their report because they know about this too and there's an anxiety there's a good anxiety not a bad anxiety about how we will uh divvy it up so to speak right and there's no preconceived notion by the way um i would say only jeff pollock probably has some preconceived notions because he's got the cleanest i mean look it's just so perfect for them right so they can they can go forward in planning with some confidence because they know that that title reserves back to them. That is on both sides. You'll notice, Carolyn, Commissioner Vaughn, it's on both sides. So it, it's all over North Beach, plus all the way past the ballpark, um, close to the Museum and American Bank Center area. So it goes way into the C District. So they need to be, but, but the nice thing is that the coalition is willing to talk about everything, right? They they want to have a unified plan. We just don't have staff. Our or our courthouse is not was not built for that. And as much as I'm trying to get us there, um, it's gonna take people like Gap Strategy entities entities and people, uh, the principals and the entity that Gap Strategies to get us here. Now Scott Polikoff, who Jeff mentioned, was kind of the the guru, if you will, for the city for many, many years. And again, they have chosen to go with Asakura to do their new downtown piece of it. So we really want to bring in Asakura to, to make sure the whole vision is complete and that they don't leave it out. I'm on that committee. I want to see if Carolyn will get her on that committee. I will have to ask the city, but I think they want as many voices as they can. But the need is to start this project now because we'd like to get it to TxDOT by the next session, which is 2021. And in order to do that, we, we've got to start now. Um, and again, the way it typically works is you'd have to pay for all of this. We want to offer something better. And uh, Judge White, mm -hmm. I guess my question is, and uh, I think this is a, a very interesting project, and I, I'm, I'm very obviously interested in, in somehow being involved in this because anytime we can uh, get usable land and so forth, but I'm trying to kind of walk through this. Is there, and, and no offense to, to the presenter today, I'm just asking the questions, is there not a reason that if if they've already got the city working on it and then Pollock's working on it, is there not a reason I, that we, do we have to have a, our, I don't know, I'm trying to figure out why we have to have our own planner when there's, I mean, I, I certainly, I agree with you. I think Pollock's great, and <clears throat> I, I would trust him to do us right because I think the port would, and I think Pollock would, and, and Dan does a good job, and so I'm right. just so, asking, you know. So the why. issue is it's not within the scope of work or the Port of Corpus Christi's job to take care of the county, and it's not the city of Corpus Christi's job to take care of the county, and so while they want to help us and work with us, it's not their, um, it's not in their scope to do our work for us and so we've always but we've had lots of interlocal agreements where we've mm -hmm. co-opted with them and shared expenses and 
worked on roads together and beaches together and and if you have an agreement in place of a cost sharing agreement right. let's say in place that we then I think I don't why, I wouldn't why I would just like to I just don't think that. that um that the city of Corpus Christi or the Port of Corpus Christi governing bodies city council and IE um the port commission would would like it very much if the, if somebody else is doing our work I feel more comfortable having somebody represent our interests. I'm not ready to cede interests, uh, particularly when we're it. It's not like it's all kumbaya. I mean, I mean, if you just say that to them, why don't you draw it to your favor and not ours? We have to have someone who represents our interest, and 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 I believe that that's best done in a collaborative, you know, effort. I hear what you're saying. I mean, saying they I, do good work. I would just like to see that as part of this analysis as an option to to look at because you may be right and probably right, um, mm -hmm. but it would be nice to be able to see a comparison to say, okay, is there a way to cost, cost share? Because if you cost share, truly cost share, then our interests are provided as long as yeah. you have a, an appropriate interlocal agreement, memorandum of understanding, and a cost share agreement. Um, then, then they do have our interest, and, and they've done that with us. In right, the past. and I us. actually did ask, just so you know, from the port, and they said, "Hey, we are, we're happy to be this. We're happy to be a part of this table." But remember, they've got theirs; they don't need to do any more. Um, I think that I did ask, but again, it's not. It's it's kind of like I'm not my brother's keeper. I mean, it's it's our job to take care of our interests. And, and I think it, while I think these three would work very well together, in fact, you've, Jeff Barton's talked to Jeff Pollack, uh, we certainly floated the idea of, of cost sharing, but again, they have modernized. They have planning departments. Just so you know, when I joined the Port of Corpus Christi six years ago, we did not have a planning department, but they modernized and they hired Jeff uh, Pollack. Uh, Corpus Christi, of course, has always had a planning department because cities do that. They plan. Um, our county has not modernized, and we're getting there, but we are looking more rural um, all the time to me as I dust off and, you know, dust the de as, as I blow off the dust of our books. Um, That's a good point, and again, mm -hmm. I guess to me, and this isn't the first time I've said it, I'm, I'm struggling with Again, no offense to the presenter, I'm struggling with consultants during this time. Mm -hmm. So again, I don't disagree with your concept of yeah, I understand. planning and, and maybe, you know, we need to, as you say, modernize and have a planning department or have a Jeff Pollock on staff or, or a Dan McGinn or something like that. And it's and so those are good long term approaches that we may need to look at how we do that. So I'm just I'm just struggling. I know I'm just, I know I'm you really struggle. Really struggling with consultants yes. during this. I know time. I, I know you struggle. But, but I I, I can only tell you that when WTI sure and this guy will be a lot cheaper than hiring a long term planner uh, or putting a planning department and a travel budget and utilities and office expenses and I'm totally mindful of the taxpayer. In fact, it's because of my mindfulness that I bring him because I can tell you something. If we have not learned that this community needs to diversify from energy right now is the best time to have your eyes wide open. If we, this is part of our recovery. As I said, I was already excited because I generally economic development excites me, but now after COVID, it is absolutely imperative that we create ad valorem for our future. We cannot be dependent upon the industry to carry the day because they are volatile. Anyway, uh, Commissioner Vaughn has a question, and, and I, I don't know if I'm, I'm feeling it over here, too. Yes, I have okay. a comment. Comment. I, I understand what you're saying, Brent. I do, and I don't think there's anybody any cheaper on this court than I am. But after working on the North Beach, on, I'm cheaper. no, not cheaper than I am, but after working on North Beach Project and seeing what can happen if you invest and in what can come back to the community, this right here is prime property. We are crazy not to have someone represent us. The city's not going to represent our best interest. Love the city, but that's not going to happen. And neither is the port. So to sit there, 
I think we have to do this. And I don't like spending the money, but we can get money back, a return on our money, if we will invest and look towards the future. And I, I agree with you, Judge. I think this is one of the things that is so imperative that we do. This is great property. But my question, that public dedication, it's obvious that TxDOT owns such and such in the port in the city of Corpus Christi. So the public dedication, no one really owns, so y'all would I'm have gonna to. I'm going to ask Jeff Barton. You might have more experience. This is how TxDOT gave us the, the legend. It says public dedication. The question is, does that have a internal meeting in that, is it any public entity based on, I mean, I know I'm asking you something that we should ask TechStop, but what do you make of that? Yeah, but, uh, Jeff, yeah, switch him real quick. Like, if you don't mind, we'll hold on that, on that and get that answer. Because I'm not sure if, who choose, well, that's why we want to create the three of us to make that distinction. Because let's just pretend for a second, hypothetically, pretend that everything in light blue is the city. You wouldn't want the city to have that spaghetti bowl. That wouldn't make any sense at all. So we have to come up with something that's city, county, and port um, that, that makes sense. <laughs> and it, that to me is, is where uh, the gap strategies comes in. And it has to, they have to work with the MPO because you still need pedestrian movement. You still need vehicle movement. There's a lot that goes in here. It's not just all green space. It's got to be a mix. Yeah, Jeff Pollock, we're putting you on the spot. Hey, Jeff. Okay, tell me when you can hear me. We got you. We got you now. Okay, nice, nice to uh, be with you all virtually. Thank you for the opportunity. So when you look at the, the map, first of all, I think that the area to focus on in terms of the legend, and I will say that we have, um, these are static maps in PDF form. We're working with the TxDOT surveyor to get these in GIS and CAD formats so that we can actually get down to plan granular planning work. But it's the area in green that is owned, be simple, by TxDOT that I think is the most in, of, of the most interest here. Once the bridge is down, and the Harbor Bridge right away is effectively vacated, TxDOT has no reason to retain ownership of that right of way. And it's my understanding that that is the area that will be subject to a declaration of surplus property. So what we've done with this Harbor Bridge right of way coalition over the last year and a half is try to rally as as local public jurisdictions, as, as local governmental entities around the idea of a unified request to TxDOT for declaration of surplus property, meaning that what had formerly, formerly been owned by TxDOT um, for the construction of the previous Harbor Bridge when it's no longer required by the state and declared surplus, there's, there's a, um, a hierarchy of rights of refusal that's offered to both to federal, then state, then local entities. And the notion here is that because the county holds the courthouse, the opportunity to amass property around the courthouse and create a blank slate for redevelopment to create a world-class destination, both as an economic driver and to serve the, the citizens, the community, is absolutely in the, in the county's best interest. I can tell you from the port's perspective, as the judge mentioned, we have a pretty clear sense of which portions of the right of way will revert to us directly. We already own them, be simple, and, and TxDOT uses them by way of easement. Our involvement is in this is really purely motivated by, by the interest in seeing a unified local front to try to accelerate this process of identifying and securing surplus right of way so that we collectively, as a community, can begin this planning process in earnest rather than waiting until after the demolition of the bridge, after TxDOT goes through its, its standard process for disposition of, of surplus right of way, which means that we have you know, a, a blank slate downtown for the, the foreseeable future where we could instead be reinvesting in an in, in economic engine and in a, a resource for the community. Um, with respect to, to the potential role of, of Mr. Barton, what, what he and I, you know, it's been a visit with him today, what, what we've discussed is, is his role in the next step for the coalition. So when the coalition 
And again, I mean, the, the Harbor Bridge Right Away Coalition met a week or so ago. Uh, we decided that the, the next step was for each of the entities, the city and the county primarily, because again, the port doesn't have a, a new stake in any of this right away, to identify at a granular level which pieces of the right of way, which pieces of the corridor they would be interested in securing if they were to be declared surplus. The idea is that then the three entities would come together and furnish a single unified request to TxDOT to advance this declaration of surplus property. And so I, I what what the city has and what the port has and the county does not have in terms of staff capacity right now is the ability to dive in at a granular level and and think through the, the planning potential and identify exactly which parts of that right of way would be important to aggregate around the courthouse to create the opportunity that you all believe in. Um, again, from the port's perspective, we, we have no skin in this other than seeing this opportunity realized as a, a truly regional entity with representation from both the county and the city. I've been given the go ahead by our leadership to stay engaged in this and try to facilitate the process. But our ambition is really to support the county and the city in doing so. Uh, and, the, and the end goal is to furnish a unified consensus request to TxDOT on behalf of, of all the entities involved. And, and just to uh, Jeff, and just so you can, as they say, confirm, verify. Uh, I know they trust me, but it's good to verify. We have engaged our legislative delegation on this. And, and that includes um, Chairman Canales, who heads up the House Transportation. And uh, Senator Hinojosa actually wrote a letter on our behalf, letting Chairman um, Bug know that we had put together this right-of-way coalition. So uh, Judge, we've been able to keep everybody in the loop. That's really important, because uh, Chairman Canales has certainly been a, fr a friend to Nueces County. Yeah. He helped us a lot with some of the things that, you know, yeah. we, we, we talked about. That last session, and I'm, I'm glad he's involved. And certainly, keeping all of our legislative delegation is right. really crucial because uh, the one thing we have, and we are really fortunate, you know, it's, it's, is having such a strong legislative You're delegation right. on both sides of the aisle. So keeping Todd and Abel and Senator Hinojosa, and, and including um, Can uh, Rep. Canales. Chairman Canales, and, and of course, we want to make sure Senator Colcourt is involved in that. Right, so and we're, we're and, pretty well loaded as far as just having everything covered. We just got to make sure we work them hard. So right, that's and so you him. noticed. I'll let you read the tea leaves. You noticed I said the reason we need to start now is for 2021. There's a reason for that. <laughs> and uh, and Lois Colcourt and everybody, Senator, everybody's has seen these, all our delegation have seen these maps starting from last session. And it's kind of exciting because now they're just waiting for us. But you can see from Jeff's stance, they're really, they're, a, they're not just an observer because they're certainly, you're certainly giving so much more than observation, Jeff. But their skin in the game is already um, written for them, right? Their destiny is written. It's in yellow. So they're good. And that's why they're not going to do the work for us. And I'm, I'll just say it. I know you're going to be too polite and you're not speaking for, you know, for the commission. But they're just not going to do it for us because they've already got their work done. And just so you know, this was a lot of work uh, for title um, that the port did through their council, a lot of money spent. And... So yes, so this is this is the reason. If you had to go buy these lands, it'd be worth millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. And we're saying, let us let us invest a little bit because our COs are really meant for um, at least a small piece of it that you know we put forth in the suggested column. Uh, we put some dollars towards doing some studies. We said drainage would be one of those, and we've spent a little, just a little bit of money there. And this is the other one. And so I think that, um, you know, that's that's kind of where we are. The city's got a, and I'm not saying the gap strategies, you're just as good as Asakura. I just mean that the city's put forth a really robust team. And we need to have someone who can represent our interests and the interest of this court. And it's exciting to start this now because it would it would transcend into the time where all the legislators are on point. You know what I mean? I think we're just as good. We're a whole lot cheaper. You're a lot cheaper than Asakura. Yeah. The judge, may I offer just one more comment here? You bet. My understanding of, of the tech stop process is that um, it does take a, a, an explicit request from a public entity to initiate 
TxDOT's declaration of surplus property. So just as TxDOT undertook this title delineation in response to a request from the coalition, you know, so in other words, we've already accelerated this process beyond where it would have been otherwise. It will take an explicit request, and I think there's real power in a unified and consensus ap uh, approach to this from the different ent different public entities locally. But it will take that request to get TxDOT to move forward with their declaration of surplus property. We, by furnishing that request before the project is complete, we are asking for a variance in their process. We're asking them to deviate from their standard process. And so inevitably, this will be a long discussion. We need to look at what the statutory basis is for that process and where the opportunities to, to deviate from it are. And so certainly timing is of the essence here, even with the delays in the bridge project. We know that if, if we want to be able to, to break ground on redevelopment, um, immediately after or soon after demolition of the bridge, you know, we need to move forward as a region on this as soon as possible. Thank, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, in order to get to this map, he's saying we had to do a lot of work, and that's why we've been at it for a year and a half, and, and this will be uh, unquestioned because it's TxDOT's work product as opposed to someone getting up there and is, so that we don't have any danger anymore knowing what the universe is. This is the universe. And the best place that we can be is to present a unified plan to text.com 2021. Oh, yes, sir. I think Commissioner Maz, uh, wanted to say yes, I think Commissioner Maz, do you mind if I go him first, Commissioner? Oh, no, I was just going to voice my support that we do need to have someone there for us on our behalf. And I, as you mentioned, Judge, I think long term we need to talk about planning, economic development. And those are departments that we are missing and lacking and seeing, especially in projects of this scope. Uh, that we're missing out having represented, uh, you know, a, a member here uh, on our staff. But I think, you know, to be able to go with a, a group that can bring so much experience and so many different perspectives, I, you know, I support that. But, yeah, I think that's a bigger issue that we it need is. to talk about at this, you know, this next budget cycle and really plan for a, a short and long-term uh, solution to it. Yes, and, and just so you know, because I want to help Belinda out here, uh, that today is just the consideration and the selection of gap strategies and then they'll have to work with the county attorney and bring back a document to us so today it's just saying yes we want to go forward and then we're going to have another bite at the apple so to speak at the next court or, or as fast as Belinda can move it could be in the very near future to bring back the details and so she'll work closely with um, with Jeff to find out scope of work and all the things we want. And to do that, we needed to have today's presentation and discussion. And again, you know, I think the county's counting on us, no pun intended, the county's counting on us to keep business moving and keep our opportunities moving. Uh, we just, if we sit still, nothing will happen. Uh, in fact, I think we've already proven what happens when you sit still. Um, you get a dilapidated courthouse and, and no opportunities. And lots of vacant lands downtown. And that's why the city's spending so much money on it. But I'll tell you, I sit on all these committees as the county judge, and it's just us from the county. And it's not, it's, you You better get in there, because they say, get in there, <laughs> get in there and tell them your, your point of view, right? And I'm grateful for the city for letting me sit on those, you know, those plans that are uniquely theirs, but we gotta, we gotta bring our own flags to the team. And, and they're doing it also the west side. This another one I won't even bring up right now is we've got our hands full with this, but you know the, the county's doing it. I mean the city's doing a West Side vision, and they've hired um, Freeze and Nichols for that one. So you know the truth is is that while all this is happening, our voice is being diminished because we don't have someone in the game who's uniquely on our side. Well, and I think for some areas, you know, Judge, I think for some. Oh, my apologies. I'm sorry. You're right. My bad. No, my bad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Commissioner. My bad. You know, I don't know, Mr. Pollock is still on there. Where's he going? Mr. Pollock, here he comes. Yes, sir. Uh, I am for about two more minutes. Uh, unfortunately, I've com committed myself to a visiting group of students that are, okay. that are here in the room for about I just, an hour. Real quick then. But I am, yes. You know, and I, and I think I heard you say something while ago, and I don't want to put words in your mouth either, but uh, I think didn't you said something about a coalition that uh, we have already that was already made the plans and and that, that in order to be strong and push it through, uh, we, the coalition has to stick together. 
which is probably the city, the county, and the port. You know, the port has always been a partner of us, you know, most, most everything we do, you know, grants and money and whatever else, you know, we, we partner with. And so I, I, you all have been a great partner, you know, with, with the county. And uh, so once if we have that coalition already set and we, we, we're gonna, it's going to be in, in, I guess, what you said in, in writing, I guess, that, that everybody supports that final touch of it, right? I mean, uh, you know, you know where I'm coming through? Uh, why do we need? That's a fantastic question. And actually, the um, one of the action items that came out of our meeting last week was for the three entities, uh, the MPO would, would, would be fourth, to furnish a resolution. We discussed it in a local or an MOU, and it seemed like actually a resolution may be the most appropriate vehicle where we capture in detail both the imperative for moving expeditiously on the redevelopment the tremendous opportunity that we have at hand and and make a unified statement by way of this resolution, which would come before commissioner's court, city council, port commission, and ideally the MPO uh, policy committee as well, so that there is a, a uh, there's a demonstrative statement made by each of the entities in, in the community, uh, a clear signal to the state, to our legislative delegation, to TxDOT, and to our, our federal delegation that says, look, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for this community. We're unified in our plan for evolving a vision for it. And we're unified in our request that that text dot that the state work with us to expedite this process. So that resolution is something that um, I'm working on capturing some language for with our counsel, Jimmy Welder, will then in, in turn um, circulate it to the, the delegates on the coalition for vetting and refinement and then it'll make its way to city council and commissioners. So members. at the end of the day, we kind of really know with a coalition what we want already, right? What everybody wants, the county wants, the city wants, port wants. So we, we had a representative from the commissioner uh, court, somebody that, of course, we know what we want, right? And uh, I mean, would it be that any different? No, no, that, that well, Jeff, what he's, but what he's asking you, you, you're all on two different planes. He's talking about a document that, that we're going to bring to this court that basically says we're all in this together. But what you're asking is whether or not we already know what we want. That's what he's asking you, Jeff, is whether we know what we want here. Forgive me. I, I think there is some, if I understand correctly, I think there is some general idea of which, collectively of which entities are interested in which portions of that right of way. And I don't think there's, any contention there. Uh, certainly the city wants to reconnect some of its surface streets and we understand the county um, would be best served by aggregating some property around the courthouse. Um, I think the, the, the actual granular parcel level delineation of those pieces and the crafting of the vision of what to do with them um, while there is a high level idea and there's been some planning work around that, certainly there's much more work to be done there. So I think the answer is both Yes, we have a sense collectively, but we also are aware of the need to go deeper. Is, is that a fair answer? Yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> and and we, uh, we, di we definitely, I sent to Laura and Belinda yesterday the idea that we thought about an MOU or an interlocal and Jimmy Welder kind of uh, brought up legal reasons why there's no exchange of goods and services. So it's really going to be in the form of a resolution. So that, that's kind of how we, we thought about that, and that'll come to us in the next court. But the thing is, is that it looks, there's no way you can just go, oh, I take this and you take that. And the, the detail that you're about to witness is going to blow your mind because what they have to do is understand what, a, what the whole vision would be, including pedestrian traffic. You know, right now there's overpass bridges, there's walking, area, there's sidewalk, there's I-37 coming through here. It is a tremendous amount of work figuring out traffic patterns, how the space would be used. It, we just don't want to go, I'll take this and you take that. It's not a divide by three thing. And so the, the, the idea is you're, half, you're halfway home. We definitely have ideas. I'm sure the city thinks they'd be best stewards of this. We think maybe after looking at it, we could have come up with a collective this is the first time you guys have seen this map, 
So I don't think we know what's best for us yet. And that's what Jeff will come to us and say, here's my urban planner hat. Let me tell you what I think is best for you. But then it would be our decision collectively as to what to ask for. Commissioner, you're about to spend, uh, somebody is about to spend a lot of money trying to redevelop that old courthouse, which can be worth sure. tens of millions of dollars. I mean, some, mm -hmm. some to, to create economic development, somebody is, or, or perhaps. Yeah. To create that whole downtown, which can bring millions and millions of dollars over the course of time into Corpus Christi, but that's not going to happen by accident. And you're, when you get down into that level of detail that Mr. Pollock is talking about, it's going to be depending on really small details. When you get down to how how wide are the sidewalks going to be? How are street lights going to be located? Are the streets going to be you know? 12 foot lanes or 11 foot lanes, there's going to be a lot of coordination over time with the city. And some of that has to be thought of in advance so that when you divide up those parcels to determine whether what goes to the city and what goes to the state and what goes to the county, you need to give some thought to how those divisions are going to be based on what your vision is for what's going to go there, what might go there, what future developers might need for mixed use, for parkland, so that you're not caught short in the end, and you can't maximize your investment and get the maximum dollars for your constituents and get the, and get the most beauty for your constituents as well. And I'll, and I'll tell you, because it comes up all the time in precinct, um, in, in Commissioner Vaughn's precinct, is, you know, we get asked all the time to approve or to acquiesce to housing tax credits, okay? And right now, it's almost like just throw it. Nobody has any idea of whether that's a good location for affordable housing or that's a good location. And so we're all just always so, like, grateful for the crumbs that we always say yes because we want to encourage it. But we've created no mechanism to figure out which place would be best suited for retail, for housing, for development. And, again, this area is the buffer zone between the industry and our tourism zone. And so I think that's where the the interesting, you know, pieces lie. But we're going to work with the MPO, and the MPO is excited about this. They're part of that right-of-way coalition. So we've done a lot of work, but none of it's been uh, what I call paperwork. It's all just getting everybody in the same page, which, by the way, is no easy task either. So, Judge, let me ask you. Is, is, I think <laughs> Somebody ought to, like, give us a little reward for that one. Where you're, we're going on this, which, and I'm trying to get my, my head around this because this, the city is the, you know, 10 ton gorilla, right? They're the, the $1.2 billion. Are they? Guy in the room. That's interesting when well, you look at their debt. Well, but I'm saying they're the, they're the, they're the $1.2 billion, you know, government and we're the $100 million government. So I'm just, what I just, I'm always trying to look at is making sure that, you know, um, and some things they should take the lead, right? If it's in the city limits and they have certain jurisdictions, but I, I, I mean, I like the planning concept because I, I really think there are appropriate things that need to be planned. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in agreement with that. So what I'm trying to get to on this is, um, if we're trying to get a piece of the pie, right? So if we're trying to get something, uh, like we want some of this land to be county land, is that what we're kind of, because that's a different yes. deal, right? I mean, it's yes. just... That's correct. If, if we know that it that's certain, like we know we're not going to get the cities and we know we're not going to get the ports. Correct. But there's this all green and blue area that's up for grabs. Yes. Then, okay, I can, you know, I can kind of get my arms around the need for having our own person at the table there because um, that's different. If this was just uh, where we were trying to plan for a designated piece of property, well, I think it's that too, I guess, in yeah, a way. I think, it's, I think I would have a different feeling. In other words, if, if this was already owned in title by somebody else, somebody else, or us. Good point. Or, you know, then, then that, that's a different argument as I sit here and think, okay, if we're trying to get a piece of this, hey, I love the city. They're great. Um, I love the port. They're great. But why, why would they, you know, say, hey, sure, county, you can have yeah. three quarters. Of or how about they give us what they don't want, so right? Yeah, right. So as long as, as – lo I'm good with this as long as we are truly trying, again, just to be completely yeah. – I know we all want to be that right. way so that people understand why we're spending money. If we're trying to get, and this is this is your right. This is potentially millions of dollars of property, right? With, with you, tens it, of millions. It's yeah. up for grab, up for grabs, not including the cities and the ports that's designated. 
uh, you know, to spend some money to, to plan for that and to get a piece of that. If the ultimate goal is, and I think that's what we're stating, is the county would would get some of this designated as county land? Is that's that the, correct. That's the hope? In the, that's okay. correct. It would be county land. And, and again... You could develop how we wanted to or you help could, the courthouse. Yeah, or, you could be landlord. You could be seller. Okay. That's you could be, you know... And, and, and right now we're not talking cost. We're just talking... Um, uh, do it just, and he'll come back with something. Yeah, they have, he has to work that out with Belinda and Laura, and there's some there's some work that needs to be done. And, right, and just so you know, we would have done that earlier for you, but we preferred it coming under, um, because he's a professional um, under the Procurement Act, that's why it's listed there, it needs to do this route through the county attorney's office. Courthouse. You could do amazing things here. I will tell you that if anyone's listening that's a real developer right now, they're saying, "We this is what you pray for." <laughs> you know, and right. Judge, really and truly, and I know Commissioner Gonzalez threw that out there, but you know, one of the things, and I can't remember, is is the courthouse. I'm not good at looking. Okay, at, look at the right purple the and blue? come all the way back. Take the dark purple. Right. Come come back to see the fringe of yellow. That's us, right? That's the courthouse. So yeah. So in, in theory, you know, and I, and I think that. Yeah, I'm, you're I'm, seeing it now, right? Right, and that's why I'm talking light about light bulb because it it's a light yeah, bulb moment we, when you look could, at it. We could get that piece of property because, and Commissioner Gonzalez kind of flippantly said that, and I know he's halfway serious because I've thought about the same thing. You know, this courthouse is a lot easier to blow up than the other one, and I'm not trying to be, you know, funny. I'm really this this you know this courthouse is 40, 50 years old, and we've got all these problems with it, and you know if we got this, and, and this is a wild idea. I get it. If we get, but if we get enough land over here. And we can't figure out a way because we can't get the legislature to remove because I'm, you know, I still think we need to go to the legislature and, and at least get it removed, whether we tear it down or not. It's a whole other discussion. But if you had land there that you could build a new courthouse on, and I know you've you've talked about that, we, you not, you know, I mean, that's that's, and you do a bond to to encourage that if we had the property, and then you just got rid of this. I know that's wild-eyed and that's way out there, and I'm not saying that's what I'm supporting. I'm just. Got a right to think. I'm just thinking, and I'm just saying it out loud because, <laughs> right. I mean, you know, I'm sure it'll, uh, mm. well, of course, Tom Whiters doesn't write editorials anymore. I'm sure he'll say I'm crazy, but that's, you know, the thing is, is you have to you have to look at every option, and I don't know what's going to ha be had with the courthouse. We may, and I don't mean this rudely either, we may get stuck with that thing, and so we may have to look at alternate uses, and maybe, maybe it's not a whole new courthouse, but I don't know. Maybe we can figure out a way that some. I think what you're saying. I think what you're saying is, is that there's an unlimited amount of opportunity, and I think that's what this represents. And and we can debate that what that opportunity is, but you can we don't see, have it. We can't use. You it. can see the connection here, yeah. right. and everybody who looks at this map sees it. And my my thought is, is that we have an opportunity right now to go and make a case. I'm good. Call the question. I'll do it. Motion. Um, Move. Although, well, how about make a motion? motion. Wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry, what Carolyn. What are we talking about on money? Uh, we have to come. They have to go have to talk. Back. We have to come back. It's motion just, to approve. It's just to select. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. What you need to do, Judge? I'm is, sorry, uh, Tyner. What do I need to adopt the order granting the discretionary exemption? It's a two part. I have to go to the procurement. I'd need a motion to adopt. Let me let me read. It's two six two point zero two four of the Texas Local Government Code. We need to select that as the method of procurement. That allows for professional services. Do I have a motion? I made the motion. Nice. And, and motion is second. And all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. That lets us uh, select. And now can I have a motion to select uh, the professional planning services of GAP Strategies? And I've got a motion and a second from Mrs. Vaughn for the clerk. And those in fa all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign. Jeff, if you would give your card to Miss Belinda. Uh, county attorney is is not here today, but she sent her 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 finest here to to serve us, and we'll on, uh, well see you're ahead of me. All right, super. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, there is um, uh, and there are some big items coming up. I know. Goodbye, Jeff. Thank you very much. Uh, and please make yourself available. There's, there could be other questions. Let the commissioners email you directly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, there's some big ones coming up. The next one is the Odyssey. I um, I know he's out in the hallway, but I, I need to do two things, commissioners, and I was wondering um, if it would be uh, 
if I could get a consensus to take a 30-minute lunch break, I need to visit with the general land office, and I also need to run upstairs and, uh, and finish something that's, that you guys started this morning, and there's a window of opportunity. Otherwise, we're, on, we're kind of on the clock, money-wise. You can do anything you want to. Okay. I just feel I need the 30 minutes. I really don't need 30, but I hate to give us 1145. Let me let, let, at least let you eat. We know a third, now Judge, with this 30 minutes real time? I know, it's real. It's real if I can go right now. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Let's I'm going to talk and walk. Um, so I'm going to take a recess from the clerk. We'll come back on the record at noon. I hope you guys can get a good lunch downstairs before the lines. 1130. There may even be lunch for you. I'm not sure.
It's 12.03 and I'm ready to start. If anyone can hear me out in the halls, we're going to get going. We're calling the commissioners. We're going to go back on the record at, I, don't, I left my glasses upstairs, but I think it says 12.05. Okay, 12.05, and we're going to hear from Lance, and the item for those of us paying, uh, following along at home is item number four on the regular agenda. This has to do with Odyssey Justice Management System into the Tyler Technology Cloud. And again, uh, we've got Lance Murphy uh, to talk to us about this. This is probably, I didn't mean for this to happen, but we've had like three of the most important topics back to back to back. Uh, this could have been a number one topic as well. There is an urgent need to get to the cloud and Lance is going to tell us what that is and what it's going to cost us. Yeah, so um, I guess we're, we're at a cloud discussion again, but this is just to kind of give a, some perspective. This is not the same thing as the office 365 cloud that we had talked about before. This is specific to the Tyler Technologies, uh, our justice system, which includes attorney management, case management, there's some financial management in there, and also, of course, the jail management uh, system. So this is the, the topics you've seen come up throughout Commissioner's Court have involved moving away from the mainframe. When we moved away from the mainframe, we went to Odyssey is the the suite that they call it. So when they moved away from the mainframe, I guess it's important to identify that the cloud was an option back then, uh, the Odyssey cloud. Uh, I was told originally that we elected not to go with it, uh, not for money reasons, but because we were too complex of a configuration to use their cloud version. When all of this uh, COVID stuff came about and we had to look at very quickly putting e-signatures into our Odyssey product. And we started talking with uh, one of the VPs, uh, Kevin Isset at, uh, at Tyler. He asked why we weren't in the cloud, because he knew that we were, we were making remote access possible, but it wasn't as easy as it could be if we were using their cloud product. And of course, I repeated exactly what I just said. He went, he looked at it and did not see what was too complex. As we reviewed, we believe that the, complex, the, the complexity was coming from the old jail product called iLeads. When you introduce an inter, uh, what they call those, uh, I'm drawing a blank, uh, integration. If you have an integration with another piece of software, then that can be a complexity that they would not want to bring into their own hosted environment, which is what a cloud environment is, is when you bring something in. So when we switched in 2017 from iLeads to 
Odyssey. We actually opened up a door we didn't know, an opportunity to move to the cloud. Uh, but since it was years past the decision, nobody, nobody let us know that we now qualify. So we found out this year, and it's a good year to find that out, uh, and the reason being, we have opened up remote access um, by allowing them to log in using their uh, iPads. The reason that we chose that uh, over what we've commonly heard to is referred to as like a VPN connection, a virtual private network connection, is because when you do a VPN connection and you're accessing a product that has access to all of the documents, thousands of pages, hundreds of pages, whatever it is, every time they pull a document, it will send that entire document from our network to theirs. And so the traffic, when you take 15 courts and put them remote access away, uh, we, we could not predict what the traffic of a regular court session pulling all of these documents continually would do. So that's why we elected to do this option. Because this option does not pull the document to them. It lets them log into their computer here and just operate. So I think we made great decisions as far as getting to a remote position as quickly as we could without drastically affecting our internet pipe uh, to where we couldn't handle business. But if we knew that this, if we'd already had Odyssey Cloud in place, uh, we could have just handed them a laptop and let them go do it from home. It would have been much easier, and uh, I wish I had known about this option sooner, honestly. Uh, it does, of course, come with a price tag because anything in the cloud always costs more because they are hosting all of it. So I would like to just, I, I'm trying to make like an hour conversation in like five minutes, so I would like to just say, when we moved from the mainframe to Odyssey, we, we hired some more employees kind of during that time period, but I don't think that we could ever really anticipate how much of a beast Odyssey was. We had a single big device called a mainframe, and the management of that, of course, it was yeah, it had its own complexities, but it was one device. When we moved to Odyssey, we now have 25 servers. That is an incredible amount of servers to maintain for one product line. Now, technically, it's three product lines, but the, uh, it's, it's one official product that you can't even upgrade the product if your operating systems aren't at the right level. So I think it's important for you all to hear why we are behind in, uh, and have continued to remain behind in some of these things. Would you mind if I just bring us up to speed here just a little bit? Because you just said something that's really important, and that is, is that the goal here for this particular agenda item is to transfer the hosting, if you will, to Tyler Technologies through Odyssey. And in lieu of our team uh, working the updating and maintenance of over 25 servers. And again, on the cloud, the reason it's, it's coming, we've always wanted to get to the cloud, but the reason it's becoming so important is because we've all gone, gone remote in the courts system in particular, it sort of revealed itself as to where we had major gaps. And in this hosting, the the amount of dollars that are, is revealed in the packet for this year would be budget neutral in that you have the dollars in your current budget to handle that hosting. But it's really not about that per se for consideration because that's a great thing, right? If it's net neutral and we move from our servers and our hosting to the cloud, which is quite frankly, the most resilient thing to do to protect the integrity of functioning and doing business. And we are vulnerable in this way because we do it kind of the old-fashioned way rather than the cloud. And there was an impediment, but that impediment has been removed. So we did three different stages, 2012 or 20, 2014. Yeah, 20, right around there. 20, between 2012 and 2014, we had our first big change based on the history that I've seen. And then we had another change in 2015, and then we had another change in 2017. And what those changes did is it allowed for the courts to talk to the jail, okay, and the clerk to talk. Everybody's now talking to each other on the same, if you will, highway. But what's not happening is that from the home base, all the updating and maintenance, um, we are a year or two behind and we're always going to stay behind because it's impossible to catch up. 
but the cloud is everything that you know the cloud to be. It's, it's a protection mechanism for us to have our information, and that's what we are. We're, we're the source of tons of criminal and civil record information, safely stored. And no, I love the idea of a cloud because we all look up like, where is it? You know, but it's, it's not here, and that's what's important. It's not within our hosting. And I think that um, it's important to know that we've been doing this in stages, and now this is kind of the ultimate stage to get our data in the cloud and have somebody else host it. And by doing that, Tyler will be able to address the updating, updating and maintenance that those servers require on a continuum basis. And here's the other thing, because we're always we've been the theme this morning has been about stewardship of dollars is that we're losing, in my opinion, a lot of dollars by not creating the productivity that we need for this entire county complex because we're constantly behind on updating and maintenance. This would allow IT, quite frankly, to do the right, to do their real job, which is addressing efficiency department by department. And um, the other thing that this is going to allow us to do is we need to progress to where any judge can access Odyssey remotely from any one of these, okay? And that's where the big gap has been from this COVID-19 um, situation. Um, I'm sorry, and really I should say from their own computer, we, we have been accessing it through their iPads. But they need to be able to have access um, and that's why we deployed iPads, right? To speak to that. We, Go ahead. We have, uh, like I said, they're working remotely now uh, for very select what they consider just, you know, uh, essential only cases. Uh, and the next time we, we are in this position, uh, what they, I guess the longer we're in this position or the next time it comes about, what they're required to do from a remote perspective is going to only increase from here. So the bar kind of moved very drastically on us um, almost overnight. So now I'm a little concerned that we won't be able to provide other types of court session uh, proceedings if we don't get ourselves in a more uh, advantageous position from, from Tyler's perspective. If we give them the control of all that, uh, like so many other counties, have done, then when it comes time for an increase in traffic and demand, uh, Tyler has a, a much more flexible uh, dollar budget to expand those resources uh, to accommodate traffic, increase traffic on remote stuff. They can also, uh, just getting us into the next, the actual version that is the uh, current version with Odyssey gives us other feature options that we have yet to get to because we we are quite literally years behind in the server room. And so the quicker we get there, the quicker we will be prepared for the next step. And that's the real concern and why we're bringing it now. I already put the increase in dollars for next year's money in the budget. Uh, and this year, like she, like Judge had said, uh, the dollars are covered to, to make this transition. It's just the after effects of making this transition change the licensing billing from uh, on, on site to cloud, which has an, an increase. Also, it's important to note that, that Odyssey wants us to go the, this direction too, and it's not just about money. It's about simplicity and being able to get all of their clients in, in, a, in a form that they can help push things forward. And they are giving us back, uh, the number is $1.5 million worth of licensing in this deal. So uh, if you look at the, the breakdown that was, that was submitted, it shows you the discount amount, and what they're doing is they're taking that 1.5 million, and they're giving us 25% of that back the first year, and then year two is 20%, year three is 20%, the next two years after that are 15%, and the final year is 5%, so that we can we can grow into this new cost rather than just being hit with it on the year one, and we are actually we we haven't we don't see a waste on having purchased those original sets of licenses. We are getting them back. Uh, that's quite an amazing deal, I think. So, go. I just want to say. Um, so just make sure, commissioners, and ask your questions. But it's good news for this year and next year. But you need to know that 
By going to the cloud, we will need to spend more money in future years uh, because that's what's required, but we would be getting this $1.5 million in licensing credit from basically all the dollars we've already been given. Go ahead. I just want to make sure I... The good, year, the good thing this year, we're not, we have the money already. Next year, yeah. we won't have the money. So it's good for this year only, probably. But let me, let me just ask something, uh, Lance. For nine years now, we've been... I thought we were having problems with uh, Tyler Technology. I thought well, at one point we were, we were having all kinds of problems with them coming down and take care of the mainframe to take care of the service. Uh, you know, I know there's a one, at one time, you know, you even mentioned to me that you were, were having trouble with Tyler Technology. So are those this obstacles out of the way now? Or are we doing good now? Well, one. Hold on, we, hold on. And the other thing, okay, go ahead. For, all, for all these nine years, and when you talk about judges, I know you're not talking about the JPs, right? Because we always leave the JPs behind. They're always in the back burner. You know, so, uh, you know, if we, if, if we always talked about connecting the JPs with each other and connecting with the juvenile department because that's what they deal with. So where are, where are we now with the JPs? I, I like to know. I mean, I know we talk about the judges all the time, but I know, I know what judges you're talking about. So where are we? The dead judges, too, you know, so where, where are we at with that? So I'll just address the JP thing real quick first because it's kind of the easier one. Uh, the reason the JPs stay so disconnected is, it, uh, or apparently stay, they're on the same system and all of, everybody can see all the same stuff. The, uh, they interact a lot with the constables to do the, the civil paperwork stuff. And that's uh, been mentioned a few times at budgetary commissioner courts. I think you're wrong. The, the constables, yes, but they also interact with the juvenile department. Uh -huh. The juvenile is on a state system. With the schools, they yeah. interact. You know, this is their connections to everything they do. You know, and at one point we did have the connection with the schools and the JPs. I don't know what happened to that. But, you know, I, the thing we're, we're always leaving the JPs behind. You know, and I think we have to bring those JPs up. A lot of money comes into the JPs office. A lot of money. No, I agree with you, and they, they were one of the first ones in, 2012 or 2014 was when we brought them in. We had to bring everybody else in before we could come back to address them, and before we could come back to address any of these concerns, we have to be up to date. So we have quite literally been chasing our own tail ever since this environment was introduced, and I think it was just because nobody really expected to be housing 20 bus servers to make this work. Uh, now, on the Tyler problems, we do have uh, noted issues, and almost every one of them have revolved around needing to get a new server in place and having to coordinate with the people here and there, and it's like a handoff process back and forth, and it goes into a queue, and then it just, just spirals. Uh, when they have, the, when they're controlling the servers themselves, we just say we want to add the new feature, and they take care of all of that stuff. And when the new feature is ready to come out, we we push it out, and we can focus on the business process side here. So that it actually does resolve uh, some of those concerns. Uh, but we did actually actually have a a great kind of revival of that again. Every time we've had major problems with Tyler, we end up talking with a VP, and everything gets great for a while. We're trying to make sure that that doesn't happen again uh, by making sure that this deal includes what we need to continue to succeed. So what you're saying right now is that the JPs are okay. They're connecting with each other. They're connecting with the juvenile shelter also. They're, you're saying it's okay. They're okay. I mean, they're, they're connecting. With what I said is that we can't even begin to address any connection issues until we're up to date. We've been doing that for nine years, man. Exactly why I'm standing right here telling you, it ain't going to get there unless we either hire more IT staff, which I know we don't want to do, or put the hosting where it probably should have gone from the very beginning, but we didn't have the option because the jail management system was creating a complexity that they could not take into the cloud. That's the other one they have to connect to the JPs is the jail. Yeah, and there's... It. Right, so well, the exciting part about this is once Tyler becomes the host, they will dedicate up to 20% of one person to just focus on Nueces County. That's how I read the document. And that's really what's needed because we're not able to, quite frankly, focus on why we're not all interconnected. And when he talks about the judges, the JP got shut down literally by the governor's orders. I'm sorry, not by the governor's orders, by the Supreme Court. 
and they've not been doing any evictions. They've all been stayed. So that when he says the judges, the gap that got revealed was our district court judges and our county court at law judges. Those are the ones that have been working remotely since COVID began. Um, JPs are working remotely, but they're not hearing cases like our district judges and our county court at law judges. And your fear came true yesterday. I haven't had a chance to update you, but we are now moving to essential and non-essential hearings being done remotely. So that means right now we've been able to control sort of the usage, if you will, of how everybody's interacting because we've been only operating on essential hearings. Now, as of yesterday, OCA, Office of Court Administration, the Supremes, and the Supreme Court have allowed, now are telling judges, hey, you guys need to work remotely for as long as you can on essential and non-essential hearings, which is really going to play into why the cloud is going to be so important. And again, if, if you can actually see our server room, it has a vulnerability that, you know, you don't want to have in modern times. I mean, there's a reason the cloud has become the go-to for all governmental entities, and that's because you need to protect it from the elements, whether it's water or fire or any other, I don't want to say the word sabotage, but, you know, whatever, whatever could hit it would impact this court in a huge negative way. And so this is where we must go, and we have an opportunity now to work a very good deal, if you will, with Tyler to be able to to space the dollar amount over time. And Dale, I, I don't know if you had a chance to look at these numbers, but uh, of course it shows you what our current cost is versus our proposed. And the differential goes up over the six years. And so um, again, the e-signatures, we had to do that in order to get our courts running. So if you look at the item that's under current cost, $14,000. We instituted that during this uh, COVID-19 situation. We cannot operate our courts without that e-signature. And so that has to stay no matter what. And, and we need to continue to, to work on expanding um, what you kind of know is DocuSign. It's kind of the same type of, of um And I did speak work. with uh, Kevin yesterday about e-signatures in general and and uh, they are looking for somebody to partner with on this whole plea agreement and signature process. Uh, it helps if we are already in their environment to do those kind of things because then they don't have to worry about the anomalies that happen inside people's server rooms. Uh, so this uh, opening this door also opens up many other doors that if we can collectively decide what is an emergency and what we need or, or what we want as a top priority, which I think every judge has mentioned e-signatures at some point. Uh, I think that would be a fair one to do, but w uh, whatever it is, uh, we can, instead of being on the back side where we're, we're you know, waiting till after somebody else figures it out to deploy it, we will have a new tool in our, in our pocket where we can actually become part of establishing these new things. And with what we were hit with, with remote access and how it's continuing to be a, a requirement in this COVID situation. I, I don't see that we have much of a choice. I, we're, I'm more here just to tell you that this is really the only option we've got if we want to stay on top of it. If we don't, we risk running into a situation where we can't accommodate it and then possibly have the liabilities of other uh, legal repercussions if we can't supply what is mandated. Oh. So. You might tell them about CJIS and the fact that everything we do to report to the state of Texas, which is required to meet our 90% um, regulatory requirement of completed cases, relies on this system. I mean, this is the system that makes us work. Just yeah. Just another thing I'll sure. You know, I just don't want, I'm concerned about the JPs, as you know, right? You know, and I, the JPs, they bring twice as much money in as the district courts. They're not in criminals. They're not on criminal cases. They can charge them all the fine they want, but if they go to jail, they're never going to pay it. The JPs collect money every single day. And Dale, if I'm wrong, uh, correct me, but, you know, I'm, I'm, but the JPs bring in a lot of money to this county, right? Quite a bit. You know, and, 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 we're, and, we're always, and we're always, like I said, we're at one point we got to pull them up. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to keep telling you that, but 
You know, the JPs are just as important as any other judge. I'm sorry. But, you know, we, they might be called JPs, whatever, but they're, they're judges. You know, and to do the job, they got to have the same thing the other judges got to have. So, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hoping I'm preaching to the choir, but, you know, you hear I think Lance no, agrees I, with I, you. <laughs> I, I actually, actually I, I can't see how this wouldn't work in, the, in that favor. Uh, my IT staff is largely devoted to Odyssey because it is a, such a big piece, but a huge res section of those resources is not only being drained by the server room uh, overhead, it's also causing delays in the rest of the team moving things forward because if the server room is behind, you can't do anything with the rest. So everything that we need to do out there is hinging on getting to the latest version and has been basically since 2017. And I can promise you that I have tried to work this every which way possible to figure out where the hang-up uh, is. But with the priorities that are, that are in line and the extreme overhead that that server room is requiring, there's just no way to do it uh, as currently staffed. But there is a way if we let them take the burden of, of what I would consider the, uh, we've always said, you know, outsourcing as an option Cloud is a way to specifically outsource those kind of things that you don't particularly need the expertise to do. It doesn't take an expert to update a server, especially if they're used to that, that process. It does take an expert to come into a department, review the business process, and see how technology needs to marry in with their current process. And that's what we need to do at the JPs. Uh, for the JPs, the district courts, uh, District Attorney has some, some, some business process reviews that we've had on the books for a while. All of them need to come together. And of course, under the umbrella of what they're calling the ESAM, our kind of Tyler representative that's uh, uh, going to help us bring all of these stakeholder requests to them. I just don't see that it wouldn't work in that favor, honestly. Uh, Commissioner Vaughn has a question. Okay. Okay. Bear with me because I have two questions. <clears throat> oh, write them down. I see the importance of of moving this off some, to a secure site because if something were to happen here, you'd lose all that. I think most big companies do that. I know we do. Uh, but where is it located? Where is the cloud located? Because that's important where it's located. Is there more than one location that's located? Surely it's not China. <laughs> no, uh, they, uh, they're under, uh, they have quite a few other counties with those same concerns. I, I haven't asked them specifically yet because I wanted to bring this to y'all's attention, uh, but I, I don't expect any answers that are unfavorable to us there. But can you find that out? Because I think it's important where they're at. And my other question is this. You said that you had your staff now can spend time doing the things they need to do. So how much, what percentage of time do you think your staff has had to spend because of what we have, we've had? It's so difficult to, to adjust. Uh, I would say, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think out loud for a second. Okay. 25 servers is roughly a fourth of the server room. Okay. So a fourth of the, all the time that's spent in the server room is, is, is devoted to this. And uh, the coordination between our database side, I'd, I'd say to guess conservatively, we're talking about 20% of the okay. resources. So here's my question, because I'm, I'm really concerned about the cost, because it's going to go up quite a bit as you get to year three and four. So my question is this, and don't, don't jump, but if that's the case, if they've spent so much time doing this, they won't have to do that. Can you cut your staff? No. And tell me why you can't. The reason is because, at least not until we have our, our, our uh, at some point we will, we will maybe reach a zen moment of technology married with what we're doing. And everybody can work remotely or from wherever. Uh, we could look at it then, but there are so many steps in between now and that Zen moment, things that haven't even begun to surface. For instance, the e-signatures piece. It's not developed yet. They need a partner on that. That's just one piece of tons of pieces, everything from the way we pay for tickets through the JP's office all the way through the, the way it's processed, and there's still people walking paper around. Uh, so until we get through the digital conversion and get it to where it needs to be, every one of those employees that I've got are going to be devoted to enhancing business processes. You, you can't just buy something and put it in place. It takes, it takes years to put all of these things in place. You, you put it in place, and then you have to perfect it, and you have to 
continually do that. So I just I don't see that there would be a drop. And of course, with my new ticket system that we're getting dialed in, if I see somebody that's, you know, if we're resource heavy, and we should be able to see that. So my point is this: I just think that as we get more techni technically savvy, we've got to be able to cut in those departments. That's what I think anyway. And so I know that I have a um, IT guy too, and he could spin me forever to the moon and back if I would let him because there's always something else that he adds on to it. And I'm not being ugly, but I think that's just the part of the beast. So I just think that down the road we've got to look at that because if we are going to start spending money like this, and this is quite a bit. It, it is. That's why I wanted you to see that this will create contingency, uh, contingency liabilities. But the idea of not going to the cloud, it, it, it's just it's not possible to live in the world of yesterday. So I'm just sorry that it has a price tag, but the cloud has to be in our future. And I can tell you right now, it's, we, we really should have already been there, but it's taken nine years because it takes that much time when you're piecemealing it on money. If you had made the investment a long time ago, maybe, you know, but again, there were lots of different reasons and circumstances. We, I don't know if, if Lance ever really answered <clears throat> your question, uh, but I will, regarding Tyler's relationship with us and how we're doing, the answer is we did have some issues. It was on a completely different matter, and we've been able to not only work with them, but they saved us during COVID. They literally made us their 100% uh, project to get all our um, uh, civil cases online so that everybody working remotely could access the entire court docket, and that was really good. That took how long is this contract? Um, How long is the contract for? So if we were to have trouble. Well, it, it, that's the funny thing about cloud. Uh, y you know, uh, this particular contract uh, obviously is going to be six years so that we can get all of our money back too. Uh, after that, you're, you, once you commit to somebody's cloud, the option for moving, uh, the, more you, the more you get involved with them, it's more of a logistics uh, discussion than it is. Uh, so technically we can leave at, anytime at any we time. want. Uh, whether we could do that or not is, is the bigger thing. It's, it is, it's a fish hook and, and we are, you know, well, I knowingly, think, I anytime think you introduce in inner cloud, even with our Office 365 stuff, you're kind of committing yourself to them uh, at your own, what do you call that? Uh, Peril. <laughs> Peril, yeah. Well, it, the licensing, in order to get the most of our money back, it has to be, it's, it's structured in six years. And the reason is, is we did pay quite a bit of money for our old licensing agreements. And the deal that uh, Lance has brought forward with Tyler is that they would reimburse us over time. And that's what you see as the asterisk. So just to go over it quickly, <clears throat> the Odyssey has the price tag. Then you have the discount amount. That's the 1.5 divided by the years. That's the money we already have given to them in licensing agreements. They say, okay, we'll give you credit for that. The ESAM is that dedicated account manager, and it's spread over time. And then the CIP, we haven't talked about it. That doesn't stand for Capital Improvement Plan, by the way. That's sort of the, the hours that, that we use. It's called their Continuous Improvement Program. And we're not getting, we're not maximizing those dollars right now because we're not even getting to improve because we're not even updated. So we'll actually start using those dollars in a better way. Um, the whole concept is, is, you know, we needed to make sure that, that you guys knew that this is one of those, it kind of reminds me of TRDS, where do you go? You know, you're in the system. We're, we're in a, we live in a digital world and, an, and a technological world, and I hope it can save money. And I think what Lance is committed to doing is to make sure that, as through his new ticket, I guess, system, he can really see where, where his resources might be utilized in a better way to, to be more productive, which is a way of saving money in a different um, manner, or whether he doesn't need certain people to do certain things. I don't think he's going to know that until we actually make this move to the cloud. But um, This really does, uh, it does turn upside down a lot of the services. Uh, and, but the, the reason we're looking at it is the same reason that I, I, I know it's going to be years before we could even consider, to, consider that because we expanded technology outside of this by uh, my, my guesstimate has been about two years in a matter of two months. 
And every time you open a technology door, you introduce a, a months to years process of dialing it in. Uh, so the concept of going remote or needing to be remote actually existed before this. We just never considered it. We always prepared for hurricanes. And when a hurricane happens, everything shuts down. We never really prepared for the concept of when, not every, when everything isn't shutting down, when you're actually obligated to do things. That has introduced a technology requirement that I'm still trying to design to make sure that we are, are, are actively capable of supporting that. And I can promise you that means that what we thought was a te technology requirement to support on site is now going to expand. So we're reducing the server room for Odyssey, and then we know that that is going up. Uh, and, and that's actually where the JPs are going to come into play, because right now we haven't had to worry about remote JPs because they've just been shut down. But what's going to happen is that there's going to be a move to go as remote as you can. And so I believe in the future you're going to see JPs also being involved in this remote process. It just hasn't happened yet. I mean, we're dealing with, again, these orders keep coming down every week. And it, you know, for example, we don't even have a date for jury trials right now. I mean, think about that. But we're having to plan as if tomorrow they'll come up with an idea and then you'll have to implement it within a certain time frame. So this cloud is, is something that's inevitable. And right now we have the ability to use the 1.5 million as a credit because of the COVID situation, in my opinion. And um, the question is, is can you, you know, we need to do it now. It's not going to hurt us now. And, and to address Commissioner Gonzalez's point about the budget, it's in your budget for next year. Is it in addition to uh, an, uh, your current budget or is it already built into the budget that looks similar, Lance? Is it an addition Yes. That's I, okay. I, I just, he just needs to know. There's quite a few additions given everything. That, just, that's fine. And he just he just wants to know if that's addition. I'm, well, he said he was for the first year. He said, well, you know, I didn't know right. No, I just wanted to make sure you were right. I mean, you just, we've got to clarify it. But for, for the next, for the five years after, we will have to include the increase ab each year to grow into it. Uh, as those discounts drop off, we would be adding. Ab absolutely. Lance, th mm -hmm. this is something that, as much as we don't like it and we don't like the increase, it's basically it's inevitable. I mean, we have to work through the cloud. We, we, as you mentioned, we've seen the need. And thank you all for the work that you and your staff have done in putting this all together for county government to continue to exist and operate remotely. And I think, you know, long term, as we've mentioned, uh, there are some cost savings long term, years and years down the road as we look at services that can be streamlined and improved, uh, less um, – less interaction, less space needed to house staff where they can work remotely or a fewer amount of staff that can work depending on the job. But, there, you know, there are ways that, that money can be saved or at least used to offset the cost, the increased costs that we see coming up with this. Yeah, in, in IT, a lot of times the savings come in, in unmeasurable amounts, and that's what makes it so difficult to make these decisions. And without, I didn't, I didn't want to get up here and say it, but I really don't see that we have much of a choice with this. Uh, not given, I, it was unheard of for them to require courts to operate remotely like that. And that was such a, a blindsiding requirement that if that is required, I need to prepare you all for what might be required next. And so I, if I'm going to do that, this is the, it's not just the logical next step. It's arguably the logical first step that we didn't have an opportunity to do. And, and that's why I wanted it important that I don't think they would have chose to put those servers in that room if they could have done this from the very beginning. Right. And, and because of the unknowns, just so you know, this goes into our allocation for COVID spending and a possible supplemental, you know, reimbursement. In other words, this gets added, maybe not all the years, Dale, but for certain this year and next year, because there's no way that we can respond to the issues at hand without creating this expense. And so maybe they would have said, well, in the future, you would have normally gone to the cloud. Maybe they'll say that's not reimbursable. But for right now, it's an absolute resilience um, component. And so I think that the money that we've spent on e-signatures, that's part of our allocation. The money we're spending on, um, um, well, the 70000 for this year uh, that's, that's slated 
we would obviously put it in the allocation. So for what it's worth, we will try our best to make sure that those are reimbursable. So this isn't totally an actionable item. These are just supporting documents. Right. I'm just looking for commissioner's court approval to to move forward with migrating to the cloud for Odyssey because we can start that process now uh, and and maybe even be able to start moving forward with enhancements and, and upgrades by you know before the end of the year uh, so the if y'all give me the approval here knowing that we have to approve the increased amount in the budget numbers otherwise we would be setting ourselves up to not be able to pay the bill uh, then I'll start putting the, the paperwork together to actually begin the process. Um, I have two questions that I would like answered, and you can't answer them for me now, but I would like to know where the cloud is. There's more than one location, and I'd like to know what happens after six years, because I think that's important. You said you really didn't know what happened after six years. I didn't get a good answer for that, and I think there's always choices we have whether, I mean, we don't have to do it. I don't think we have to do it, because there's counties that have probably figured a way around it, but do we need to do it? Yeah, we probably do, because I think it's important. I think that's what everyone's going to, and it would um, take care of all our information, and I understand that it secures it. But I, I would like to know those two things. I think that's important. So I can answer the six years. The six okay. years is we'll operate like we are right now. We, we pay our maintenance no, no, going no, no, forward, no, no, right? No, 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 no. I'm saying you have you, six years, you stay with them, and you can continue to stay with them, mm -hmm. or you could change and go with someone else. That's what I'm asking you. You're not locked into this company because let's just say they don't serve you well and you want to change to someone else. That's why I'm asking you that. So we're no more locked in with, with them in this agreement than we already are right now. Okay, just uh, making yeah. sure after the six years because you didn't act like you were sure after the six years. That's what I got from it. Right. No, I just didn't understand what you were asking. Yeah, because I think that's important. If they don't do well for us, you're not going to want to stay with a company that doesn't do well. If something happens, anything can happen over six wells. Six years, they could change management, and they could be sh terrible. And then I really would like to know where the cloud is. Mm -hmm. it, I believe it's with Amazon Web Services, and they just choose where they want their facilities to be. I sent them a text message just okay. now. but yeah. yeah, as soon as you can get an info. That's just important yeah. to me. And again, um, so right now what you're looking for, your recommendation um, at, this, at this point for the court is to allow you to continue to move to the migration uh, to the cloud for this calendar year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is there a motion for that uh, purpose? I'll make, I'll make the motion to, to do that. I, I see absolutely no choice for resiliency, for protection of the data, but really more importantly, so that we can actually get to where we want to go. I mean, I agree with uh, you that let's get there. <laughs> I mean, we've been wanting, we've been inching our way, but we're not there yet. So let's get there so that we can actually see what productivity looks like uh, in the future. How long will it take you to put this together? How long, uh, Lance? I was actually hoping to have the real quote already, um, but... By next court? Yeah, it, it'll be by next court for sure. Okay, so May 27th, is that right? When's our next court, Tyler? May 27th? Yeah. Was that, would that be satisfactory to everybody? next court for the contract okay so is that is that fine Belinda with regards to the action for the clerk we're going to come back on May 27th with a with the potential contract and at this time do you do they do you need a motion Belinda to to do anything to receive that yeah, can I say something real quick? But you have a motion you are have a motion uh, discussion right now I, I, I'd like to add you know we're going into all these new things, and it's just great. I like to, you know, we have. I like to have a budget sh workshop about what, how things are looking for us, how they're going to look. You know, I, I mean, I need, I, I need. We have those scheduled. They're they're scheduled, and just so you know, we just got budget packets May first, so we can't do the budget workshop until the budget packets get analyzed on OpenGov. I know all of them were due May first, which was which was Friday of last week. We already have on our calendar the budget workshops. We've already preparing. Um, we just we haven't gotten the certified. Well, we just got the tax uh, tax taxable assessed value from the uh, appraiser. So we're putting all that together. And Tyner, do you happen to have a calendar to tell Commissioner when that is? Because I know budget workshops. We've already asked all department heads to submit their days that they want to come in. So we're way. 
I mean, we're actually ahead of schedule and we're working towards that. Before we do the mm -hmm. can we just have Dale give us a present for us? We're, we're well, Dale doesn't present the budget, I do. And that's one thing that we need to understand is that it's a constitutional mandate that the county judge presents the budget. Dale can present the CAFR, which he just did. So you have a, co you have a comprehensive annual financial report and we're gonna be working with Dale so that we can understand what the uh, liabilities are, including the um, TRDS, which we have some good news. There's some things that he can provide for you. But we need to get back to understanding what the constitutional mandate is, and it says very clearly it's the county judge's budget, and I promise you we've been working days on it. I know it's your budget. I know that very clearly. Mm -hmm. You don't have to remind me. But the, I know, but it, we always have Dale there give, to guide us and give us a, a detail of what we're looking at the future, what we're looking at for the expenditures. You know, it's always been the same way unless you change it. I don't know. Well, that's, it's, we need a financial advisor for that, not an auditor. Well, whatever you need, okay? I don't care what you need. Mm -hmm. Whatever you need, have it, you know? But the thing is, I, I, I just want Dale to give us a little detail of where we're looking at in the future. I mean, what, where our funds are, what are we looking at, you know, what, you know, I mean, our reserves are where and we, well, we'll they'll be in August because in August we have to decide in August. Not there's no more September. I think it's August. You know, so uh, you know, just getting closer. You know, but ask him any question, and I know he'll you'd be willing to answer it, wouldn't you, Dale? Right. I Th did just find out where the Amazon website. Okay, is. where is it? It can be limited to just the U.S. if we choose. Yeah, but it's Amazon, so it technically they would spread it across all theirs unless we tell them to limit it. So. Okay. And I, and I think what he's asking for, too, which would be helpful, is some sort of idea of s what some of these things we've been doing and adding money to the coffers, what kind of impact that could have on next year's budget. And that's why we do budget workshop, and it's scheduled, commissioners. I, I, You're going to get everything you ask for and actually more. No, no, I get that. And so I think he's just asking for it in advance, and then we're not asking for all the department heads and all that stuff, or he's not. Well, that's the only way to know what's coming. Well, no, it's not, because we, like this right now, you know, what impact does Tyler have on our upcoming budget? We, that, uh, those it's included. We can ask, right. So, but I'm saying those could be things that we do without having to wait for all department heads yeah. and all the normal stuff. So I think he's, I think he's asking, I'm not trying to, but I think he's yeah. asking for more than what we normally do. You're about, something, something yeah. Up front. Right. And then, and it would be helpful because we're spending a lot of money and I am a little concerned on some of that. And I mean, I'm voting for a lot of it. So I want to know what kind of effect you know it has and so I don't know how to do that maybe we don't come it's not called a budget workshop maybe it's just a budget update or okay something. it's just really important and I'm I hear you and Tyner's gonna get us those dates because as, as I said you need to understand that there is a in order to figure out what your liabilities are you have to receive your budget packets that happened last Friday if you'll give us Dale what do you think the right amount of time is Right. Okay. So you need to understand there's our, there's real constraints. But having said that, but, but, but judge, there there aren't real constraints on what I think he's asking for and what I'm asking for. So let me just say I don't know what he's asking for. Here's what I'm asking for. I'm not asking for a budget update right now. I'm asking for just specific implications of some of the things that we've voted on now already or will vote on in the next court hearing, what that impact will have. And I'll take Tyler. I can go get you a list of other things too, but Tyler jumps out. What impact is that going to have on the budget? I'm not I'm not looking for all the I get, you know, I don't want to get you to do that. I'm just looking for things we've already voted on. So there aren't constraints we can get on you that. that. So maybe I'm not. We can get you that because well. almost everything that's been monumental this year has come out of our CO 2019 or it's had a current funding source. This and is the only one that I'm aware of besides TRDS, which we know is a contingent liability for the future, that we actually have a future um, contingency liability. And that's, I think, all I'm asking for, again, I don't know what Commissioner Gonzalez asked for, mm -hmm. that's all I'm asking for is to... But it's important to understand what your CAFR gives to you, and that's why I feel like it's it's critical that we that we really spend more time on those types of things. The CAFR is your cash reserves. You know exactly what they are to date. I, I, you don't, that doesn't change tomorrow or June or August. Your cash reserves and your, and what you have in your general fund right now is solid in the sense of that number is real. So I would recommend that you go back to your CAFR and look to see what the status is. And the only contingency liabilities 
are those that come up as the court progresses. This is the only one besides retirement that Dale has mentioned this year that I can think of. And if that's the answer, then I would like, I, I'd like to hear that from Dale, that that's the answer, because I know what the CAFR is, and I know what the budget is. I've done, no offense, I've done a lot of these budgets. I know how the budget process works. I know what the CAFR is. I read the CAFR. I, I you know, it's just, I, I'm not asking for that stuff. I'm just asking for updates on what Tyler's going to do and any other things that we've done right. during this year that aren't COs that could have an effect on our budget. And if the answer is zero, then you've answered it. That's all I want. Dale, can you so think of any up to now? Can you analysis. think of any up to now? And it can be. You don't have to. I'm not putting you on the spot. And I'm, you you can get it to me as quick. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I'm not. Okay, I don't want to. That's fine. Just, that's a simple. That's right. all my request is. So I that's think, fine. I but we should. You, is, but but as fine. commissioners, it's our duty and responsibility to keep tabs of everything that you vote on that you believe is a contingency liability. So I think that's very important and. I know that Teresa gives us summaries. In fact, you've got one in front of you of all the items that we've taken up this year. That's what CEOs judge. Thank you. We're, I'm not asking. That's, that's right, and that's what I'm telling you. There's I'm none asking. other except for the TRDS and the one that's before you. Okay, and if that's the case, great. And if it's not, then Dale will tell us that whenever he can get to it. Yeah, that's, yeah. All I, that's all I'm asking for. I don't, I'm not mm -hmm. looking for a pre-budget. I'm not looking for information on the CAFR or anything like that. I know how to do all that stuff, but thank you. I, yes. think, I think what the concern is probably is because yeah. of this COVID-19, and right. there's probably concern about next year if the money Absolutely. And I think that's where this is coming right. from. Right. That's, that's not um, – it doesn't get lost. There's absolutely – we need to make certain that you guys are um, seeing what, what, um, what the impacts are. All I'm saying is it's not timely yet, but we're getting there. I mean, you, you certainly want to have a picture that's accurate. We can give you one – when, we, when I'm going to ask Dale to actually show you the burn rate, because that is definitely impacting um, the, um, the bottom line, right? Okay, so again, can we set a time as next court date for that? We still need a motion, according to county attorney, to come back. How about the motion being that uh, you progress into the proposal for the SAS migration for Odyssey? Uh, and to bring us back a proposal by May 27th. Is that fair? On or before? Yep. I'll bring uh, a proposal that will be fully budgeted for the initiation process, yes. Okay. And that's a motion that I made. Second. And make sure you we get it with plenty of time to look at it and digest it, not day of. Or yeah, day not the honor before, but yeah, the real we need before. It. We need it. At it's, least by Friday, by the day it's posted. It's actually going to be less than the dollar figure that's on the proposal. There's a $101,000 one. It's going to be less than that because they're going to prorate. Right. Just He's just saying he wants to get the paperwork beforehand. Yeah, the paperwork. Whatever. I mean, if that's all, if that's pretty much the same, three then months. that's fine. But still need it at least three days before that's, this meeting. Could you, could you do that, yeah, please? Yeah, we'll do. All right. That's a motion and a second. And all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Melissa in emergency management is, this is the first day all of our department heads are back home and we welcome them, but she's got a major um, workshop that she's got going on here, like literally needs to start now. There's multiple department heads here. Dale, I'm afraid you're going to be the last to let be let go. I was hoping that, um, Melissa, what we could do is, if you want to come forward and, and reveal any information, but I'd like to get to Maria's. Michael, I don't see anything that you have here, so you're free. Okay, so I want to make sure we get to Maria's so she can be let go. All right, Maria, why don't you come do grants? I'm going to advance grants number one and number two. Um, uh, did Lance leave already? About Because there's, there's a licensing agreement for Canyon City on Veterans Treatment Center. Oh, you've, you're here. Okay, so sorry. Got it. Okay. Sorry, I wasn't ready. Um, so the first item we have is um, the discussion regarding the county possibly entering into an agreement with the Council for Adult and Experiential, Experiential Learning uh, for the Inclusive Development Network. Um, so we call it CALE. 
The agreement, um, this is kind of going to be for discussion only because the agreement is not um, ready. And I apologize, I did think that the draft agreement was attached to the agenda item and it was not. Um, so Corpus Christi, well, the United Chamber of uh, Commerce was chosen as one of uh, five locations throughout the nation to be part of this project, which is called, again, we call it IDN, it's the Inclusive Development Network. But it was designed to... Um, to kind of help uh, develop workforce um, strategies. Um, there were different goals that were set out um, to talk about barriers um, to women out of the workforce, strengthening internship and apprenticeship programs um, throughout the throughout Nueces County. And then um, there's also talk about establishing kind of like an economic development training and a skill development center um, kind of geared toward our um, you know, the, the low income kind of Hispanic uh, at risk kind of, you know, uh, communities. So right now the agreement is between this company called Kale and um, the United Chamber. But from what I understand, um, we would like the county to take over this agreement. Um, there is a balance um, in exchange for the services provided on this program. There was a stipend that was given to the United Chamber of 60000 That was in the agreement. Um, the balance, I believe, is $47,265.84. Um, and we would be transferring the responsibility from the United Chamber over to Nueces County. So let me give you just a little bit of background here. It's a it's a fantastic grant. We were already a partner. There's multiple partners in the community, including the Port of Corpus Christi, the City of Corpus Christi, Del Mar College, uh, obviously the United uh, uh, Corpus Christi Chamber of Commerce. And what happened was the employee that was working this grant submitted the grant, was a successful agent of the grant, uh, has left the United Chamber of Commerce, and Kale wishes to work with her and her alone. And so the chamber, through uh, its director, John LaRue, and its president, Libby Averett, uh, have agreed to allow um, another entity to just be the pass-through entity. So we're going to serve as a pass-through. It doesn't cost us any money. In fact, we will, we will receive $26,000, and we will have our names involved in a bigger way in this very prestigious um, grant that includes, quite frankly, everything that we want to talk about, which is getting uh, small business um, uh, back to work and how specifically it targets um, Hispanics and women. In general, it's called the Inclusivity, uh, Inclusivity Something Network. What's the D? Diversity. It's the Inclusive Development Network. Oh, sorry. Inclusive, yeah, Inclusivity Development Network. Inclusive Development Network. And so there are six months left on this project and we just don't want to lose it as a community. So they needed some entity to take it up that works with economic development and business. And because we do that now, um, we were the perfect choice to do this pass through. The current agreement expires September 30th, but because of COVID, it might actually be extended. Extended. In November. So there's 26,000 left. It has restricted funds. It would require some work from our auditor to make sure that those funds are accounted for. And so in other words, you know, we'll have some responsibility, but the upside is, is that the grant stays in our community. It, it keeps working for small business in our community. And, um, and we have a home to, to take care of it. And again, I've personally spoken with the chamber and they're grateful and they will stay on the working group board. That's one of the um, concessions is that the chamber stays on as a member of the working group uh, and there's a little working group board. And so with that, that's what you're asking and, and you'll just, that's just discussion and we'll bring it back. We'll come back with the um, contract hopefully by the May 27th court. Yeah, was there something there that I saw that $60,000 or something? There was a $60,000 stipend that uh, originally went to, well, it got paid in payments to the cha the chamber while Dr. Ramitas was working for them. So some of that has already been paid out because she did, you know, we're kind of in between phase, there were three phases to this project and we're in between phases three and I'm sorry, two and three. So we're, we're kind of at the at the almost implementation phase, so there has been work done. So the chamber did get paid some of that money. That's why there's only, from, from what Dr. Ramirez told me, there is a, a balance of about, it's a little more than 26000 that the county would be taking over. 
So we're going to have to pay 26000 No, 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 no. We're going to receive it. receive 26000 Well, let me ask you this. I just find it odd that if this is such a great program, mm -hmm. why would the chamber give it up? So what happened? Wh so she left, and Kale wants to work directly with her. There's nobody at the chamber that can manage this grant. It's a very specific um, type of grant, and she is really, she's the expert of the entire, um, really, the state. She's actually one of the leaders of the whole. There's five other communities that were chosen, and we actually hosted here, I guess, a few months back, the, the workshop here in Corpus Christi where all the other communities came here. So she's much more than just a, a, the person that wrote the grant and facilitates it. She's kind of like the leader of the group. And they had to let her go. <coughs> um, and so... Even there's no cost. There's no cost. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> I have my mask. Everybody. Yeah, it would basically be... So the, the <coughs> agreement would be the county taking over kind of, you know, just a, a, a lateral kind of move. Um, for the county to take it over. Dr. Ramitas would still be working the project through underneath the um, New Aces County Development Commission, the NCDC, um, to complete the project. Yeah, she has to have, you know, some vehicle. It doesn't cost us anything. And we may, maybe we get an expanded grant. I mean, that's certainly not why we should do it. We should do it to help our community and because the chamber is supportive. But more than anything, we, we have to get the paperwork. So this is discussion only. But we needed to prep everybody as to what's going on and what's transpiring. And if you'd like to read more about the grant, could you send the original support letter that Noises County sent to all the commissioners? So again, we've been involved from the beginning. We just weren't the we weren't the host, and now we're going to be the host. And all the other partners have consented as well. Yes. Okay. I wish we could, but apparently it's just discussion yeah, only. Yeah, we just, I'll take the motion to table. Okay. All right, I've got a motion to table, and, and I'll second. And all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. aye opposed, same sign. Okay, and then, you know, Maria, I know you're wanted upstairs, but we've had a lot of discussion about money, and there's a lot of money out there to chase. Can you give this court a, a background in the grants programs that are available? On what? What are we talking about now? What item are we on? Uh, two, number two, B2, grant programs. Really, really quick. That's okay. I can talk fast. But you have a handout for us that gives us. Um, and Melissa, um, do you want to add something um, after this or before this? Because I'm worried about you getting to your workshop or are you. Yeah, that that was great. Maria, would you hold just one moment? Melissa needs to get to that workshop. And this, for the record, is on item number um, seven. All right, thank you, Judge and Commissioners. I am going to be brief because we do have the, the reopening uh, workshop with the department heads downstairs. Um, so that was one of the items I wanted to discuss, and that's just us coming together to start to talk about some of the, the options that we might have for social distancing and best practices as we bring everybody on board. Um, the first day of officially being open fully for our employees is the 18th. Um, so this gives all of the department heads a week's time to establish the resources that might be needed for their employees, um, changes physically that they might need to be doing in their offices, um, as well as addressing other issues that are coming up. So we're gonna be doing that downstairs. Um, today and then the other thing I wanted to talk about is the alternative excuse me the alternative care site and Commissioner Chesney I, I did see your email and so I wanted to make sure to uh, touch base on that and I also wanted to say that it has been uh, approved and qualifies under category B as protective um, emergency protective measures the the alternative care site so that will that can qualify under category B like the actions that we take and Maria can talk more about that when she talks about grants um, and public assistance but it does qualify um, I read the letter from FEMA it does qualify under category B so we also have different the alternative care site is a, is a site um, that is able to provide additional housing or care for our individuals that are uh, COVID positive Waiting, te uh, waiting, testing, 
or um, have been told to isolate due to close contact um, just doesn't have a place to safely isolate. So these facilities, there's two different that you might be hearing about. Um, alternative care sites come in many forms. And so uh, you've heard many, many, many discussions on the memorial site. That's for surge capacity. So that one's intended to deal with um, extra people that are needing actual like medical rooms, hospital rooms, ICU uh, units. The other alternative care site that we established is for those non-critical or non-medical uh, folks that need a place also to stay, to stay isolated and separated in quarantine. That particular site, uh, we were able to get open due to the, the immediate need for it, and we're continuing to work on addressing some of the, the gaps, if you will, that we know we have, and we're working right now on getting a, a team down. We've requ requested it through the state, and it's, a, it's essentially, this is not a shelter. The alternative care site's not a shelter, but for the sake of the, the team that we're requesting, they're referred to as a, as a shelter management team because they come with a very specific set of skills that are addressed in these mass population type of areas um, like shelters during a disaster, and the, the dynamic population that we'll see in all our alternative care site um, requires very specialized training. So that particular site um, has the ability to grow. And um, I know Con uh, Commissioner Chastney, I want to make sure, I, I know there were about three or four questions within your email. Um, you wanted to know if this was a requirement, I believe. I think I was just asking where, where did it come from, who's mm -hmm. paying for it, how long does it go? I, I just. I just happened to be in on that EOC meeting that day and heard all of it, and I wasn't aware we were really doing it, and so I thought the court would probably like to know what we're doing in general and where it's all coming from and staffing. I heard I heard someone say, I think it was the judge, or I don't, I don't know who yeah. it was, saying something about um, <clears throat> let's don't worry about volunteer. Not That's not sounds right. Uh, somebody said it was a volunteer coordinator, but let's go hire someone, and so obviously this is something that when you're saying a team, there's funding involved, I'm assuming that's, I don't, I'm not going to assume. Tell me where it's all coming. So again, because the site itself qualifies under Category B, um, any of the expenses that go into uh, the site would also be. But we have different funding mechanisms for this particular site and how it's individualized. So we do have um, the Salvation Army that has a, I, I believe it's, I don't want to misquote it, but I believe it's 300000 is a grant specifically to house um, the homeless population that are in, you know, either positive or awaiting testing and to keep them isolated. So each of those individuals that we end up having in our facility, um, that should be covered through that grant. Um, we also could have somebody that, that is coming through either the port or the city of Corpus or Port Aransas. Um, this is a site that can be used by anybody uh, within the, within the, the boundaries of Nueces County, and we can extend it further if the need is there. And so we can actually build those individual agencies or jurisdictions. Um, and, and we have, with the hotel, we have it set up to where it's done by room. And so this is, this is better for us if we stay at a lower number of patrons um, because we're not paying for the whole. And we looked at a lot of different options before we found this one. And one of the other things was actually uh, paying for an entire hotel, the, the whole operations, the staff, and, you know, somebody that can run commercial laundry, and we would have been responsible for paying for that, and the total price would have been substantially higher. So us being able to utilize a hotel that can actually just charge us for the rooms, um, and then the other charges that we have, like for our security that we have stationed there and things like that, um, the room we, ha we have as Nueces County a room cost from the hotel, but we can determine a cost per night that includes also the security and some of the other services that we're providing, and so it's it's up to us to kind of decide what that total cost per night per room is and uh, per was, individual. What was the position you're talking about hiring a? Not, it was uh, some sort of team leader or something. I, had, I was originally calling it a site manager. That was it, um, Yes, because for me, this isn't a shelter, so shelter management team or a shelter manager, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to call it that because it's not a shelter, so I was referring it to as a, a site manager. And the reason why we went from a manager to a team is just because we can foresee the needs as, as it grows. If it grows, we're going to need more than one person. We also already have the issue of having Monday through Friday. We need someone that is available after hours, and we also need someone available the same hours on the weekends as well. And how would that be funded? Through these agencies also? 
or so uh, how would that be how, how the, those the be team paid? itself the cost that that team comes with that's also something that would be filtered in under that category B and so that's reimbursable mm -hmm. just so, I mean, like the we, cost of the so are we like you were saying some of this stuff goes through the agencies or you could bill for the agencies mm -hmm. so then some of this would go through New Oasis County that we would be paying for and, and hope to get reimbursed on. Right, so whatever the cost of that team is, we can divide it out into the rooms per night and it's part of the cost of the total room. So, But, but yes, it's advanced by <clears throat> New Oasis County. It's part of the emergency preparedness dollars that, that go in. So you have security, you have laundry cost, and you have food cost, and you have room cost. And the incident management team that we've requested is through our STAR request. So we've asked the state of Texas to send us somebody. Because the people that are staying here, they have all kinds of needs that we just don't have the ability. We've been doing it, and we are stretched beyond limits. They have prescriptions. They have... Um, so who, who dietary needs. Dietary needs, yeah. Qualified to get into this place, like I mean, are these people? With so we COVID actually that has came no up with. Stay, we we just recently came up with a process for it because we can't afford to have these calls coming in from every agency, right. and I need to know that we're not just taking people into the shelter because they have nowhere to go. They have to be connected to COVID nineteen, um, and so we're actually they're all positives. Yeah, so we're actually sending that through public health because they're already the ones that are determining the criteria for testing. And so we're going to utilize public health's, um, you know, their, just their expertise and their knowledge of the virus and things like that and contact and, and uh, contact tracing and those types of things to uh, make the best call on whether this, this particular individual is for sure in need of a site like this. So it's going to be vetted through public health. And when there's a determination made that the person does, in fact, qualify to be in our site, that request will go from public health to myself. Um, and it might be something that I could just make a call really quick or I'll call the judge and, and inform her of this particular type and why they meet the criteria. And then we just make a call. Um, we've been working on setting up a transportation plan which uh, will help with the individuals that are not able to either one, drive themselves or are not being um, released from the hospital in, in some sort of like predetermined medical transport. And so. Is this yeah. something that, um, that we have to to do, or is this just something that you that y'all determined? And no, we could let them all run around town there's and no infect other people. That, there's That's no, a possibility. There's no law or anything that says that we have to, but these are sites that are established to protect our community from those exact. I guess in a disaster, you kind of refer to them as as walking wounded. Um, they're 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 not here, nor are they there, and we need a place to put them so that they're not running around um, or going home. Some of them. Uh, might have uh, vulnerable family members that live in their household, which is why they can't go home to isolate because they've got somebody in that 65 or older or somebody with a medical condition. And so we need them to isolate so that they're not contaminating anybody else, but we also don't want to send them home to get their family members sick either. And so we're providing a place so that we can mitigate the spread of the, the virus from those unusual cases that just really don't have a place to go. And from funding source, the city did receive $800,000 for, um, for homeless uh, efforts for COVID under the FIRST CARES Act. Um, and so that is a funding source. The city of Corpus Christi is working with us. It's EOC to EOC to EOC. Port EOC, Port Aransas, city and county. Um, we are definitely the leaders as far as establishing the alternative care site. Um, we vetted all kinds of alternative care sites. That was our charge. And we did not stand one up until one was needed. And that's to save this county and these taxpayers money. But every dollar is reimbursable. And it just is going to really require a lot of work on who pays what. Some of them are direct pays uh, through let's say, um, you know, an individual or a company that might be willing to stand up and pay for their person that's out of town or out of community, and they're here and they've got positive COVID and there's nowhere to go. Sometimes it could be homeless, like I live on the streets, but it could also be I'm homeless because I can't go home. And so it could be Salvation Army, it could be City of Corpus Christi, it could be CARES Act. It's going to be a... Um, you know, an audited type of uh, reimbursement, 
and but Melissa's job is not to honestly she doesn't she it's not her job to ask how it's going to get funded it's her job in the middle of the night to find a home for this person so that we can reduce the spread of this terrible contagion uh, lucky for us we have a lot of people on this on the team mainly Dale who's helping work on the financial piece of it and um, but that's how it rolls the state gives you this charge and you gotta you gotta find a way to do it and only because Melissa and her team had vetted the alternate care sites for all levels were we able to do this in the middle of the night and I kid you not it was in the middle of the night Melissa how many couple questions how many people are in there currently and how long have y'all been working on this and how long has it been up because I, you know I just am trying to get a feel for all that too so sure I mean how long have we been working on this I, I mean we it's been over 50 days that we've been just trying no, to the at least alternative I, care site. I'm the alter no for I'm no 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 I'm saying for the alternative care sites yes this is something that I think all jurisdictions have been looking at um, what it, what it's very similar to and how we're handling it I guess you could say is very similar I don't know if you remember the disaster recovery centers right after Harvey we spent a lot of time driving around town with FEMA looking for these perfect places to do this and they had a million you know criteria and, and limitations and so this is very similar to that where it's it's you just need them it's what it comes down to. We just need to have a site like this available. I know it's hard to make a decision, especially for the memorial ACS, because we feel even farther away from that need. But that's not going to be one that you can stand up overnight like I did the, 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 the other ACS. That's, that's totally different because it's providing medical services. And, and let me stop because I've sure. really tried to stay away from the memorial discussion today or we'll be here for the rest of the afternoon and I know sure. you need to get somewhere because I think that's a completely different deal and I really don't want to go down that path today. It's, but, but on this one, so how many, are, how many people are current? So we currently have two. Two people? Yes, and we do have possibly two more that are kind of and funneling the, through the process right now. And I'm sorry, and they're COVID positive and they don't have a place to go because either they're and I don't want to know their sure. story I mean I'm trying to be I don't trying to get into anybody's business but they they're they have a as you said a, a qualifying event that they that's not the right term that they, that's they can't a good event that's they, a good way to describe yeah, it yeah they can't go home for their homeless or they have elderly parents at home or something prohibits them from from doing that right. that's what you're saying okay yes okay so and that's why bringing in because we have two people um, already that have a lot of different kinds of needs um, so I have worked shelter operations before so I can foresee some of the issues that we might see if we have seven people or ten people um, you need a dedicated team to address those cultural issues and those mental health issues um, as well as language and many other and so it's a it's a very specific um, this is why volunteers don't necessarily work, at, at least not our traditional volunteers. There's different organizations that you volunteer with, but they're like the Texas State Guard or BCFS, their actual, um, you know, full-on response um, uh, operations. But the reason why we need a team is because each person kind of has a, a skill set that's provided, and they work together to be able to run a site like that. Um, you, you know. We don't want to have to use it. No, and I appreciate that. I know you don't. And and, and let me just make my final comment, and I'm, maybe other people have comments or questions. I, I was just fascinated by the discussion, and I'll be honest, when I was on there, I, I just didn't know what was going on. And and so the, this, and I get that you guys have a oh, thousand decisions a day, literally, and I'm not exaggerating, that I don't need to, and I don't need to know about sounds like I don't care. That's not what it is. You've got a job to do. She's got a judge got a job to do. That's not it. But some of these things like this, to me, this was one of those things that, and I know it's hard to figure out which one of these things, right, that we all want to know about. But to me, this is a pretty fascinating discussion that if we end up, you know, needing it more and more, that's going to become more and more public. And we have a tendency then to be caught off guard by some of those things that come out, you know. So if, if there are things like this that, and I try to read those notes every day, and I try to get on about once or so a week, maybe twice, to listen in, and and I'm and so I, I get that y'all know way more than this than I do, and and I'm and you should because it's your job and the judge's job. But if there are things like this that you think are going to kind of become real public and real out there that 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 are impacting, if you could just kind of, you know, now that we have this on the agenda all the time, maybe bring that out and just kind of just to let us know because you know this is, you know, these are things that. At some point, we're going to get asked about. If there's only two people using it, and 
it shuts down tomorrow because the emergency goes away, which isn't going to be the case, um, then okay. But I just, if you could, if any of these things that you think of might be of interest to the court, if you well, could bring that and, forward, that'd be great. And I think that's fair, but just so you know, that's why it was on the agenda for this time, the alternate care site. And I actually proactively um, made sure that everyone knew it had nothing to do with Memorial, and that was the trigger to have this discussion today. Your email was germane and timely, but that's why it's on the agenda today. It was to bring you up to date. The one question you didn't ask, and but she mentioned it, it has the room to go to 10 rooms, God forbid, but if there was a need, we have a a plan, a door number two, and that could expand upwards if needed. Uh, but again, we yet, we let the health department make the call to us. We are not going out there looking for people. We get the call, and um, and the fact of the matter is there's an operation plan, and we made a copy of it and provided it to each of you uh, last week. And I just want to I just want to say real quickly, which is. Um, I think the reason why it hasn't been brought to you until now is that it was in such a conceptual state where we just barely even had our hands grasp on a site, you know, this this location, this location, and before we could even talk about it, it's not going to work. This one's not going to work. It's too expensive. They're ripping us off, whatever it is. So we finally started to hone in on something, but before we could bring it to you, we needed it which is why I stood it up overnight. So they're not in jail. They're quarantined. So are they on the honor systems to stay in those rooms? Well, that's why we have 24-hour security. We can't we take the chance. And we also had an individual um, that, that had a, a very specific reason for coming out of their room, and we call ahead of time, and we let everybody know what's happening so that there are no there are no issues of, of spread or contamination, so we're taking as many. But this is why that team is so important, because they kind of help take the burden of all of those different little moving parts from us. But we do run the gauntlet to say, OK, do we have to hire somebody, or is this something we can solve? And then once we figure that out, then we go to the next piece, which is, is it something that we could have a partner, like the Red Cross was our idea at that particular phone call. And that didn't work out. But the point is, is that we we move through every decision, I guess, tree. But the most important thing to know here is that we do not want these people uh, to be exposing others. And that's when it becomes a 911, um, you know, type of emergency. And it's why preparedness matters. And I think that this is a great, it just happened. So all, those names, alternate care site, apply to many different types of sites for many different reasons. And this is the one that has to do with the population not having anywhere to go. And again, from the reimbursement, it falls in the stack of masks or sanitizer or plexiglass or anything else. It's part of our COVID response, and we want you to know about it. And there's lots of funding mechanisms for this one. And um, again, the city is probably your best funding mechanism for because of the fact they actually got a big appropriation from uh, the federal government for general homeless response, just general, right? Yes, and I just, I don't want to rush the, the subject, but I do really want to discuss one more thing before go I go downstairs to the workshop um, so I can help everybody make before smart you like decisions about something. reopening. Go ahead. Before you go, I'd like to ask you something. Sure. You know, I, I can understand where Commissioner Chesney was coming from, but, you know, the problem here is that we find out things from the community more than we find out here in the commissioner's court. You know, I got a call from a family member telling me the son's been there for eight days already. So the contract must have been done about three weeks ago. So we had, No, we, that's not true. Well, I'm just saying, that's why I'm, I'm just saying what I heard. Mm -hmm. telling me, right? I'm not saying they're, they're lying, whatever. I'm just saying they've been there for eight days. He got out of prison, went to the hospital, got released and put it, put it at, the, at the hotel. You know, uh, I put a call to Kathy because he didn't have the medication. They said they couldn't get a hold of Kathy. I put a call to Kathy, and she returned my call. I asked Tyler to call you to call me, and I don't know if he did or not, but I didn't get a call. So, you know, I mean, I wouldn't be calling you or, or Kathy if I didn't have any questions. You know, I mean, so nobody calls me back, and, you know, but, you know, we find out things, and, and, and when somebody asks me, and I say, I don't know what's going on. I didn't, know we had a, I didn't know we had a hotel. I didn't know, you know, we need to know what's going on. We're the commissioner's court judge, you know, we, we need to know what's going on. I mean, even if it's just 
come to my office and say, hey, look, we got this, or, or send them something, and, you know, I mean, we're not going to go talk about it, but, you know, because we can't mention the hotel and everything else, but, you know, it's important. When, when somebody's telling me on the phone something that I really don't know what the heck's going on. And I understand, and, and Commissioner. That's it's, to me. It's, it's my priority as the emergency management coordinator for life safety, incident stabilization, and property protection. So I, we put out the notes. We, we've opened our emergency management uh, operations center calls. I don't have time to stop and do that. If we can set up a system where we're bringing those things forward, that's great. But that's not my job, and my job is to get it done and to do it. Um, and so I don't have time to slow down. I, I'm doing 10,000 things at one time. I appreciate what you're saying, and I, I completely understand. But some of these things just, it just is very difficult unless you're, you know, reading those notes that we're sending out or, or I'm, taking I'm, turns coming I'm, onto our calls like we've invited you to do. These things have been talked about for 40 me, days I read, plus. I make notes and I call signer to, to answer those. Well, but, you know, the, the other thing that I that I'm just really concerned about is that, it was medication involved here, and I don't know how it was handled. Well, that's why it's so important for us to get this team down, and that's why I've requested the team. I can't have my deputy running around getting pills. I only have two people and one to split in between us to help us with extra things. So really right now we're preparing for hurricane season, too. We have our reentry program we have to update so that we know our partners can either stay if we evacuate or come back if we evacuate. We've got a million there, other things going on. So my deputy, myself, my emergency management specialist. There a contract with this hotel? There's a P, well, there's, there's a, uh, Michael can help answer those questions. There is basically a contract, and that is, is when you rent the rooms, and we have an operations plan, and that operations plan was provided to each commissioner's office. And again, uh, Michael can answer those questions. There is a security team that we've hired. There is a uh, laundry service that we are about to hire, if not already hired. And then, of course, we pay for the rooms. Those are the three things that go into the alternate care site. Um, if there's, you know, um, if there's a need, the emergency management is going to address it. We, the day that that particular person got there, I know because I was involved intimately, that's the day that we executed, and it wasn't a contract. It was, can we proceed with renting these rooms from you with a, the same way we would pay for any other hotel room with our, with our P card. So, um, yes, he has been there, and um, that was the first day because it was a situation where the great state of Texas decided in their infinite wisdom that uh, a particular wing that was infected with COVID, that they would let these people out and they did not test them and they came to our jurisdiction and thank God they got themselves tested. And then once they tested positive, we needed to put them in a this, spot. All this thing is great. I mean, I have support everything you're doing. Mm -hmm. I just think the communication. Well, the communication is in written form, Commissioner. And if you would read the notes, you it. did obviously not because you said you didn't know about the alternate care site. It didn't say that. It didn't say about a hotel. We had contract hotel. We had two bodies it, there. It didn't say that. I can show you the notes. You are invited. Here's the thing. We have made more. You are invited to participate in the calls which is unprecedented. It's not unprecedented, Judge. I sat in, I'm so tired of hearing that. I sat in the EOC meetings after Harvey repeatedly all the time. After Harvey. Not during, during Harvey. Harvey. Before Harvey, yes. I was in the EOC when, I can't remember your predecessor's name. Chris Boyce. When he came in and told us this thing was fixing to switch from a one to five. So yes, I was in before, I was in after I got back, I was in after. It's not unprecedented. So I appreciate that we're getting in, but we're not getting in some of the information hey, I, that I, we I, need. And, and I hey. read those notes, and I listen, and I've been on those calls a few times. We will get we you anything that you need. We weren't invited at the need. EOC We are the committed to getting you any information. Hold on, let me finish. We weren't invited to the EOC at first. We had to go in there. We were invited on day two, Commissioner. If you're going to speak, passed. you're going to have to speak with the truth around so me. So are you, Judge. No, you are, because Please you do not. Being so condescending to everybody. I'm not being you, condescending. You You're trying to create a, a set of facts. You lectured me about the budget. I hey, bit I my tongue. I sat here and didn't say anything because I've done as many or more budgets than you've done, and I know how to do these budgets, and you didn't have to sit there and do that. So, yes, I've sat here and tried to not say anything, but the condescending tone that you constantly have in this court is, is frustrating, and I'm tired of it. So you've asked me to be less passive aggressive i've tried to be less passive aggressive i am asking you to quit being as condescending and do it he can't even get a word in half the time you interrupt me half the time 
and, and no judge, one's interrupted not, you. I, yes, we, you do. And so the, we don't get the information that we need to get. And it's hard to read those notes to say alternate care site. I don't know if it's the it says Melissa's working on an alternative care site. And then it talks about, I don't know if that's the memorial one or I don't know this one. The hotel stuff was not clearly articulated in the notes. And so I'm going to try to get in on more of those EOC meetings. I try to do one a week. I'm going to try to get in on two or three a week. But it, 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 it is. Commissioner. There's some of these things that we need to get, we need to get information on. It's, been on. it's on the agenda. We, we established this care site. But you've been working on it for 50 days, Judge. It's no, just now on listen, the agenda. Listen, and what my, is that? my email went out last week. The alternate care sites are a charge. It's like saying that we're not going to watch the Weather Channel during a hurricane. The alternate care sites are part and parcel of everybody's jurisdictions, EOCs. Everybody's doing the same thing. Everybody's got the same charges. If, if we have something that develops, it gets on the agenda. You are absolutely right. You need to get information. That's why it's on the agenda today. That's why you got a copy of the operation plan. It's why the notes talk about it on every single... We don't just have EOC once in a while. We have it every day. And in your, we've always said that EOC from day two, you said we didn't start it immediately. We did. We started it on day two, or we invited on that first day Commissioner Gonzalez came. Subsequent, you've, I, I think you've been on two phone calls. Well, I didn't belong there, Judge. <laughs> I was told I didn't belong there. Well, uh, Commissioner, well, right, judge. that's called incident command structure, and we you're not a it. part of incident command structure, not in any of the 254 well, counties. Every judge that, lets people in and listens. I've talked to other judges and other folks, and so we had to bully we our do way let, in. On day two, we allowed that process to take place. We were all working remotely. You were working remotely, and so you call in. That's from day two. I, I, wasn't, I, I wasn't working remotely. I call in because I don't want to impose on people in the room. That's so because the Emergency Operation in. Command, here. Melissa, is it you had Gary Barney here from TEDM. He instructed everybody on the organizational structure. I'm sorry, the organizational structure does not have the, 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 the tree that you like. But that's the way it is. It's it's the c construction that exists in 254 counties. It's the same everywhere. And we made no the departure. No it's doubting. not named the county that it's not. I, no one's doubting that's the structure. But no but no one is not allowing people in. You've, you've done that. It, originally, we were told we couldn't show up. I was going to go down there that day. And I was told, don't go. Literally, don't go to the EOC. That was what I was told. It got changed. I've acknowledged that. I've been on more than two calls. The notes haven't reflected all the calls I've been on. That's okay. I don't, you know, it's fine. I've been on about four. But I'm going to get on more, and I'm going to continue to get on more because it's more, it's more information. You're supposed to be doing it. That is your job. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you're wrong on the structure. I'm just saying. But do you acknowledge like that we provide you the notes Absolutely. every single day? But the notes are not. They're, they're synopsis notes. They're not detailed notes. And I don't okay. expect detailed notes. No, 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 no. I don't, you want us no, to run their emergency or do you want us a no, dictation? No, listen to what I'm saying. I do not expect detailed notes. I Well, they're pretty good notes. They're, well, they're a... Can I just say they have a, to be vague or that document would be 40 right. pages long? Exactly. They're a, they're a very brief synopsis. I was on that call the other day. It was an hour and 15 minutes. And the notes that on that were like one paragraph. Right. So. And, you, and I don't expect detailed notes, so that's why I try to get on calls every once in a while to, to listen in more, because I've got things that I'm doing too. This is your deal. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that I don't disagree with your structure. The structure's right. You're doing it by the law. I'm just saying, and all I said was to her was, if, if this thing, if you, if you have something like this, if you could just come forward and have a little more detail about it, like we're doing today, because... You can't put all this in notes. You just, there's no way. So, I wouldn't expect so it. number one, I get she's busy. whatever questions, I'm going to repeat it. Whatever questions you have, we are ready to answer them all day long, every day. Melissa is absolutely swamped beyond belief. In fact, she's now 35 minutes late for taking care of her team. However, she's here to help answer the questions. The reason it's on the agenda item is because we wanted to bring it to you. The reason we gave you the operations plan, do you know when you got the operations plan? The day that it was refined. You got it as soon as the state of Texas got it. And I truly believe that it's a mischaracterization to say you're not getting information. That's not what I said. I no. said I'm not getting enough of things like this in detail, right? Mm -hmm. I did not understand from the notes that I read every day mm -hmm. 
and from the two or three or four calls, whatever it is, I'm not going to argue with the, how many calls, I did not understand the difference between, until the other day, the alternate care site of Memorial, I kept hearing the word alternate care site, alternate care site, the hotel thing, and I'm going to go back and read my notes, I don't remember the hotel alternate care site being discussed in detail in notes, and if that's wrong, Name, uh, the name of the hotel not on there. Or, or a hotel. Okay, and that's for privacy just, reasons, No, 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 no. I don't want the name. That's for privacy reasons that we've already damaged here today. But at any rate, the, the, the point is, is that whenever you have a question, Commissioner, you can come to me. The structure is, is that Melissa reports to me under emergency management. I am available to answer any of your questions. We are here every single day. We have reiterated it beyond belief. Too, Judge, well, and so you should have there. returned the call then, because I've been I've been asking you to meet office? with you. Judge, you your office? You should have uh -huh. walked to my office. What do you mean return what call? I was uh, waiting for I'm you. talking about Commissioner Gonzalez. You're talking to me, my bad. All day yesterday, Judge. I've been here all day. I was waiting for you all day yesterday to 3 o'clock. What were you waiting for? Until call me back. I had appointments. You know, I had appointments, and you were busy, busy, busy. Well, let me let me just say, I am here, and you can text me. You can email me. I have received not one text from you asking a question, nor one email. And I promise you, I am here at this courthouse every single day. Too, we have multiple, but you are not helping when you are not asking the question. Ask the question, because I will get you that answer. At 5.30 in the permission. morning, I'm with Edwards Group. Every drive through. 5.30 in the morning, I'm with their That's group. That's right, and you're a part of that because we wanted you to be a part of that. So you are a part of this team. I mean, Can I, I mean, just say there's a couple of different components here that, you know, Commissioner Chesney, you mentioned Harvey and, and being in the EOC. Part of the issue is just the virtual component behind this disaster, which puts us in separate spaces. But we, you know, we are so busy right now that it's hard to even have an hour and a half conversation with my team. I certainly can't turn around and also write that conversation and then also express it verbally to other people as well. So feel free to ask me whatever questions or the judge. But I just, I just have to stand up as she's part of my team. I would not have been able to do this disaster as far as we've gotten without how hard the judge is working and we're the only ones talking at one o'clock in the morning about problems in so. fact my heart is racing right now because i have we have th we have three you should know this we have three disasters going on right this minute right this minute melissa and i are dealing with three different serious issues that really need our attention but you know what we are committed to making sure that you guys get every bit of information that you need. And this is an absolutely critical time for us to be able to work together and not work you against one another. You, well, I wish you could, but you cannot help in this regard on this particular issue. But you have been helping in, in, the, in the idea um, and the premise that, um, that we, are, we are committed to working together to receive all the information that we can. Please know that this team is working with, for example, I have a duty to inform 10 people every time something happens. And because of the fact that we wanted to get you information, you get it. It says Judge Canales, Mayor McComb, commissioners and city councilmen. When I get that text, you get that text. It's the same exact time frame, and we were able to achieve that within days. When you say you want zip codes included, we get that done. When you say we want to get information about who's infected, we move to get that done. There are only so much hours in the day. I am not sitting in my office waiting to receive people. We are absolutely working. I haven't even eaten today, okay? And I don't eat when, when we're going through this. So I, I will tell you, we are doing the best we can. We ask for your patience. We ask for your indulgence. And we ask, please, to know that there is not a conspiracy to not get information to you. In fact, it's the opposite. We're doing everything we can to get information to you. Do you know we do a press briefing every single day Judge, to me, get information? That's just, really an effort. We can't, we can't even get you the information that we're getting because before we can hand it to you, it changes. And, and, so let, me, and, Judge, and let, me, let me say, let me say this because I did not intend for this conversation to go this way. I simply really wanted the court to know what was going on. I wanted Melissa to explain these things. 
my, I, I did not intend to, to, to go this direction because let me tell you, I don't want to leave this room with anybody thinking that I don't think you and no, Melissa no. have done a great job. No, 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 wait, let it's me finish. It's not necessary. No, it is necessary, Judge, because... No, it's, it's really I, not. No, but it is because I have said this to people. I have said this out loud. I have no problem saying when I think something's going right, I just have no problem when saying something is going wrong. So, and, and wrong is not the right term. I, I just need a little bit more... And, and now you've told me how to do it. I shouldn't have sent the email to Melissa. I should have sent it to you. I sent it to Melissa saying this, and it took her a while to get back to me. I sent her a second one. It took her a while to get back to me. Now I understand, right, because we've had a dialogue. I should have sent it to you and copied Maggie. That's, me, that's on me. I appreciate right? and it. That will, and, and I will correct that. And that is all that is, 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 needs to be said on, on that. But I think in, in, in retrospect to this, the way this has been handled and the way you handle the orders and the way you've done things, I think 90% of it's been great. And I think there's been 10% of it that has been frustrating that I've tried to bite my tongue on. I've tried to come to you, but at the same time, it is it is hard. I don't even I think it. the guy that loves me agrees with me 90%. So I, I'm all right with and that. I, and I'm okay. I mean, really, I mean, because it's, it's tough, right? And so I don't want to walk out of here. I did not intend for this to go, you know, to go this direction. I just wanted it Maybe. to be presented. And I wanted Melissa to do it. I, I had a lot of questions about it. I think it's an interesting concept. And, it, it's not, and, I, and I have no say in it. I just wanted to know about it because I get it, you and her. I, I mean, I'm not questioning. And I want to, I want to protect, I want to protect the integrity of it. But I want to get you the information. I would even be willing to take you over there if you'd like to go there. I'll do anything to make sure that you are absolutely satisfied that you can, you can ask any question and that you get the answer and I'm secondly committed that make sure that you get the right information so that if a constituent or somebody that that needs to have information asks you that you could answer that question and I'm sorry that night that that you did not have the answer but I want you to know every night I don't have the answers to about a hundred people who call me and ask me things but I what I do is I say this I don't have that but I'm gonna get it to you and judge when you when I and that's how I do it I texted you and asked you, you respond. So I should have sent that email to you. I just, it was Melissa presenting it. I know. And, it was her. and that's and fine. And I do want to apologize no, if I, there's a delay, but I mean, we, I'm getting a ridiculous amount of emails. I'm sure you are. That's very a reasonable busy. request. It usually so. gets done in the evening. And uh, Commissioner uh, Jag, if, if I didn't answer your phone call, I, I can't express to you how busy we are. I, I really can't. Judge, may I say something? Sure. And maybe we can wrap it up. Um, in the beginning, I was not getting information. They were not. But this is something that this county has never gone through. And I think there's lessons learned. But when I sent the email out, mm -hmm. and I sent it to you, and I sent it to Maggie, I'm getting information now. I'm getting it. And I knew about the site. And I'm getting it, and I appreciate it. I never wanted to go to the EOC meetings. All I wanted was information. So if someone called me, I could say, yes, this is what's going on. So I think that there are just lessons learned and some things we can probably improve down the road. But I'm, I'm getting information. Like I'd like 10 more people in my office because that's about how many I'd probably need to even just keep up with getting you guys. But every time I get something that's important, I send it to Tyner because I cannot violate Open Meetings Act. And that's another thing. We can go into this later. But I promise you, this idea of me asking you what you think and asking you what you think and asking, that's called a violation of Open Meetings Act, and I can't do it. But what I do do is I send it to Tyner, and I say, Tyner, get this to the commissioners. And I'm not saying that Tyner isn't yeah. great, but everything that you get is because it's coming to me, and I think you need to know about it. It could be as simple as a dashboard statistics. I sent you that last night. Or it could be important like a CARES Act supplemental summary. I sent you that yesterday. It could be a variety of things. Um, but I promise you that, that the concept is, is that we need to hear from you if you need more. And we want to get you more. And I'm going to work with Kathy because she can be more detailed. And she needs to discern, and I know she can, when we need a little bit more. And if that's one-on-ones... We, we can we can achieve that Melissa I, I can I can ramp up those reports with details um, it, it's one of those things where the reason why you didn't get those earlier than you did is that it takes so much time and we were so busy so I had to go back and create them all and get them get us get us caught up um, and so but I don't have a problem with adding more details into it, it just takes a little bit more time um, but part of you not getting information or enough information from a certain time was that I literally did not have time. Those were documents I would send to the state. I didn't even have time to send them to the state. That's how busy we were. 
but I can definitely add more details on there. Um, this, th you know, we had the federal declaration on, on the 13th of March, but this for us, my EOC team and those that are actually step up as soon as something starts happening, um, for us, yesterday was a day, day 100 for us. So that's a very, very long time for my team to be going. Um, there's things, there's oversights, there's also things that we're not responsible for, so it's not necessarily an oversight on our office. We just, it's not, you know, especially the communicating certain issues or concerns uh, to the court because, again, my priority is to get it done for the disaster, and then I have a whole set of people I'm responsible so for communicating one, I'd that to. I'd make one recommendation, you know, for whatever is worth, I mean, I mean, um, I know you guys work hard, but we need to, I don't know, on that team that you have, do you have somebody with mental health? The next wave we're going to get after this COVID is going to be mental health. You know, and I don't know if we thought about that, but the next wave we're going to get is going to be all these people from COVID-19 that have mental health, stressed out, suicide, whatever. So I don't know if in that team there's anybody from mental health. Uh, we've been working with MHID. If um, they're, in fact, they have their, all their, um, we have been working. I've been I've been working with MHID, and um, Maria's been working on grants with the opioid task force, specifically aimed at COVID. We're also working with um, some of the more vulnerable populations that you know, social services, social services veteran services. So the answer is is that yes, we are, and we we're going to need a lot of dollars poured into behavioral health after this. I think it's important to think about because we're going to have to adjust our way of thinking for everything moving forward because we're already behind on hurricane preparedness for the year. So I'm now going to be splitting myself to be doing COVID response and Kathy Ard Blattner to be doing our hurricane prep and our reentry program. I mean, that's insane, but that's the way it is and that's the only way we're going to get it done. But it's important for us right now, um, which is why I need to get down to the workshop no, no, to reopen no, 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 the departments. No, 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 no. Hold on just a moment, please. No, no, is on, we need, have to make on. plans. Hold on, hold on. And I don't mean just the clients. I mean the first responders, your team, because they're all going to need mental health. I mean, they, they worked hard. <laughs> These mean, workshops overworked. are going to make me need mental yeah. health no. more than the disaster. Itself. Well, you know what I'm talking about, mental health, stressed out, people in the... In the I, yeah, you know, so we, we agree. And just so you know, we've started rotations, okay, because we are all working... 18 hour days and it wears on you and um, so we've started rotations and and we appreciate that you understanding how stressful it is we, we've done that so I think that the rotations need to continue Melissa and and um, they've already told me you know when's your turn judge and I said I don't take turns and so uh, they th you know what the, the people stop I'm an elected I'm different they're they're not electeds never ever, 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 ever give up, and they never, ever, ever rest. That's just the way it rolls. My first day of reprieve, I had a six-and-a-half-hour stint of phone calls. Yeah. So it just is not possible, sir, unless it's, you it's not. people. I can't even sleep when I'm sleeping. So if that's any interesting little fun fact, <laughs> I'm like waking up every day at 312. Even when I'm sleeping, I'm not. But look, how about the rest of the agenda item? What else is there that you think we need to cover that might be, as, as, as they pointed out, something monumental? I'd like to add that it's happening in about 10 minutes. It, part, it was part of Commissioner Gonzalez's query about where are we going with, with temperature checks. I want you to know that through the EOC, through Michael Robinson and Logistics, um, uh, that they are pursuing kiosks the way the RTA has them, if you want to go check it out. I don't know if they have it up yet, but they're thermal checks. Well, right, right, but the, but the kiosks are one opportunity to transfer fever checks. Uh, thermal, uh, there's a thermal scanner demonstration going on downstairs at 2 o'clock. Uh, these are the ones that airports are now utilizing and some of the mass transit. We were able to get the demonstration. We have members of the city coming. We have members of Christus coming. We have members of um, the port coming. And we organized this 36 hours ago. So we have uh, Robstown, uh, Javier Zapata is coming. coming. And the unit costs 35000 and it catches everybody in mass, okay? Uh, when you see what we're spending in over 60 days, that could be a great rate of return. If you're interested, 
I'd be willing, they're, they're not going to leave. They're going to do the EOC demonstration. Let them do that first. I'll ask them, Maggie, please, to stick around. They can do a separate demonstration for us after court, okay? But that's, to answer your question, logistics, that's his job, is to look for ways to keep us safe. Judge Maderi is going to give us a plan. It's not my plan, it's her plan, and we're going to have to implement it. They are concerned about jury panels and the amount of people that are coming in here. Fever checks, thermal imagery is one way to... Um, to look at a possible people sick. It's not the only symptom, but it's a good one. And it's very cost effective on a 365 day basis, right? So uh, that's happening. And that's the one thing I know that is new that you haven't known. And we haven't, we haven't emailed anybody because like I said, 36 hours ago, they, they said they could come. And then it was a matter of figuring out, could we, could we make it work? And, and again, we were hoping to have this in the morning, not the afternoon, but that's happening between the hours of two and three. Judge, I wanted to go ahead. Bring up some points I haven't had a chance to talk yet. You know, I appreciate um, Melissa being here now an hour past what she was expecting, but I think that that shows a lot. In Commissioner Vaughn and I were talking about it on our recess earlier. You know, succession planning, having that valuable second in command or third in command that you can rely on for each department because they may be expected to be part of EOC or uh, they may have to be the, making the presentation here in court or maybe hand it off to their number two to be able to hand it off. But we know that this was important and Melissa was the one that directly had to answer that today. Uh, second part was I'm glad that you requested and I'm glad we had the foresight last budget to give you that extra staff member because I can't imagine if it was just a two-person show right now in your department. Um, we know that there are a lot of other departments that need to be uh, increased in staff uh, just to do more functions, but especially handle emergencies when they come up. Um, the third issue is I think initially, you know, a lot of us were frustrated in not getting that information. I feel like Commis uh, Commissioner Vaughn, uh, where I don't want to go to the EOC, that's y'all's part to handle. Uh, I, I feel confident enough in getting the information we need when I have or if I have questions, I go directly to that department head or to that person mentioned to ask for clarification. So that's how I get it. I think there's always more information we can get. I agree with what Commissioner Chesney said as far as not knowing exactly that alternative care site and because that term's used synonymously between the hospital and then the other site, there could have been where the, some of the confusion or questions came up. Um, but, you know, we, we learn and we hopefully we don't have to ever go through anything like this again or we don't have a second wave that hits us harder, although we'll be, I guess, a little bit better prepared and structured for that. Uh, I do ask, though, that we, you know, in this planning and maybe revi revising judge, you're looking at your team and the post-mortem of all of this is, you know, who else to include? I know it's very specific as far as what is outlined, right, through National Incident Command, uh, but also just for your own EOC, you, you know, there are other positions that could be added in, even if there is someone that could be brought in as a scribe to handle more of the duties, because I can imagine Kathy, I think, is doing a good job when she's doing it, but she's, you got her running doing a lot of other things as well. So maybe that person could be responsible for that, especially because EOC, y'all are at the top, you know, right below the judge. So uh, if there's someone else from another department or another position that can be brought in to help with that, I think that could help us. Uh, you know, we all support you and we're all on the a same team. Scribe is a so, great idea. So I think that, you know, in looking at that down the line, because we know y'all are still going and, and burning through all this. So uh, those are some of my thoughts going through this. Um, we know we can keep you here a lot longer, but like I said, I think the succession planning, the trusting in, in Kathy to be able to handle things for you, that's why I feel bad that you're here, but I know that you trust in her to do that. Now, I know you want to be down there because you need to show your face. And she's actually a, a starting our reentry program. Oh, she's doing that? Oh, my gosh. Okay. Yeah, she's so, actually right. working on so. we let We let Julie... Uh, Oh, Julie. Take over oh, okay. for right now. <laughs> but Commissioner Mares, I just I, I want to you know thank you for bringing that up. And actually, that was one of my focal points for our reopening workshop downstairs was letting everybody know as department heads you have to identify people because we've already again this is day 100 and I have to be worried about a hurricane coming. And we have the elements um, for a hurricane with the much warmer waters that we're experiencing right now, almost 80 degrees, um, and so. What are we going to do? What is your department going to do? What are you as a department head going to do? Who's going to relieve you? 
um, if you've already been working 100 days at, at this capacity, and then we do have a hurricane that starts to kind of come towards us because that – now you're now you switch back into what we're used to, which is kind of those 24-hour ops where you're spending the night here. But how do how are you going to do that as a department head after you've been working this disaster for so many days, um, and then addressing all of our plans for hurricanes within the individual departments have to change now that we've had COVID. So you know I need everybody to rewrite their not only write their reopening plans, but I need them to rewrite their hurricane plans for their departments because they're totally different now that you have you know, this combination of like remoteness, you have still a virus that's dangerous to everybody. So we have to, like, it's not just worrying about hurricane season, it's worrying about changing everything for this hurricane season because we can't do anything the same. Um, and so one of my biggest points for the department heads downstairs is to consider those things. Who's gonna relieve you? Um, I can bring in an incident management team, no different than I'm bringing in a, a shelter, quote unquote, site management team that is going to come in, they're trained under these ICS positions to be able to backfill us. Traditionally, you would have them work the night shift because there's less going on at night, and then it gives us the opportunity to run the 12 hours during the, the, the busy part of the day. Um, but we have to start looking at that because we do have a very exhausted team. We are in the middle of a federal disaster, and we could potentially have a hurricane this year. Um, June, you know, June 1st is is a uh, go time for hurricane season and they're predicting they're predicting um, you know the elements are, are great for a hurricane this year so we just we need to be thinking about those things and it does bring forward the fact that you have department heads designated for this team so in this particular case with COVID they're not only working their everyday job like crazy but also COVID like crazy and can you imagine adding also hurricane response on top of that so there's definitely a shortage of, of just bodies that can do things um, but it's also just kind of a complete reevaluation that has to happen for everybody's department right now where they do um, consider COVID in their in what we're going to do for hurricane um, as well as who are those people within their department that they can delegate those types of things to or who could be their backup person. Um, we can get those people NIM certified pretty quickly. It's just a series of classes that you have to take online and then two in-person classes, um, which if I can just get a free second, I can be an instructor for it. I just haven't been able to like sneak away to go uh, get trained for a week. But then I can teach everybody here the ICS courses, get them NIM certified, and then they can officially be a replacement. Because I can't just have a random person uh, replace those people. They, in order for them to be under EOC, I need them to be uh, NIMS compliant. Um, and certain other certifications or training that I need them to have before they can just step into a position like that. Um, and so those are things I wanted to bring up in the, in the department head reopening workshop because it, it, you, we're all having to like recalibrate our way of thinking now um, and hurricane uh, response and, and you know action that you take is, is very community oriented and very close quarters oriented and so we're, I'm having to redraft everything about how we're gonna do this in my head right now um, while also responding to COVID. So it's a big deal if we and, have a hurricane. And since Commissioner Mares is kind of on deck here, I wanna say that, again, last Friday, um, we were given an alert at 3.30 in the afternoon that we could uh, receive the National Guard. And it was gonna be on Sunday. And it was, we made a call to Commissioner Mares and said, help. He called Robstown, he went to Robstown, he got them engaged because we're already using all our resources here at Memorial, and he got that effectuated. What we're doing is when an, when an incident is happening in your precinct, we are using you as commissioners as a way to not only send you information, but to get us to help. I'm sorry, to get you to help us. Commissioner Morris did that for us, not once, not twice, but three times on the Battelle system, right, on the issue with, sadly, the death of a Robstown um, individual, uh, with Awa Dulce also having an individual that was very ill in ICU this week, and also with his testing. So just so the audience and public knows and everyone listening in this courthouse, if it were not for commissioners helping us with these in these situations we would not be able to do it but I think it's proper to use commissioners when it's in your precinct to make that uh, assessment the same goes for Commissioner Chesney on beaches 
he's got it. I text him in the night. Here's what I sent to Scott Cross. You need to help because we are over. We're up here. Okay. And, and so he's got that task force and there's a call actually at four o'clock today. So that's an example of not only giving information about a huge subject matter. That's it. Same thing with commissioner Gonzalez. We got a call 24 hours ago that we could stand up a bishop site, but oh, by the way, we were going to flip it. We were going to put the guard at Memorial and our people in Bishop. That just doesn't happen like that. We use Commissioner Gonzalez to make sure that gets happened. And the reason Mrs. Commissioner Vaughn knows about the alternate care site is because it's in her precinct, and I went to her the very day that we got it. And I wish, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, if I could just, you know, hold that silver tongue of mine, but I wish I could do what I do individually to everybody. I wish I had that kind of opportunity. It, I don't know if you can just say, will you trust me and believe in me? Because if I could give all of you the information that I have here, I would do it instantaneously. If I could just take that pensive and make it go to your brain. But what I'm doing is when the incident happens, the occasion, the event the creation of something, I'm using you as a vessel, but it's got to be in your precinct. And that means if I have a problem at the port, I'm going to call Commissioner Vaughn. I want all of you to know about it, but the first duty is to make sure that I've got my liaison, and then she can help me disseminate that information through Tyner to the rest of you. Same way with Commissioner Maras, Chesney, and, and, and um, Gonzalez. I think that's a good precedent to strengthen an ICS command structure for next time. I never want there to be a next time. There should never ever be a next time on something like this. But I just want you guys to know there are so many other incidents that we're working on, but I'm using commissioners as a way to augment what we're already doing in EOC. And like I said, sometimes it's just verbal info and sometimes it's can you please go over there and help or can you please create a task force and help? Can you please do these things? So. Melissa, I, I think at least I threw out Beach Task Force, uh, the Battelle system, which is coming online, our Bishop testing that's happening tomorrow, and the National Guard that happens Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And oh, by the way, we found a way to feed all those guardsmen on the fly as well, and they really appreciated that. And again, all this is done through a lot of team effort. But those are the things that happened in the last five days since Friday, and um, and, 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 and it just keeps coming. So those are the things that I would want the public to know that are really uh, germane. I can't think of any others at this moment, um, but those are the ones that are, that are big, that, that apply to this agenda item. And that's, that's a, a great point that you make, Judge. I mean, we are appreciative of any help that we get right now from anybody. Um, Commissioner Gonzalez, you were out there when we had our soft run of the first drive-through site when we were having our hot wash and we were discussing issues and concerns and resources that were needed, um, you were willing to take on or to make sure that we were squaring away certain issues and took some of those things off of our, of, off of our plate. And so that's appreciated, you being out there um, even if you're not physically doing anything, you're showing your support, and that means a lot to everybody that's out there. Um, Commissioner Vaughn and, and Mars Chesney, all of you, um, you know, the Beach Task Force Commissioner, um, I put that together to help Scott Cross, and, and we're getting that kicked off, and we're trying to get um, our Lone Star UAS drones up over the weekend again so that we can s get surveillance on the crowds. And we have so many different things going on, and anywhere that you can help us, um, we, we appreciate it. I, I, open, I open the door for that. It, it is very appreciated. And that goes not just to the commissioners, but any employee of Noasis County that, that is able to help in some fashion. Uh, we do need everybody to stand up right now for this. And I'm going to forward you, Commissioner Chesney, the email that I got today because I made a mistake. I thought that I was going to visit with the GLO at 1130. Apparently it's tomorrow I'm visiting with the GLO at 1130. But it's about beaches and it's about getting some, we have guidance but we have lost 100% control out there. And the pier is jam-packed, ridiculous, and we don't have a, a signage campaign, and I've got, we've got some good prices on signage, but we need someone to control graphics. And you know what? Have at it. Have at it because we need help on that, and, and I want to be on the call uh, so that I can catch everybody up on what we have in our pool of talent as far as graphics, 
um, TxDOT, electric signs. I mean, there's some things that we do have to bring to the table, but there is no doubt in my mind that that's going to be going forward a big issue. And um, our federal partners, everyone's saying the same thing. So um, that's a great example of, of how you can step in this afternoon at 4 o'clock and, and take over. And no one's going to stop you because we need that help. I'm glad you mentioned it because actually I was apparently left off of that inadvertently. That I, so when you said four o'clock, I just okay. I think it's four. No, it is because I think I it's just four. Scott four and he goes, oh, sorry, you weren't on the list. So yeah. It's okay. I'm glad. I appreciate well, it. as I say, everybody gets a cupcake around here. You're all invited to everything, and everybody can work hard. Okay. That, that comes from two different people oh, starting the meeting, and it came together. Oh, and we yeah. We okay, you. but I'm you, glad you said it because you I, I would have missed all it. Right. Then I so been. Melissa, to get you going, is there anything else that you can throw in here? No, I think you just briefly ran a. Oops, excuse me. You briefly ran across those couple of other items that I had on here, um, and I know we've talked about them before. So it was really okay. addressing the the ACS concerns of the of Commissioner Chesney, the the reopening, um, and, and my 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 desire to express what we need to to the department head so they can be prepared for for hurricane season, and then just hurricane season preparedness in general, um, as it's going to look very different this year. Okay. And Melissa, <laughs> I don't go out there so just sorry. looking nice, but I help them with the cleanup. <laughs> oh, I know you're out there all the time. <laughs> yeah. That's why we're grateful for that, because all of those little things make a huge difference to our team. Good guys, good guys. Okay, great. Melissa, we're going to let you go on downstairs. Okay, and thank you. Um, and then uh, that takes care of your keeping tabs, item number seven. And I'm going to go back in time to try to get more people downstairs. Maria, Michael, are you here for an item? Okay. Also, um, he's just bored. He wants to. I made a mistake. I made a mistake. Margaret. Okay, <laughs> Margaret. Margaret signed up for COVID-19 uh, discussion, and I'm so sorry, Margaret. I got caught up in my head please come forward she had a comment on item number seven public comment on this agenda item uh, good afternoon George good afternoon, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for taking time and uh, and listening to me right now I'm just really um, very thrilled to tell to all of you uh, that my appreciation for you it's every day at five o'clock I mean all the time but every day at five o'clock to six o'clock when I see the press conference and I see the judge representing all of you and uh, um, giving so many informations and answering the text, answering the phone calls, and informing this community. It's like unbelievable. It's like we've been your students for so long time, and I know that you are behind her work. And thank you so much for each and every one of you. I'm, oh, I'm just really thrilled and delighted. I make friends, but also I make enemies because if somebody called me between five and six, I said, well, "Why are you calling? Why are you in text? Just listen to the." you know, to the, to the city what's happening. They say, no, no, we don't know. And guess what? They are their glue. Thank you so much for everything. Uh, highlights from this coronavirus is that, Judge, thank you so much for the day when you allowed the surgeries to be done, the elective surgeries to be done, and the way how you just, like, put it that the, the doctors really, they were becoming like rescuers, like being firefighters because waiting there for coronavirus. Kind of they were out of business like we, all of us are. And... Uh, we appreciate the way how you put it and the way how you, you know, the, the date when you, you know, and how you explain it. You made a big difference between the mandatory and the recommended. So it was really, you we were treating this community like, like really with a tough love. And we really appreciate that. It was just uh, probably was one of the, the most appreciated, you know, uh, items from the, uh, from all the, information that you gave it to us also taking care of like telling us about the elderly vulnerable people that was wonderful and um, another thing that I want to tell you like Sunday I went to the North Shore I mean to the um, to the seashore and the national seashore and was so grateful everybody because it was no charge so there were a lot of people there and really enjoyed so we th thank you so much for that also um, I wanted to talk today a little bit about the uh, small businesses. I'm a small business, and I still didn't recuperate from the 
um, coronavirus. I, this is this month will be the fourth month when I'm a champion of Chamber of Commerce. I do business with them, even though we are not in business right now. I really wanted to help help small businesses, and I know that that you care for small businesses. All of you, you have small businesses, and you understand how how hard this for us. You know, it's hitting hard, and it's hitting this right now. And um, I know that Peter Zanoni, the city manager, is really for small businesses. And uh, I would like to make this proposal if it's, it's in any way that you can, I can do a Facebook page and say adapt a business, a small business, but I know you can handle better. You are a business, you know, judge, you are a businesswoman and you understand, Ms. Caroline Van, she's a, she's a businesswoman and you understand how we, what we're going through. And I didn't see Spectrum, you know, reducing my bill or cutting off my bill. I didn't see at and I didn't see CPNL. I see that we pay the same money. We just like have no need to any kind of help. So if we can do like kind of adapt a business and make it Corona COVD, you know, adapt a business, that will be very good because it's really everybody needs it. It doesn't matter what, what a big business can do, but something to do for us. And, um, also, I wanted to talk about the, uh, if it's possible, this that will be it will be great to, to happen. Uh, now, I really like it everybody to ask me to do something for them. I really love to do anything for everybody. It's very hard for me to ask something to do, but I will ask your permission to do something that um, personally is that I have this bracelet that say faith, love, and uh, and uh, hope, which is really give me like more courage to ask uh, Miss Caroline Van that she's in charge of this lightening the bridge. And I think what is more wonderful to do it like tomorrow is a national day of prayer, so Sunday is a Mother's Day. So I was thinking if we can light this bridge um, orange color. And will be like all of us in solidarity with the coronavirus people that they were, you know, lost the loved one, people they still suffering, people affected. And together with the green, which is the hope. So we can show that Corpus Christi, which is body of Christ, is really a place where we can, you know, pray for these people and know that we care. So I know that is a big demand. <laughs> I'm asking um, Commissioner Van if you allowed me to ask her that I think she she has a lot of <laughs> power in doing that. <laughs> I, um, she wants you to light the bridge. <laughs> it's it's a it's a it's a request, right? <laughs> yes, it is. I, I think you're okay. Thank you. It takes more than Not for the item, though. Huh? For the agenda item, she yeah. can ask her. It takes more than a phone call to get it done. I'd be happy to light it up, Marguerite. I'd have to check into it. I just don't know if it'd be done this quickly. Well, as, uh, that's why I came two weeks ago, and I never had a chance to go to public comments. But that's okay. Just as as long as we can, you know, we can light it. I just said that tomorrow's National Day of Prayers, and we can probably. I know how fond you are about the clergy, and I was assisting all this meeting last last time, and that was very. Well, it could very be our Noises County Day. It's whenever. It's like Thanksgiving. It's whenever you're thankful, right? It's whenever. And I'll check into it, and I'll get back with you on the colors for sure. I think it was orange and green, but um, let me check into it. Okay. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that because like uh, I saw what they did for the, you know, the doctors and they were like really everybody talking about that. So I really have a lot of appreciation for that. And um, uh, also I wanted to, uh, to tell everybody that uh, you're doing a great job in, in explaining and the question that the people put there, it's just, uh, it's admirable the way how you answer, the way how uh, you really educate them in every question that they have. So I think that uh, uh, most of us, you know, we should we should tell, spread the word that if they want to know detail, if they want to know everything in this community, they can listen to this press conference every day between five and six. And thank I want you. to thank you for that. Thank you so much. And we'll get back to you on the bridge. And I and I do, I do, she just sent an email. <laughs> See how fast she works? Yes. Oh, it's, I appreciate that because I'm not, I can't take a no for an answer to therefore I don't yeah, ask. No, I, I think the bridge you. does make people feel great. It makes me feel great when I see the lights. It's and for the whole country, not only for the Nueces County. Not that's right. Nueces, it's no, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful idea. And uh, I want to thank you. So I appreciate Thank, thank you so much. You thank you. Sir. Last a couple of weeks ago. Thank you for that. Thank you. You also gave us a great idea about the food bank, and we're we're actually working with the food bank uh, now. Uh, they had a drive-through at La Palmera Mall because of you. Um, I called them and said, "How can we help?" And we sent, I think, ten county volunteers. I think every commissioner sent somebody. I know Sandra Santos went. I know, I know everybody sent somebody. Paul was there and. 
Um, anyway, it, it was great, but I want you to know it was, they're going to do a bigger one, but the point is, is that you're, you do inspire. So thank you. Thank uh, you so we much. We appreciate you. And also because I'm with the Chamber of Commerce with the small businesses, that's what I do every day. I really think about each and every one of the business. I do, bus I do business, you know, with them and that somebody has to be the Chamber of Commerce that is really small business, you know, like owners or small business that work with the small businesses because even at the national level, we don't have anyone that has the, the small business that or those are owner of the small business. So it's very, very, you know, sad. So if you can do something in this level, I will volunteer to bring all the businesses, bring all of the, you know, the needs that they have. And so, so they will be fantastic. And thank you for the drive. The drive through was just, uh, and also I heard uh, uh, the, food, the bank, uh, food bank in Corpus Christi, they call the uh, 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 Glenn Beck program. So yes, they, they did. Them. We're, we're doing great. Fed yeah. eight, uh, that day, B Hansen and her incredible crew fed 1800 families and our team had their hands somewhere in the mix. And so that was really beautiful. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really I appreciate really, you. I really appreciate you for taking time and, and uh, listening. Thank, thank you for your patience. Thank you. So talk about patience. It's your turn, Veterans Treatment Court. <laughs> I am so sorry. Uh, some good things are worth waiting for. And, and this is one of them because it's an approval of a software license agreement with Canyon City Solutions. And the purpose is a very important cause, our Veterans Treatment Court. Yes, so thank you all very much for your time. Um, Reliatrax is the software that we want to start using in the Veterans Treatment Court program. Um, it's The main goal is to be HIPAA compliant. Uh, we're discussing information with diagnosis and things of that nature with uh, our veterans, and we want to ensure that that is uh, protected. <clears throat> this is also going to bridge the gap between the agencies that sit on staff currently, and um, it's a really great tool. It's going to give us uh, notifications of pos positive UAs right away. Um, it's going to streamline everything, especially with COVID going on. It's going to really bridge the gap between all of us. We cannot sit and do our staffings uh, as we typically do. So this is going to be another means um, for and a way for us to communicate and stay up to date on everything. Um, another great function that it's going to have is we're going to be able to see the monthly reporting of any veteran, uh, ju any justice involved veteran. It, the, Kate, the, the veteran will be tracked. <clears throat> we will know whether they are accepted into the Veterans Treatment Court or if they do not meet the minimum qualifications and are discharged. So then maybe they can receive services in another form from the community, whether it's MHID or um, you know, any other services that we have available. Um, so I'm asking that the Commissioner's Court approves that and allow us to go forward with that contract. You, I mean, it's, I'm excited about this. This is so important um, for such an important population. Let's get the motion first and then we'll get to discussion. Is there a motion to approve? I don't see it on my, what, what? Okay, it's number um, five, number five. Okay. <laughs> well, just so, so we can moved. get to the discussion part. I, I was gonna say, okay. Um, Thank you. And now, are there any questions that, that you'd like to uh, to ask commissioners of this particular contract for the licensing agreement? Let's see, I'm out. 15000 So let me also add that um, I'm not sure about that amount. Um, what I have is it's $150 a month minimum. It is $3 per client. Um, for the next budget cycle, we have uh, Judge Poulter and I actually traveled to Austin to request a $200,000 grant um, from the Veterans Commission. Uh, there are, there was a minimal, there was a line item with allocated funding for uh, software. So we would hope that we would be able to also contribute from that grant. Um, I believe they're gonna have a meeting on that at the end of this month. Um, I'm not sure if that's changed with everything going on, but that's what I know at this point. Um, okay, I may. No, th no, that's fine. Um, I what can. Is it? Okay, so what is it? <laughs> How much is it? <coughs> so it's three dollars per client for every active client. We currently have 35 participants in the program. Unfortunately, we have not been able to accept anyone at this point. The, net bu the next budget cycle, we're um, anticipating 
at least a max a minimum of 75 veterans. Uh, once we start streamlining that information from the jail into the actual court, we're going to see an uptick of of participants that we're going to start accepting. So, um, but I have a minimum of $150 and $3 per client on that contract. Um, and I know I discussed that with the county attorney's office. Oh, 100 and what? Okay. And you're asking 100, is this for just I have, uh, uh, I also have the representative from the company on standby if I can phone her in, if y'all, if there's any questions regarding the contract. I do not have the contract in front of me to review that. But is this for the court, Judge Pelzer's courtroom? Yes, sir. For the veterans uh, court? Yes, sir. Judge Pulcher with the veterans treatment. And you're asking for 15000 <coughs> No, I, I don't. I think Tyner is is going to go run that down. Why don't you do this? Uh, why don't we put us a pause? Let Tyner go get the information that he needs. You also go ahead and get the text. Okay, the license agreement is straightforward. Uh, Dale, do you? I, th that's what I was just about to say. It's one hundred and fifty dollars a month. We've already, so we've already made the motion. Minimum. So move. Yeah. Let's just call the question. I think it's, I think it's good. but I'll let her bring, and go ahead and bring the information when you can get it. Right, and I think the max would, I projected was about $3,000 a year. Right. You, you, you've earned that by sitting here all day. Right, so it's $75, 75 people, $3 a pop. $225. Plus the $1,800. Call the question, Judge. Okay, well, I've got the motion, I think, already, and the second. And all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. aye post him sign. And the good news is we may be, you'll bring back a grant, which is exciting. Okay, thank you so much, appreciate it. Okay, um, again, in order to get Maria downstairs and Juan downstairs, Maria was gonna finish up. Um, just wanna ask for interest, is number two gonna be tabled? Yes. Okay, so that's, I'm gonna, can I get a motion for that, please? And a second, and all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And then, um, uh, Juan, you can be quicker than Maria. Number one was the acceptance of the roadways that are already constructed. It's just the acceptance of, of Royal Estates Unit Number Two. And are you recommending approval of the acceptance of these roadways? Yes, ma'am. And you've is recommending and you've done all your due diligence. Yes, we've, we've is this Mr. Lopez's deal? Yes, yes. yes it is. He has done way his due diligence. I, I we've think been, we've been on has. this for about a year. Yes, sir. Oh, Motion here. I mean, if he wants to, it's but, great. I just we just wanted year. to say thank you to him. Okay. But you do recommend approval. That, okay, motion and a second, I think, right here. Mr. Lopez, we just wanted to say thank you for your patience and thank you for your diligence in getting this project done, and we're happy for you, and we accept the roadways. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign. Mr. Lopez, thank you for your diligence. I know it's been a long process. We really appreciate you hanging in there, and thank you very much for all your hard work, and thank you for doing that out there. Thank you. And thanks, Juan, for kind of, you know, we got to have somebody to oversee, so you're that person for us. We thank you. Okay. And the number two is tabled. So public works is done and Juan is dismissed. And um, grants and then Dale. And I'm sorry, I'm going to get grants and go back to number eight. It's just that I got to get Maria downstairs. Go ahead, Maria. I'll be really, really quick. I um, I wanted to put this on the agenda because I know there was some questions, especially after Dale had presented the uh, the CAFR um, at the last court. I know there was a question about, um, and I did talk to Commissioner Vaughn on, offline about that, uh, about kind of the de decrease. Because if you look at the CAFR and if you look at the single audit that's included within the CAFR, it looks like we actually had a decrease in grant funding when we've actually had an increase. So I just kind of wanted to do a quick report um, just to let you know where we're at um, with our the status of a lot of our grants. So I do want to say that this report does not include um, the grants from the following departments, the health department, the juvenile department, uh, the sheriff's office for uh, various reasons and coastal parks with the exception of FEMA public assistance. Um, so this doesn't include, you know, all the grants that the health department gets. Um, I know they have like an HIV program. The juvenile department gets uh, state funding. The sheriff's office has uh, Operation Stone Garden. And of course, this does not include all the GOMESA funding that Scott um, has been successful in getting. This is your, the third page here is your, um, the most important slide. This will show you how many um, grants that we have awarded and are in the implementation phase right now. We have 38 open contracts for a total of $12,192,483. 
applications that have been submitted and are pending funding decisions. And one of those is including the um, Veterans Treatment Court um, that we were just talking about. We have 14 applications that are pending funding decisions right now for a total of $3,457,959.52. And then we also have applications that are kind of in the queue to be prepared and submitted within the next by the end of the fiscal year, and we currently have about eight applications, and there's a caveat to this, and I'll talk about that in a minute. There's eight applications that are kind of queued up to be uh, submitted in the next couple of months for about $4.2 million. And if you look, I didn't include them in the slides, but if you look at the next, um, the following two pages in your, your packets will actually have those projects uh, delineated out, so you'll see exactly what those projects are and those total amounts. These are including the match amount so just so you know um, because you know obviously we still have to track whether they're it's in kind or cash match we do still have to track those and then you'll see another page that will have the list of the applications that we have uh, submitted and are waiting funding decisions for and then that that final next page will be the applications that we're um, working on preparing so I also did kind of just a summary of our monthly activities you know we don't just um, write applications and just kind of sit around and wait for them to um, you know for them to be awarded or not awarded so I broke it down by month on what the awards that we've received the applications we've submitted we also do a lot of reporting here in our office as well as the agenda items that we've submitted to court um, it fluctuates by month to month normally October and about this time is our busiest time um, but again you can you can kind of go through that at your convenience and uh, look at kind of what those activities are on a monthly basis. In addition to just your regular submitting applications, implementing them, um, we have been doing some um, interesting activities. Um, we uh, have worked with the Army's Innovative Readiness Training Program, so we've had several um, planning events in relation to that. We're also doing things that we kind of never have done before, um, and that's meeting with um, the Opioid Task Force and meeting with uh, Christine Bryant with the um, Economic Development... Um, RDC, the CCRDC. Yes. <laughs> And um, also with the Coastal Bend Wellness Foundation. So we've been making kind of outside contacts to um, to try to get the needs of the community um, so we can better search for grants and so we can better um, serve our community. Um, so you'll see some of the meetings that we've had just kind of broken down by month um, on that slide. And then this is not all inclusive all the reports that we have sub to submit either on a monthly, quarterly, or semi-annual basis. As you can see, now that we have our CDBG $4.6 million allocation, we have to submit monthly status reports for that for that particular grant. There's um, outlay reports that we have and reimbursement requests that we have to submit monthly for Texas Water Development Board, and the list goes on and on. Again, this uh, this slide is not all inclusive of all the reports that we um, that we submit on a regular basis. So I just wanted to give a couple of quick project updates. As you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic and the military has suspended all travel for the U.S. military. So our Army, um, as you know, we were talking about the Army's IRT program. They were going to come and do uh, the surveys that we much, so much needed in the colonias. Unfortunately, they will not be able, we actually should have been executed we should have been executing that mission right now. Unfortunately, that has been postponed due to COVID, and we're looking at possibly late August, uh, sometime in September, uh, for that mission to happen. Um, and we're keeping our fingers crossed. If not, um, we, we may have to delay um, those surveys till the next summer. The environmental reviews for our projects for, uh, for our CDBG, uh, $4.6 million, we had five um, county roads um, and those environmental reviews are underway um, so we are hoping um, to, to speed up that process in the in the meantime we can go for construction uh, procurement and we'll be working with purchasing on that so they'll kind of be working in tandem with each other um, so we're hoping within the next four to five months we can start construction on those CDBG DR projects CDBG mitigation, so what we call CDBG MIT. 
there was a conference call for uh, elected officials. I uh, listened in on behalf of the judge on Monday, and those applications will be made available within the next several weeks. And this is a huge competition. This is not $4.6 million. We're talking for billion dollars that are available for the state of Texas, of which Nueces County can apply for. There are several competitions. We could submit up to, I believe, 10 applications, and we're looking at possibly you know, $100 million worth of projects that we are going to submit on behalf of Nueces County and the region. So um, that, again, is, will be coming up in the next couple of weeks. We've already kind of vetted through some projects, um, got some project ideas, and uh, I believe those applications will be due, uh, they're estimating probably in October. So that will be something that's coming down for next fiscal year. The cost allocation plan um, has been has is in its final draft. I did send a copy to the judge and to Dale um, the other day, um, and so that is um, establishing our negotiated indirect cost rate. That is hugely helpful to the county when we are talking about cash match. So rather than providing 35% in cash match, if our negotiated indirect cost rate, once it's approved by our cognizant agency, is 40% that automatically counts to our cash match. So we do not have to front the money. Basically, we submit that indirect cost rate proposal, um, and that will um, act as our cash match. So that's going to be hugely helpful to the county, not this fiscal year, but it will be in uh, the next fiscal year. And then um, part of this was made possible by, if you recall, last bu budget cycle we deleted our grants assistant position in lieu of getting this grant management software. And we have already seen the benefits. It's taken a little while to get it implemented, but we've already seen the benefits in grant searching. We are not missing a beat. And um, one of the great features of this is we can do specified searches um, so we can search for grants for nonprofits. And, you know, I know I got an email from Commissioner Chesney and he asked for school safety grants. We saved that search and now we're going to get a daily update on specific school safety grants. You know, Commissioner Vaughn had a need for playground equipment and now we've, we've kind of saved that search in there. So anything that comes available for playgrounds or um, parks will automatically come to us. So we are hoping we will not miss a grant opportunity. Um, we do get daily emails. We vet through them and make sure, you know, we're eligible. If we're not eligible, we do try to forward it along to who we think is eligible, if, whether it be a school district, a nonprofit. Um, I've sent several to MHID um, that they've actually pursued. Um, so this, this software has been hugely helpful. In addition, obviously, you know, we're, our main focus right now is finding COVID, uh, grants to respond um, to this COVID crisis. Um, we have a couple of applications, and you'll see those in that, the, the, the detail pages that I had presented before. Um, but we are looking for anything and everything that's available um, to, uh, to help reimburse the county um, for the expenses uh, related to COVID. <clears throat> so um, with that, I'll take any questions. If you have any questions, um, I decided to do this kind of semi-annually only because we were, um, we were in the process of implementing um, this software and it took us a little longer than we initially expected. Um, but if, you know, if it's, it's the courts will, I, I, I work for you, so um, let me know if you want it quarterly, if you need more detail. We are working on some other um, information. We want to have like a rate of success. So we want to be able to tell you, you know, we submitted, you know, I talked earlier, we submitted 14 applications and we're pending funding decisions. We're not going to get all of them. That's just the nature of the beast. But we would like to be able to tell you this is our success rate. Out of 14 applications, we had, you know, we're going to be hopeful. We get 12 uh, funded. So we're hoping to get that information to you. It's just taking us a little longer, um, but but we hope to really, really make this a state-of-the-art report. Um, and, and it can be as detailed as you want it. I kind of left it a little bare bones since this is the first time we're kind of working in the system. Um, but again, you know, it can be tailored to whatever you all need. Well, I just want to tell you thank you. I think you're doing a really good job, and the county could not survive without the grant department. Y'all are doing. In fact, we carry a lot of other political jurisdictions because they don't necessarily have a grants department, you know. So when it comes to our smaller communities, we re they rely on us, which means we rely on you for them as well. 
And uh, so we're very grateful. I did step out of the room, so I don't know if you said this, but I think that one of the things that I'm noticing is that there's not going to be any leeway. All the big grants that are due this summer are still due. They may have been given a week or two little extension, but we have our work cut out for us between the Texas Water Development Board, um, the Restore, and the um, NCRDS, and a missing one. CDBG -MIT. And CDBG MIT, hello, the 4.6 billion. Those are going to be all coming literally at the same time. And I truly believe Nueces County has positioned itself in the best possible situation because we've already identified you know what it is that we want and so as I said these cycles come down there the big money pot is really for 2021 and 2020 looks quieter but that's because it's the application process the rulemaking was in 2019 early 2020 and now it's our time to seize the day and Maria and Natalie have been fantastic uh, as I've kind of you know kept them super super busy making sure that we can focus on those and not lose sight but not miss opportunities for individual commissioners' needs, or the um, or the uh, or the specialty COVID, you know, funding, but no doubt the big money is is yet to come that we are eligible for, and we're just going to have to really get after it to put together the best packages. So thank you for this. I'd say get as detailed as you can, and then go ahead and do a simple like for me. I think it's best to do both. I think you should do this type of presentation and then go ahead and just send us the detailed and then we'll use this one for court, but we'll have the backup data in our offices, maybe something like that. Is any, are there any questions from Maria? Yeah. I don't know if you said it. Did you say that we were not eligible under the CARES Act at this time, but they're pending a new possible CARES Act three legislation in the house? So, um, so I know we talked about that the last time that, that, um, that, particular like stimulus funding was for jurisdictions above 500,000 in population. Um, so yeah, things are changing every day. Again, you know, we, we actually have a COVID search going on. So we do get updates yeah. on everything CARES and, Act and, right. you know, um, I know um, Rebecca and social services just told me that there's a CARES Act for social services. So we're going to go after that. There's a CARES Act for airports and I believe they're going to be getting a, a, a they're getting an allocation of some together. sort. Um, it's all formula. Some some we have control over, some we don't. Um, so yeah, we're Thank we're, you, we're definitely looking well, for everything. We want them all, so apply for all of them. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. If there's no other questions, we'll let Maria go on to her intended designation. Uh, there is one item that we need to go to. That's number six, and then we'll be able to go to Dale, and it's the allocation of the Family Protection Fee Fund. And this is an important uh, dollar amount. It's estimated to receive, I believe we get this in August, and it's about $100,000, $98,000, something like that, Tyner? We don't know exactly, but yeah, it's Jill. It's a guesstimate. There's, there's no change to this, is there? This is no, this is what we do every year. But motion this, to approve. Yeah, this is $5,000 more okay. than last year, though. Okay, we're getting a little, okay. We're giving more. All right. Uh, I think I heard the motion come from Commissioner Chesney, and then, okay, you got it. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. aye post same sign. Okay. Um, now, um, uh, Dale, you have two items that I'd like for you to help address. One is on the regular agenda, and one is the budget change order. Why don't we do the budget change order, and then we'll we'll end with the with the other one because it's going to take a little longer, most likely. And then. Um, Open number eight, Judge. A D one. Yes, he's going to go back to eight after he does the budget change order. Table that and then we're going to go behind doors and discuss it. It's on. It's on. Exactly. It's on the executive. I just didn't know if you wanted to do it out here as well. I don't know. I, I didn't know. Uh, B Belinda. It was placed on the executive as well in case there was any legal issues. It doesn't have to be. It just, it doesn't have to be. It's, it's whatever you want. Okay, let's let him do the budget change order while we, while we ponder. Thank All right, you. go ahead. It's, it's number, uh, in our books, D1, number 13. Thank you, Your Honor. We're considering budget change order number 13 for your consideration. Uh, these are kind of more routine. There are a couple of large uh, entries that I'd like to discuss. Uh, the very first is on uh, information technology. Now, it's not that there that there's uh, moving some stuff around. It's just because when we did the budget last year, we assumed that it was going to be a, a different type of a, a function. So we budgeted as other services. But when it came in, it came in more as software services. So we just had to move it to the correct budget category. 
So we're just moving the, the balances around. That's also what's happening on page two for Coastal Parks and the $15,000. Because of, with working with GLO, we know there are some expenses that are in Coastal Parks that should be recorded in the pier. We wanna make sure they're allocated there so that we don't have to worry about uh, doing a lot of uh, changes for our GLO reports. So this is the budget change order that we're submitting for you for your consideration, budget change number 13. I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. Is it best to characterize it that it's truly a change, but it's not a budget change? Correct. It's a net neutral. I'm going to make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Is there any more discussion or questions regarding the change orders? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Dale, I have a question for Dale. Oh, did you, you put out this one here? No, that's that's from, uh, from Teresa on, on, on entire staff. Oh, okay. And that's for our capital projects. You can go over it now, Dale, if you'd like. Well, I just wanted to make, you know, like some projects that are already done, can we just in the, put an asterisk? Do we know they're done? Because, I mean, we keep looking at the same things all, all over again. And I know that some are done. But yes, my staff constantly works up the, the balances for our capital projects to try to identify uh, those that are, are, are completed. And sometimes it gets a little challenging because sometimes we'll ask someone that if it's completed, one person will say yes, five people say no. So we, we try to go through each of them and, and try to get a, a clear identification of which one has actually been complete. And we will make sure those are, are, are removed from your discussion. Bishop building is complete. Probably, yes. We'll probably make, remove that, yes. And, um, the, roof, the roof. Okay, why don't we get an updated one? And then one other area on that, I just sent that, I just actually sent something to Teresa. I, I note that the, the London... Um, uh, 33? Yeah, initial, no, uh, 49, that, that initial work oh. is on there, but the costed out analysis isn't on there, so it probably should be because we've already brought that to court and it should be uh, looked upon as encumbered funds so that it doesn't mislead the court into thinking there's more there than there is. So um, She can change that. We can get that. So we'll get, uh, okay, we'll get an updated version by tomorrow on those two items. Let me see if I can also create an Excel spreadsheet that would show where we are in the project. For example, when you look at a road, all you're seeing is the design piece of it, right? In other words, it's it, so we need to know not just that it's complete, what stage of the project maybe is it in? If is it in design? Is it in construction? Is it? Have way through. So again, the purpose here is just to show you where you are on the tax notes. And I will make sure what we, we uh, expand on this. So I'll give you the, the budget CEOs. as well as what the actual expenses are so you know where we are in the, in the process. Okay. Thank you, Dale. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dale. Let's go back, Dale, to the um, uh, item that we that we skipped. And uh, I do need everyone to know, even if we do letter A in executive session, um, we still have one more item in executive session. So we still have to go to executive session is what I'm saying to you. So is it your will then to go to executive session now? I don't know. I, I tell you what, why don't we get the update first and then we can discuss it in executive session. The update, Dale, is a probably a good idea to share the burn rate as well as the, the personnel component of that burn rate. And I've got your email if you need it. And again, the item for the for the both listening, it has to do with item number eight, and it has to do with um, personnel cost for overtime, uh, including uh, county department heads, uh, COVID-19 response. The burn rate's going to have everything in it, but the purpose of this agenda item is to discuss the uh, approval of overtime relating to the COVID-19 response, including personnel costs. So it's kind of, I guess, two things. It's personnel plus the burn rate. Well, at least it, I guess it could be considered both. Okay, we're still working on trying to get the uh, updated numbers for this afternoon. Uh, should be okay. That soon. We'll do it from yesterday. Do it from yesterday. Our total personnel costs associated with the entire event, that's actual work hours for people actually doing their job as the COVID expense, is $283,048. Currently, overtime costs, which is everybody, I'm, this includes everybody, is $95,949 in total overtime costs for overtime related to whether it's regular employees or department heads. I can give you a breakdown on the, the department heads at a later time if we, we do see so fit. Well, right now we have some uh, personal P-card transactions where we have normal costs that go straight to our COVID expense. And right now I do have the actual numbers for that. It's 
$598 worth of expense for transactions we handled through P-Cards. Much? Say it one more time. $71,598. That's as of today. As of today. Okay. Michael has some inventory downstairs in, in the central supply room that he's been distributing out to for this event. For, for as of today, we've expended $14,541 worth of expenses coming out of our central supply. Now, Michael also does some purchases through uh, normal purchasing items that has not been expensed yet through a invoice or P-card, but we know the expense is coming. This is our, our iPads and our, our PPE, our, our our cleaning services that we, we know will be coming in for the jail. Right now, we estimate $182,541 of expense. My staff and I have gone through how much money we expected that we lost in revenue to the county, and this includes coastal parks, inland parks, fairgrounds, includes our county clerks, our district clerks, our, 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 our tax office, everyone that we can include. Right now, we expect that we've lost $2,533,000. Is that including JPs? Yes. <laughs> so right now, if we, we, we include all that, that for the county by itself is $3,181,381 of total expenses related to, the, to the, this event. I'm so sorry. Would you repeat that again? $3,181,381. Great. So right now in Austin, formulas are being looked upon and cities are going to have one set of formulas and counties will have another set of formulas and those parameters are um, being discussed now and the senator senator Hinojosa asked us to give keep him updated we've been keeping him updated as to these amounts including a projected loss of revenue and of course we do expect to receive an allocation and what that allocation is, we don't know. They are discussing per capita. I object to per capita. Per capita is not proper unless you consider that the urban center of the city of Corpus Christi is part of Nueces County. We, they understand my feelings, and um, in this case, to me, the city would be unjustly enriched under this program, and we would be unjustly uh, punished, particularly when we've been carrying the lion's share of, uh, a, a, well, along with the city. I mean, they have different needs right than we do but we've been carrying the lion's share of emergency management for the entire county and so um, again we do expect to have an appropriation what that appropriation will be we don't know but we will submit everything including lost revenue what i can tell you is that if you were to separate lost revenue and just stick to money we've expended chances are we're going to be made whole the issue is whether or not we would be made whole for lost revenue Okay. And the lost revenue right now, we're, we're, we're not, this is not total lost revenue at the moment. We've only went through the middle of April. We're still got that, the end of April that, and March. That, and May. That, that's correct. So we've got a lot to uh, account for. This is no different than the city projecting a $20 million loss. Sometimes your flaws can be your strength. I told the senator this is one time where I guess I'm not, I'm, I don't have to worry about sales tax or um, hot tax, that's where their deficit comes from, the loss of such things. We do not rely on that. We do rely on ad valorem, and that's why it's going to be important to understand, um, you know, what our uh, assessed value is and how it compares from last year uh, to this year. I can tell you that Dale and I have received those numbers. Those numbers are uh, conservative numbers. Uh, we're going to see growth again this year. We're going to see it exactly tracking last year, and conservatively, we project 3%. We do that knowing that is a almost a number that's half of what it really is, but we run on those types of 50% of, uh, of growth. And so, you know, I think that there will be, I'm certain, a hit, if you will, on ad valorem, but the growth will also compensate for that. We are not a county that's relying upon mineral interest, which is where the big sector is getting hurt in county government. We are not a county that relies on sales tax or hot tax. So um, the biggest loss of revenue are places where we make money, like in coastal parks, like in fees and fines. And that's why the administration of justice coming back online in June is a positive thing for this county. Uh, in other words, there's a finite revenue of loss. We can restore fees and fines 
and we can restore um, the other elements of um, the RV park and things like that by coming back online. So those losses are not projected to go into the future. They're finite. And again, if you'll uh, give us the indulgence of giving us a little time, uh, I've asked Noe Inahosa from Estrada Inahosa to um, put together a projection for us based on what Dale's numbers are showing losses and to see how that might affect us. Economists everywhere are making predictions. Moody's is making predictions. Some counties will be reversed from stable to negative. My hope is that we will not be one of those counties. Uh, but having a sector that's so heavily dependent upon energy, you know, that could affect us. But, but again, those dollars will be submitted uh, for you know, possible allocation. And it has nothing to do with FEMA, okay? Totally different. This is all CARES Act supplemental funding. Um, you, you know we got $11 billion, and the big cities and the big counties got most of it. And what's left for the rest of us is not enough. Uh, but having said that, I know they're working hard to advocate for our cause. And as you said, our, our loss revenue don't right now does not include property tax, and we're, we're, we're evaluating that. But like you said, uh, we're very little on minerals. Uh, our county only has like 13 to 14 percent minerals, where some right. counties are 80 percent minerals, and that's where it, it's not hurting us very much. We assume we'd be more with being on the port, but ours is more in, in, in infrastructure than in minerals. So that's where we're, that's where we're a good good point. Right, and when we rebound, we will rebound high. In other words. Um, I think that I read in the report two days ago that uh, the Permian will probably be off by 900,000 barrels a day and the, and the Eagleford 400,000 barrels. However, our sector, um, we, we recorded a record first quarter earnings. I mean, yes, first quarter earnings in the port for 2020. So this next quarter is going to be the one to look at and the one after that. But uh, we are still tracking, which is good. I asked Dale to please provide to me and to the court, I think by next court he'll have it, uh, where we're tracking this budget to last budget. In other words, how are we doing on our own spending this year? And that'll also help us. Um, not to add salt to a wound, but the reason I mentioned the CAFR is because the one thing that no one really made any mention about, and it needs to be, it needs to be mentioned, is that because our reserves have been healthily restored to 24 um, million dollars, I'm sorry, to 24 percent or 22.9 million dollars. This is indicative of where a Moody's might say, you're looking real good. You're looking much more stable than you are anything else. So we're going to be working with the rating agencies. I've already placed the call to Noe. I'd like for him to come to court maybe in June, early, like maybe that first court tiner after the next court. I think that'd give us enough time. And have him, you know, share with us what we're seeing um, on the on the markets, right? Um, so, having said that, some things will be good news and some things will be bad news. Well, one other thing, I, I don't include this on our burn rate since uh, uh, our our adult probation is kind of a quasi kind of organization. They're not really county, they're not really state, but they've lost a significant amount of probation fees, and they're having to furlough half their staff. So I'd like to bring that up uh, with you. I met with William Schull, and uh, that is an issue. It's really something we cannot allow to happen. Right. Um, I think that we, we're going to need to discuss a transfer to them yes. uh, and, and get that approved because we will not be able to recover fees in the future if we furlough and bring them back online. I want to remind the court they carried us for over a year last year when we needed it and they need it right now, and um, they won't need an answer until they've got some cover, so to speak. Yeah, they've got some cover in, uh, from the state because the state advances their funds, and we've been in discussions with them, and we just need to work with Dale this coming week, maybe tomorrow, Friday, whenever we can break in to address this issue because we, we, we must have probation up and running uh, full speed. It's the only way to, uh, to kind of ensure that we don't lose track not only of people, but of, um, of these fees. Judge, uh, Judge when you said one of those, we set aside $2 million for these uh, COVID-19. COVID yes. Uh, does that come from, where, that, where does the $2 million come from? Right now, that's a loan, of, of, of available loan from the general fund. We have not expended that from the general fund yet. 
we're spending everything from Fund 13 until the event's over with to determine how much we need and then determine how much reimbursement we're going to get from whatever party we get re re reimbursed from. And then we'll determine the amount of funds needed and most likely it'll come from the general funds reserve. So, so maybe so we have the a loan for two million. It's not that we're giving two million dollars for the expense. We're 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 loaning the balance of the funds until we get reimbursements. And this is how you did it for Harvey, and that was also the same exact amount. Correct. We use it a lot for Harvey. Yeah, we went back to the. Um, yeah, we moved off the auditors and went to. Uh, I'm sorry, went from the budget change order. We went to the. Yes, yeah, sorry, number seven. Sorry, thank you for keeping us on track. We really should get to the next one. I think is what Belinda's nicely saying. Is um, she's being very kind. Uh, she, she's the only one that has any grace and decorum, I guess. Except for Commissioner Vaughn, she's been an angel today. So good today. Okay, uh, we won't mention any other names. Haha. <laughs> We're just having fun here. We have to have a little bit of lightheartedness. Okay, now let's go back to the right one, right? That's number eight. Thank you, Belinda. Um, the number eight is you started with the burn rate. You said you were going to get us the breakdown. Commissioner, he does not have the breakdown, but how about questions for him right now? He, he gave you the whole burn rate that includes everybody, but he doesn't have the one that you're asking. The whole number was 98000 That included personnel of both classes, if you will, uh, exempt and non-exempt. And um, what questions do you have for him? Or what would you like him for, to address, I guess, maybe is the way to say it. What would you like him to address? Well, I can give you a breakdown on uh, overtime by uh, uh, regular employees and, and uh, uh, exempt employees, if you, if you like. I have that number. Well, would that help them? If, if so. Okay, why don't you go ahead the, and say uh, that. Of the total amount of 99000 we we said $77,603 is regular uh, employees that have, have, have overtime expense. And currently, the department heads we have identified individually are eighteen thousand three hundred forty-five dollars for the okay. total of ninety-nine thousand. All right, so eighteen thousand is department heads, and seventy-seven. I'm I'm guesstimating here, okay? Seventy-seven. Yes. 77. That's out that's out, your breakdown. Out of the regular employees, about how many employees is that? I provide you a, a list on Monday. Yeah. Uh, Don't make me count. How about time or count? Do you mind counting, 100, please? Probably 100. How, how many? many? Probably hundred. One hundred. An average. Okay. Okay. One hundred. Probably he's probably he's probably. he's going to get you an exact, but that's a good guesstimate. So Melissa mentioned um, while you're thinking about the questions, um, Melissa Melissa mentioned that um, that we're preparing for hurricane season, and we're all sort of having palpitations over it because of the implications of we know how to prepare for hurricane season, but we're having to prepare in a completely different way, and so. Um, I just want you to know that the purpose of this policy is to protect this county fiscally. I know fiscally you are you have concerns, and so I want to say this is the way to protect us. If we do not have a policy that includes department heads, we will not be able to seek reimbursement for FEMA with department heads if we go through a hurricane. And I think it's absolutely critical that we do that, that we do everything in, in our power to make sure that we can, when we know it's 100% foreseeable, that that EOC rideout team for hurricanes, the majority of which are department heads, when they're working 24-7, you've got to have a mechanism for reimbursement. It has to be documented in an employee policy followed by a court's policy that approves it. Um, we did that back in September. We did an, we did a amendment in, I don't know, what's, what month is this? It's like, what day is this? Two months ago. This is what protects us. What, what you possibly have at risk that we discussed last court is now been defined as $18,000 under FEMA. But under CARES Act, it's totally applicable. So I just want you guys to know that this, the, the fiscally responsible thing to do is to leave this policy in place. You had some good questions. I had to go dig them answers out because I didn't have them. I wish, I don't know, because I didn't get here uh, early enough to find out if this is just on my desk or on everybody's desk. And what this is is the fair, um, it's some guidance um, from the Fair Labor Standards Act, FLSA. This is the, the act that kind of protects employees. And Belinda's here to help, I think, maybe answer some questions. But you talked about lunch, and that was a big issue, and we didn't want to be in uh, peril 
or trouble. I don't even know if that's the right. Well, my concern was uh, a lot of the employees were, you know, were working seven or eight days in a row when, when not recording lunch. We want to make sure if they, if they work through lunch, we're going to pay them. No, no questions asked. Right. But if they did take lunch, we want to make sure they documented so. And yeah. some were just putting one one line with all, with work. Right. And so we we were just we, questioning them with, with that. Correct. And we we brought that up in EOC and said, please do a better job. I know you're on the phone. You say it every time. I don't want you to think that you're not saying it, but. Sometimes you need it echoed, and so we said, please make sure that you're not using one words or two words or three words. Document uh, your work such that if you're working lunch and working, if you're having a sandwich and working, which a lot of them do, work. that's still working. And that's what the Department of Labor says is work, and that's what the Fair Labor Standards Act says is work. So um, that's really important. But lunch is not required to take under the Department of Labor standards. And I didn't know that, and I had to go look it up. And I gave it to Belinda as a please confirm. And so now you can ask your questions. But um, we have urged everybody to do best documentation practices. So they get paid for lunch. Is that what you're saying? They get paid for lunch if they're eating and working only. Eating and working only. Okay, here's my concern. Mm -hmm. I think there's some things that the department heads can do to cut down on the, on the overtime. Mm -hmm. um, let's just say Edwards Department, for example, because I know they've worked a lot of hours. They have. They've had to set up. So if you've got cross training is a big deal for me. I just, I just don't think you ever go without cross training, and I think that's something this county has got to do. But they could rotate. If you go in at 5.30, you get off at 3.30 or whatever and have somebody else come in. I don't know how you do it, but those department heads should be able to think out of the box so that they don't have all this overtime. And just like Melissa, she's lucky to have Kathy. And I look at Edward, and I'm thinking he's there all the time. He, a good manager has someone to take their place if something happens to that person. And I don't see that in some of the departments here, and that's very scary. And, Judge, I think you would agree with that. I do. Because I when you I run, think we're very lean. Yeah. When you run any company, even with Juan's department, I'm, I think they've worked the whole time. But I believe he has somebody in there that could take his spot if they needed to for a short period of time. On the other departments, I don't know if they do and they're just not trusting them and they're not delegating, I don't know. But I believe that some of these department heads, it's their responsibility to curb this overtime. They can do it. Mm -hmm. You've just got to think out right. of the box. I do want you also to know, I checked with the city of Corpus Christi to see what their policy is during this COVID and they're doing the same exact thing that we're doing, uh, which is paying overtime. And um, I also checked with some of the bigger counties, and they are also doing the same thing. So I just needed to get some information. We didn't have it all. The last workshop, we did seek it out, and, and we did provide to the county attorney so that they could make comment to any of you what the situation is. But again, what's exposed right now that's non-reimbursable is $18,000 over 100 days. I think that's pretty great uh, knowing that Again, I'm asking you to trust me, but I've been there as a witness uh, representing the county and seeing everything they've done. It's quite frankly not even, if you had told me it was 180000 I would tell you it was worth it. If you told me it was $1.8 million, I'd tell you it's worth it. These folks have kept your county running, and the difference between the loss of revenue that Dale's talking about and what we would have had if we couldn't keep running you know, some courthouses across the state of Texas completely closed. You know, we're kind of in that in-between urban, rural mix of a county. Our losses would be much, much greater. And so I agree with you. I think that as we talk about resiliency plans and lessons learned, being able to encourage everybody to create those rotations. But like where this, since basketball is how we started, maybe basketball is how we end. Um, I know Juan likes sport metaphors, so here's one for everybody. And that is our bench is not deep. We have like the best NBA players. They're all stars, every single one of them. But the bench is not deep. And the reason it's not deep is because we prefer, or at least we've preferred, keeping our budget lean and mean. And we just don't have the employees, let's say, that the city of Corpus Christi does. And you talked about their billion-dollar budget versus our $100 million budget. They are Goliath in this room. But make no mistake, we've been able to keep up with them pace for pace on every department through this process. And it just goes to show you there's kind of that perfect balance. So I would love nothing more 
than to tell you that we need more people. And I think you're feeling it right now. But yeah, we need to have planners, we need to have communicators, and we need to have um, just so many, uh, what was the other one you just said? Uh, in one part. Uh, I, I, said, I said Juan's department, Edward's Juan's department. department. <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, we need to be deeper. But IT is one of the yeah, ones. Yeah, we need to be deeper everywhere, but we've just not grown into ourselves. We've stayed, <laughs> we've stayed the same for a long time. So I think this pandemic reveals a lot about us, but it also reveals a lot of good. It's not all bad, but to your point, I will make a point um, to let everybody know, and I think you've seen it already, a, a major decline in overtime, but where possible, you know, do the rotation uh, to, to reduce the hours. You know, if you start at 530, I think you said, let's end at 330. I don't, you know? I don't even know, but I just know that there is a way to do it, and I haven't seen them right. doing that, and I'm thinking, you have to right. help us here right? because people are going to want raises. They're going to want all kinds of stuff down the road, and we're going to have to come right. say, wow, we don't have any money. And I think that there's not one person here that would begrudge anyone to have overtime that needs yeah. it. I don't think there's one person, especially the ones underneath the management, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. even in our company, we're on 24-hour call. Yeah. Our managements make really good salaries. There's a reason for that yeah. because we know they're going to have to work. And and also exempt employees, just again, I learned a lot by reading all this, um, and I'll, I'll make sure Tyner gets it to you, but exempt employees are not subject to this act. So, um, and they, they are uh, eligible, you know, for overtime under the law. So everything we've done is not only legal, but as I said, my concern is in, in the, I believe we've done the right thing, and I believe we can do more by encouraging people to create I would say best practices is the way to say it, so we can limit our exposure. But when you think about 100 days of COVID pandemic, and I walk out here and I tell somebody who's in governance, hey, I've got $18,000 in department head overhead, there should be like a ticker tape parade <laughs> because it's a really good result for the amount of hours that have been put in to go completely remote with your justice system, completely remote with your, you know, tax system, all of the things that we've done, it's just a really good result. But I'm in favor of making sure that everybody knows you got to keep uh, a checks and balances. One of the things that Dale has offered that we will take him up on is that internal audit so that we can look at documentation and kind of flag documentation that's not good. He's doing that. We're also going to flag it independently. So Dale's our auditor, and then he uses an external auditor. He's going to use that for this too. Why? Not because we don't love these folks and not because we don't believe them, but because FEMA will do it. So we got to do it too. So we got to make sure that it's all done uh, well. So we have the checks and balances in place. That means you can look your people in the eye because it comes up every court. You're worried about the taxpayer. The taxpayer is protected in this case because the policy gets us the reimbursement. Without the policy, you are exposing the taxpayer. So if you want to help your taxpayer, the most fiscally responsible thing to do is to create the policy that has the mechanism for, um, uh, for reimbursement. And I have to tell you, I don't beg, um, but I am begging all of you, honestly, as we come into June 1st, to not let us be exposed for COVID and a hurricane by not being able to seek reimbursement. If we don't have this written policy that corresponds with the employee policy, honestly, all we're doing is, is allowing people to work up here 24 seven, because that's what happens in a hurricane, and then not letting us have a way, a mechanism to get the money back. Well, and that's, that's, that's what I want to say. You know, and I agree with you, gotta have a mechanism, Judge, but you know, and I'm, I feel, they, they, they worked it, they should get, uh, after right now, they should get paid. I mean, they worked it up to this point, they should get paid. We, there's hard, it's a hard to go back and say who worked, who didn't work, and how many hours, and Dale's still trying to get documentation on, on the lunch hours. They're still got to get doc documentation on the, you know, and I asked one person about, well, I was on the phone, if, you, if I'm on the phone 10 minutes, I get paid overtime. Well, that's true, but, if, if you, but you, that, you don't get paid for the whole hour. You know, you're on the phone for 15 minutes, you get paid for 15 minutes, not for a whole hour. You know, I mean, four hours in one day, I said, you know, 15 minutes each hour, that's only about an hour. You know, so, but, and some are saying, well, they told me to go ahead and put the whole thing. 
I think what happened here is we kind of opened up the door and we lost control of nobody was watching nobody. You know, that's what I think. I mean, I might be wrong, but I think the managers, like you said, they might, whatever they work, they deserve to, to get paid, but the department heads <coughs> need to be department heads. You know, they need to watch their, their people. You know, and, and if, they, if I got my people working Monday to Thursday at noon and they already work four hours, I mean, I, I, sh I should be able to get, send them home at four o'clock. You know, why not four o'clock? It's only one hour. I mean, nothing's gonna work, nothing's gonna change for one hour, you know? In the, or send them Friday half a day in the afternoon and cut back on the overtime. It's not that we don't wanna pay them overtime, Judge, it's just that sometimes we're, we might be okay this year, but maybe next year we're not. It all depends right. on the budget. Mm -hmm. And and you in, and I know you talk about policy, but you know, and I didn't think I don't think we stuck by policy. We have a policy, but we didn't really follow policy. What what didn't we follow? It says here, let me just read to you here. It says in disaster shall continue during dependency of the disaster up to fourteen days. You know, that they can collect fourteen days. If the disaster happens from the day it starts, they collect they can do overtime for fourteen days unless a longer period is approved by the commissioner's court. So it never came to us for 40, after 14 okay, days. Okay, but we're under a federal disaster and a state disaster. It doesn't make, it doesn't say anything about any, what kind, it just says disaster. It doesn't say, I'm talking about our policy, okay? I'm just reading from mm -hmm. the policy. We need to correct the policy, we need to correct the policy, but it says disaster, I guess it's talking about any disaster. Once it starts, they can start collecting over, they can do overtime, but up to 14 days, we have to go back and review it again. So we, do we continue it or do we stop? No. Right. But that's, but that's, but that's what I'm trying. I'm trying to go back to say about, about the yeah, overtime. I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, we need to look at it, you know, maybe and go back and, and re, maybe reword it or do, you know, more strategies, but we, we didn't, we just didn't follow the policy and it's okay. So, you know, we're, we're where we're at now and I don't, like I said, I, I have a hard time. I also have a hard time doing it, but I, you know, I, if they worked it, they deserve it. I don't have a problem with that. You know, and I think that probably everybody deserves it. It's just, it, when I talk to, when I sit down with Dale and sit down with Adea, you know, and, and we, I, we know with the records, it was, it was hard for me to make out what, what they were doing. I think it was hard for Dale. It was hard for, the, for, for his staff to figure out. And I guess, I'm, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, I don't want to talk in your place, Dale, but. I mean, I know there are a lot of things you couldn't, ex they couldn't explain to me, you know? How did they come up with those hours? So. Well, and I think that Dale, do you have the situation reports? Yeah, they have the reports right, so your daily reports have to correspond to the, you know, to the hours. And those situation reports should be synced up. And if there's a problem with somebody kind of not filling out those situation reports in depth, you know, we need to be able to let them know sooner rather than later so they don't kind of repeat the same type of vagueness. But Okay. Right, between executive time and that. And and I want to point out is that if everybody's just kind of sitting at their desk, you know, doing their daily report very calmly is one thing. But the problem is is that in the middle of a disaster, um, you're going to not have necessarily the same exact, you know, verbiage on either because you're asked to being documented during the same thing. I just want to say, I want to make sure we get some guidance from the county attorney. What is it that you're recommending uh, at this time? Now, the other question I have, who is who signs off on that? I mean, the department has supposed to sign it off, approve it? Yes. Have they been doing that? Yes. So I guess they're-, they're Are they employees? I think, I think, yeah, I think they all, they, they all should be signed, but, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, and, and I'm going to just by the well, Let's fix it. Let's fix whatever we need to fix. I just want you to know this county cannot afford to not have this policy. Wait. We are a hurricane area and FEMA, this was identified a year ago in July um, as a really bad gap that we didn't have. And you all spent a lot of money 
and got zero reimbursement. And we fixed that. And I'm saying that the, the nature of the beast is that department heads are your EOC rideout team for Hurricane, and they also, a lot of them are, are your EOC rideout team for this pandemic. And you want to be able to recapture all those dollars in reimbursement. And without a policy, the rules say you can't capture them. So I think that there could be some enhancements on the documentation. We're going to continue to use HR. Today's the first day back at, I see Julie in the back of the room. That's her job to consistently tell them, document, document, document. Allocations need to be made. But the idea in some situations, wherever possible, we need to say, try to help the county by managing the time, right? It's no different than the sheriff's office. We have, you know, millions of dollars of overtime. We tell them the same thing. It can't be done sometimes. And that's the same thing here. It can't be done. At 4 o'clock, it would be nice to think that Edward could leave. I'm going to be honest with you. I, there's been so many days where that man has worked from 5 until midnight. And you just think to yourself, I wish I could give the guy a break. But there's nobody else but Edward because he's the guy that can really run the show. And maybe that kind of goes back to your beginning comment. He needs to train somebody else because what if we don't have right. an Edward? Can I ask a question? Can I try to yes, of course. And I try to give them off from Friday, but I, I can't approve that because I don't know who authorized the work. So I'm, you see, for me to say, oh, Edward, take off Friday, so you can. Well, and and that's why that's why we've been sort of saying that EOC is a second job in the middle of your first job. So there's no breaks because he's doing two things simultaneously. As Lance said earlier, typically in a wind and water event, we're not even here. We're not doing the court's business. So you've never seen this before. So now you're doing the court's business like I'm here today doing the court's business, but then I'll transition immediately into doing everything else. And so I think that's where uh, there is no way that you can give him off because he is a section chief, and that section chief is on duty. And that's where it gets difficult. But your checks and balances are there. Department heads approve the employees. I'm also worried about him, Judge. You know, I, you know, I see the, I see he's stressed out. Yeah. You know, uh, I work with him all the time. We are, you're, you. And, and, you know, a lot of them are. I'm not saying, no, I'm not yeah. saying you're not, I'm not. No, I know. Well, I right agree now, he should have somebody flagging him, going with him and being trained. Yeah. Because if something happens to him, God forbid, to anybody that's in leadership like that. Right. I mean, or the other department people, for that matter, yeah. we would be in a pickle. Well, and like, yes, we would. If tomorrow I take my more, I'll take Bishop. Don't worry about Bishop, you know? But, do, but, do but the problem is, is that he is a supervisor, right? And so you really can't just... He ought to be able to, but he ought to, but he ought to be able to turn his normal daily routine over to somebody else. And uh, he needs to work on the EOC. He ought yeah. to be able to, him or any of them ought yeah. to be able to, is what I think... We're I think I think we need to I think we need to and, and as they say and if we had a little time we could create a nice little org chart and we could work on it. Now we'll tell you one positive. We have Corn Ferry who's been working for us remotely. Remember that's the comp, that's the compensation study group. One of the things that's their forte is organizational structure. You could ask them, "Hey, while you're at it, why don't you look to see who in each department head's organization could be that second in command?" But I'm going to tell you something. When you're already paying every department head lower than any other county around you, you got a problem, except for IT maybe. But the point is, is that you don't have the pay structure to even get to your succession. A successor is like a deputy, and we don't have that in our organizational structure. But I think we could ask Corn Ferry to, to, to say, how do we look here? Who, is, who could you elevate to do the cross well, I think we have to because we're putting the county at risk by not having people to fill those positions. I mean, to me, it's just ridiculous. And I would think that there would be someone that has watched him over the years that doesn't have to, maybe the education, but the common sense to do what he does. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would just think you would look at your people and say, you could do this. Yeah, well, cross training is a yeah, great, is, is a great, great gift. And, and I think it's, I, but look, there's, uh, forgive me, but there's only one Tyner. There's only one Tyner right now. I couldn't agree with you more, and Tyner and I talk about that all the time. And there's only one Michael right now. And there's only one almost everything because that's the way we've been running so long for so hard. 
And um, the judge, there wasn't just always yeah. one Michael. He had someone else, and he was under them. Michael so he was able. Right yeah, he stepped right, right that in. That one was a really great one. Now yeah. we're trying, and he is doing that. He just hired somebody, Someone's and he is trying. doing that in his department. But right now, like, let's take, we have a great deputy in emergency management, but, you know, she's only been on the job under a year, okay? And, and she's never been through a hurricane before. So it's, it's, she has been amazing on the job training, but the point is, is that we're getting there, but we're, we're certainly a county in growing pains. Um, so what did you want yeah, go ahead? I just wanted to jump in if you were done. Yeah. Okay. So I've got a couple of questions. One, I think, or a couple of points too. One, I think it's important to note, and I know it was not intentional, but the overtime is not for a hundred days. The overtime is from March 13th because that was when okay. the order was declared. So the overtime is from March 13th until today so that's that that's a significant difference because that's about 40 something days for 45 days so that's a significant difference and I think that just needs to be pointed out and again I know that wasn't intentional because I know you've been working on 150 days so I, I get why the, yeah, the number sorry. is so so that's okay uh, and then the, the question I have really is um, you, you know there and I unless something's changed what you told me before and I may have missed something in all this is the rule now is there is no reimbursement whatsoever for department heads. When the uh, original policy was that we had to use department, the, uh, the department heads was excluded as a uh, overtime cost. Now, I'm saying if we count the FEMA, now, if we count 12, then they qualify. But if we count FEMA, they will not reimburse us because the FEMA policy is already affected by the county. No, but I thought you told us no matter what, department heads weren't eligible for reimbursement. If you use FEMA, but not if you use CARES Act or anything or any other what supplemental are, funding. What are the rules? At, what are the rules under CARES Act? There, there's no rules. They have no rules. They they just said, give us. We're going to make a. We, we want to know what you spent, and we want it documented, and we are going to make an allocation based on some formula that's yet to be determined. The only rules that were available for for populations over half a million, we didn't qualify. And there was the rule there was a per capita allocation. So like Williamson County got $93 million. So at this point, though, we feel comfortable that someone will reimburse us, hopefully someday, for uh, uh, non-department head overtime, FEMA, somebody. So we, well, let's say that Correct. we know someone should reimburse us for, for the non-department heads. We have no even inkling of uh, other than hope that we would get reimbursed for department heads. Okay, so so not having that policy um, doesn't respectfully necessarily mean that we are letting the taxpayer be exposed because really what we're doing is by having the policy right now we're taking a risk for the taxpayer because until we know that someone is going to reimburse us, which we don't for overheads, then the then the real risk is are we willing to take the risk for the taxpayer? hoping that the CARES Act or somebody will see, you know, there's a lot of things we hope will happen with, with all this coronavirus and things that are going on, but right now we have no guarantee, so we're rolling the dice and saying, taxpayer, we're going to pay these, we're going to pay this overhead, potentially for I don't know how long, and, and I've got some individual concerns with certain ones, but in general, because that's the real, that's the real dynamic now, because we don't know if they're going to. We don't know if CARES is. We hope, we pray, we think, we, but we don't know, so the gamble is, and, and you're right, it's not a huge amount, but if we keep going under this emergency act, it could be a lot of money. I mean, but we really. What I mean, about we, the next disaster? We've got a disaster. We could we, we could have a disaster June one. We could not get reimbursed for that too by rolling the dice on these overheads for the department heads because we wouldn't have gotten reimbursed for that under FEMA. In other words, FEMA was the agency that dealt with the hurricane. They said. Doesn't matter if you had a policy in place. We weren't going to reimburse you for department heads. No, that's not that's not true. Go ahead. That's what. FEMA does not re reimburse for department heads, whether you have a policy or not, is what I thought you told us. They do. For department heads. Yes. So for department heads, FEMA will reimburse us for what we're doing right now. Yes. Okay. So next emergency, you're so, oh, you're, you said because this one didn't have a department head reimbursement. Okay, I misunderstood that. I thought it was, we didn't know we had a gap. We had overtime for, for non-department heads, so those were always reimbursable. 
the gap was we didn't have one for overtime for department heads. Right. Okay, so what you're saying is now with the policy in place, if we have a hurricane June 1, God forbid, then department heads will be reimbursed also. 100%. Okay, that clears that part. That was That's what I wasn't clear on, and that's what I was trying to get clear on, so you, you made that clear. Okay, so then I do go back to the kind of the – and, and I, don't, I don't mean any offense to department heads, and I, I, but I mean I do – and Julie's here, but I want Julie to come tell me. I don't understand how HR, why HR has overhead. I don't understand why IT, when Lance stands up here and says, hey, IT, for this, for because right now we're not going to get reimbursed for this one, right? This is the one I'm worried about. We're not going to get reimbursed. For the department heads. We don't know that. Well. Just FEMA, just FEMA. FEMA is the only one that, that you will not get reimbursed from that funding source. For, I'm not even sure FEMA would apply here because of the CARES Act. And that's probably right, and, and that's a fair thing. So we don't have anything in place with the CARES Act now, now that says it, it, that's going to happen. So that's like, right. So when Lance stands up in front of us and says, this is pretty much how I work all the time, I go, well, okay. Then that's his – he kind of knows that's his job. That he, You know, his, his comment was, these are the hours that I work all the time. So he kind of knows that that's his – his job as a department head is he's going to be putting in this, these kind of hours on a regular basis, was what he said last time he was here. So my concern there is, and my concern, and I want to know about, you know, HR and, and what they've been doing that has caused overhead, the IT one, and and the and I, I get now the, the thing with Melissa, I, even though I think an emergency operations director should know coming in that an emergency happens, you're going to be working your butt off. But hey, if we can get reimbursed for it, great. Anything we, we can't on this one. Our bad, we fix that, good for us, or good for you, good for us. Um, so th so some of those I do kind of want to know what, what goes on and all that because we're not going to get, well, theoretically we're not going to get reimbursed. We could, hopefully we will, but we could because I'm really along the lines of these two commissioners that mm -hmm. I, I believe, I do not know, but I believe if, if we had someone, and we keep using Edward because nobody's questioned, you know, and, and I – we, you know, we keep using Edward as an example. I really believe that if Edward were able to say, or Julie, or Lance, or any of them, hey, you, you take care of this today, you know, so that I don't have to work four hours of overtime. I don't want people working overtime. I mean, I, don't, I want them to go home. Well, I don't want the sheriff to have to work a million and a half uh, dollars worth of overtime, and I've never seen this court question oh, once well, whether or not here. their checks and balances. You have been here, Judge. You know, we, we spent yeah. four years doing it before you got well, here. But, well, nothing's changed. Budget. <laughs> Nothing's changed. It's still on there. <laughs> it's not relevant to this discussion. Uh, I can tell you that the, this court questioned well, not, the sheriff. Well, not since I've been here. Time. Not, fair enough. Well, no, we talked about it last time. But what he did was this this sheriff started putting in place some things to better recruitment. We were paid. We paid more. So right. We, I'm saying we, we haven't looked at their time. No, 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 no. I'm saying we addressed some of the problems that were inherent in I, why I the sheriff you. worked so much overtime. This court addressed it, paid them more, did yeah. some things, said, hey, if you want to advertise, come talk about that you know don't put right. your name on the bill don't put your face on the billboard right. i'm just saying we that. haven't called but the sheriff question, right we i understand we put those lots. mechanisms but we haven't looked at their timesheets and questioned the way they document they allocate or whether their chiefs are supervising we their will. employees we, it's budget time judge we will don't well worry, it's coming. but but the point is is that i think that what, what you want to know she's here so i am going to invite her up uh in just in just a moment but again this policy can't be Picking and choosing disasters. You either have a policy that covers disasters He's or not. That up. He's cleared that yeah, up. Yeah, I want to make sure you're good on that. I am now. And, and, I, and, and, I, and there's no guarantee we're going to get money back from sanitizer. Uh, Let me clarify that. We're not choosing disasters. It's what says on here. You know, it, it doesn't, we're not choosing. It says right here that this, this hourly compensation for workers for hours worked over the penitentiary of the disaster up to 14 days. Unless a longer period is approved by the commissioner's court. So at 14 days, you stop, you review it again, and we approve it again, or we don't approve it again. That's, that's the policy it says right here. Julie gave me that policy, you know, and that's, that's what it says. And so we're, so. Can you, microphone. And that, Belinda, we've got to get you on a microphone. I'm sorry. Can you move over to the, dot, to the podium? It's for the video purposes. There's essential personnel. So Belinda's saying to you, that's exactly why it's on the court today, is to make sure that you can approve the next 
14 days and so on, so on. What I'm telling you is, is that uh, make certain that, that, um, that Belinda gives you, here go, go ahead, Belinda. So I just want to clarify, you know, y'all been talking about the policy and yes, that, that is, I guess, two courts ago, y'all did include the department heads and as it is, um, really your policy stood y'all just included the department heads and it's as commissioner gonzalez has read you know that that it's good for 14 days until the court approves um, a longer period of time and so that is on the agenda today for y'all's approval so because, um because y'all aren't here um we're not here to talk about the policy we're not here to talk about the policy we're here to extend the 14 no to a, to uh to approve the overtime. And so when y'all take action, because that's what's on the agenda today, just the approval for of the every, overtime. For everybody. Uh, for and, everybody. Right? And right. certainly it would be however y'all are going to um, word your motion and is also the time frame for that. So, so if it's gone over the 14 days already, mm -hmm. right, we can still approve all the overtime that's gone over 14 days? Yes. But we can stop here, say no more after this? That That's the way your policy reads. And, and, and again, if we do that, then you're exposing the county in a hurricane. No, no. You can't do it beforehand. Same for this time. Yeah. Right, but I'm saying you need a standing policy. Julie, you need to come and clarify this. Wait, I have a, a question for yeah. uh, Belinda. Belinda. That's what I was going to ask. I mean, why do we have it on closed? I mean, what, what are we doing here that well, I can think or Belinda cannot be done in closed session? I mean, we can go back there in the back. We're asking the lawyer if you want to. I'm not saying that I have to. Well, I'm, I'm just I'm wondering what's the difference between what we're talking about now and what is anything, this, right? what is mentioned for closed session. Um, certainly, I think uh, an agenda item was put on executive in case y'all had some legal questions about you know whether they should or could legally needed to be paid or not. So if y'all had any legal questions for me, then I certainly can address those in closed session. And we have to go to closed anyway, so. It, you can ask. Well, you want to do it back there for a while? Oh, fine with me. You all right? <laughs> well, um, could we get Maggie a, a towel, please? <laughs> what is it? Uh, just some paper towels, please. I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get it. I don't mind. We'll put some in between <laughs> rounds. Okay, so, uh, so we can go to executive session. Julie, do you have any clarification at all? I mean, have we have we articulated it? Clearly, because the original employee policy from July 2019 had everybody in it except for electeds. Is that correct? No, it had, yes, correct, correct. Everybody was in except for electeds. And then in September, when we adjusted the policy, there was a departure, and, elect, and department heads were removed, and then two months ago, we put it back in. We're talking about two different policies. Okay, go ahead. In charge of the Noises County employee policy. Okay. If you don't mind, lower the lower the mic and then give us a second here. Okay. Start again. Forgive me. So We're back in now. July, I amended the county policy on pay for um, elected uh, department heads. Okay. And so we approved that was approved in July. To, here in court. Yes, correct by commissioner's court to pay exempt employees. We're going to convert them to hourly wages. And so that is still standing in our Nueces County Employee Policy Manual. Okay. And then, and then the secondary policy. The secondary policy is Dale's policy. Whose policy is it? Okay, the county's policy, the one that Jag's reading from. No, no. I think he was reading my essential policy. Okay. So that one is still standing in the Nueces County Policy Manual. Um, you brought the other one. Who, who, who's? That's not my policy. I don't know where that policy came from, Dale. Okay, so the disaster finance policy. The disaster finance. Tyner. 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 He needs to get on mic. He can't talk to us without mic. Yeah, you got to get on mic, Dale. Somebody's, yeah. That was in the uh, disaster finance policy, which is not part of the personnel rules or civil service rules. Yes, we, we went in and, and drafted the policy. We, we submitted out this, the, 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 the policy to every department in question. We sent it out to the county attorney. We sent it to HR. We sent it to risk management. We sent it to personing. Right. Uh, do, 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 developed with everything from everything that, that the EOCS would do, to revolve. We submitted it for approval. Then we were instructed that we had to exclude department heads, and that's why there was Amendment 10 brought in at a later time to exchange it where department heads were 
removed, and we were told it's for Department of Labor. Now, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but that's what we were instructed to do. That's why it was brought up. Right. So that conflict is what brings us here today. And, and you have to, again, you're sorry, you have to keep using the, the, the microphone. And so, again, the idea is to, is to protect the county uh, so that we can keep FEMA reimbursement available to us for any disaster. That's the idea. Right. Tell us about the 14 days. Belinda um, believes that we need to make, there actually is action today that's required. The action is, is that we approve what we have already accumulated. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. We are still currently under the disaster, so it, it, it continues. Well, let me tell you, it should have stopped at 14 days, but it didn't, okay? According to that policy there, it should have stopped after 14 days. It should have come back to court, but we didn't. So now we have 45 days instead of 14 days to pay. And I, I don't care. We can pay the 45 days. You know, it's double the amount that we should have stopped. But I, I'm, I'm making a motion that we, we stop. We don't... We, we stop here to the last pay we get. Well, the, l let me just say this. Number one, it's the county attorney's p job and position to make sure that our policies are consistent. Right. Okay? And Laura cannot be here today. And Belinda is here in her stead, and you're welcome to address it, Belinda. And, and I guess my question was, is there a specific policy? Uh, I'd suggest at this point we go into exact. I'm, I'm I mean, that that's fine. It's legal, but... But uh, let me make a quick comment. If okay. We change this policy, then the next time that there is a disaster, a different kind, possibly a hurricane, it w it won't apply. Yeah. But you don't have to change it. We should just. I mean, no, I think he's just talking about approving the the yeah. approving the um, forty five days. The forty five days. He's saying every this policy needs to be amended because I think when it got presented, okay. We didn't know that COVID was going to be ongoing. Well, it's it's new to everybody, and usually a hurricane lasts fourteen days. Right. So I think that right. But I we need to rely on the county attorney to make this uh, adjustment so that we can be within the disaster. You cannot. You can have moments where you continue to approve, but really, people shouldn't have an expectation that their work will not be compensated during a disaster. You can't say, oh, I'm going to approve the first seven days of you working overtime, but I'm not going to approve the seven days. They shouldn't live in that kind of a, a, of a limbo. And it's going to really pertain when you have a hurricane or a wind or water event because your EOC team is working round the clock. And so 14 days does usually work for a hurricane. Uh, it just did not work for this particular type of event. So let's, let's do this. We can go into executive session, but there is something that needs to be done right now that's not legal at all, which is to approve the 45 days. Is that correct? But he wants to, we want to, I think that's what we want to talk about. Okay, that's fine. I just know that there is an action item. Right, and so because it's HR related, can Julie come back there to answer questions like this too that are really related? Because I am way off now. Not I thought I understood this. Now I'm confused again. Okay, well, let's, let's do that then. I just need to make sure that I read the executive session pieces because that's required under the law. I Give think me. that's it, right, on, Judge, on the agenda? So that would be our last item other than That's the correct. <coughs> Give me one second. Is Sorry. item B tabled or? Which one? It was, it was tabled and we voted on that. B1? Um, B1? <laughs> no, executive session item B. Oh, no, right. I, I meant regular agenda, my bad. No, I think that we still have another executive session too, right, John, Judge? would you be so good as to give me your last page on the agenda? I don't know where it slipped. That's okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, we have one other. I won't look at him. One other uh, executive it, session. Um, at this time, I'm giving notice, public notice, that Commissioner's Court is electing to go into executive session to discuss matters listed on the agenda and that's authorized under provisions of the Open Meetings Act, Chapter 551 of the exec Texas Government Code, and specifically in accordance with Vernon's sections 551071, 072, 073, 074, 075, 076, 86, and 87. And we are going to consult with our attorney, including matters relating to litigation, real property, prospective gifts, personnel, termination, county advisory bodies, security devices, and economic development negotiations, and other matters that may be discussed in executive session. At this time, for the clerk, it's 341. I can't predict, but I don't think that we'll be I don't know. I'll give you a text. But let's say four-ish. Okay. 
we do have these two items to go to. And at that, I'll gavel out at 341. And I'll meet you guys in there. John, thanks. I'm sure mine is here somewhere. Let me turn the mics off.
great. If the clerk is listening, we're going to come back on the record. Picture, I'm if anyone can hear me, I left my phone in the office and it needs to be brought to the commissioner's courtroom.
Okay, uh, we're going to come back on the record. We we do we did uh, discuss the items that were on executive session, and there is a motion. I'm so sorry. It's 4:41 p.m. We're back on the record. There were two items in executive session, one of which needs action. And at this time, I will take a motion on the item uh, that is number one. Judge, I guess I'll make the motion. Number eight. I'm sorry. That's correct. We'll go back to item, right? It was just legal discussion in executive, but we need to rule on item, item eight in the regular. Go ahead, Commissioner. Hey, uh, you know, we're reviewing the policy, uh, Judge, where it says hourly compensation for hours worked over 40 hours by employees and department heads shall begin on the day of the start of the disaster and shall continue during the dependency of the disaster up to 14 days, unless a longer period is approved by the commissioner's court after the 14 days. So my motion at this would be kind of staying with the policy, the, although it says 14 days, my motion is that we approve all the 45 days for all employees and department heads and continue for another 14 days as of this date. And at the end of those 14 days, the commissioner's court will review to see if we stop or continue. I've got a motion and a second, and all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. aye opposed, same sign. Um, under executive, again, no action needed. And now we're going to turn to, sadly, some uh, very special people that we've lost. And so I'll ask if commissioners, in no particular order, whoever would like to start to, to adjourn in memory of. Yes, Commissioner Modis. <clears throat> So the first one is uh, in memory of uh, the Honorable Judge Rudolfo Rudy Thames. He passed away on April 30th at the age of 72, and uh, his uh, peaceful death marked the end of his battle with dementia. Uh, he was a first-generation Mexican-American born in Corpus Christi, Corpus Christi uh, graduated from Miller High School, attended Del Mar College, and completed a Bachelor's of Art in Education from Texas A&I in Kingsville. He later earned his doctorate in jurisprudence from Bates College of Law at the University of Houston. After graduation, he returned to Corpus Christi, worked as a city prosecutor, and then later he became the chief municipal judge for the city of Corpus Christi. Until his retirement, he worked for the city for 33 years. Uh, he was a faithful member and attended uh, Kelsey Memorial Night at Methodist Church. And despite his dementia, he never forgot his family and love of Jesus Christ, his parents, preceded him his death along with two siblings, Raymond and Mary Helen Rodriguez. Um, he was sur survived by his wife, Olga, 49 years, his children, Alethea, Rudy Jr., and Christopher, along with a daughter-in-law, Janelle, and three grandchildren. Uh, the visitation was held on the 4th at, uh, at his church, and the funeral service was held yesterday, May 5th. Uh, due to COVID restrictions, they, they were limited, and it was only for family. Um, in lieu of flowers, they're asking for donations to be made to the Alzheimer's Association or the Coastal Bend Agency on Aging. And this is personal for me. I, I knew Rudy Thames pretty much my entire life. We attended the same church. Uh, my family and my in-laws, especially very close with uh, Rudy and his family and his wife. And I actually got to do a video um, uh, greeting to the family for the service, for the funeral service. And so that was very special uh, for me to be able to do that. I very great loss for us, for our community. Um, when I was on city council for uh, three out of my four terms there, I was um, a member of the uh, municipal court committee and for two of those terms I served as the chair. And so every two years we would uh, review and, and decide whether to renew uh, those judges. And so it was my honor to work closely with, with Judge Thames. And so um, it's a great loss for our community and just for myself and for my family. Also, um, it was announced that Wanda Harris, who was a member of the uh, American Federation of, of Teachers, passed away uh, this past weekend. She was uh, very close in working with the late Linda Bridges, and she worked in Corpus Christi many years before moving to Houston. Um, during my years on the school board, she was actually back here in Corpus Christi working with CCAFT, with Ray McMurray, then later with uh, Nancy, Dr. Nancy Veda. And so um, just... Uh, wanted to recognize her, uh, the loss of, of Wanda, but also her 
life that she gave to education and to her brothers and sisters in the CCAFT, and so she will be missed. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Vaughn. Commissioner Mattis, I mean, Commissioner Gonzalez. Commissioner Chesney. Judge, I wanted to um, add my condolences to the um, Thomas family. Uh, I also served on the city council with um, Commissioner Mattis and uh, had the honor of working with Judge for quite a long time, and he was an outstanding member uh, of the city staff for many, many years, and uh, I certainly could not say it any better than um, Commissioner Mattis did, but uh, condolences to, to the family as well. He was just a, a super, super good public servant. I uh, wanted to also uh, mention the loss of Al Hinojosa Sr. Um, Al was uh, passed away on May 3rd, two months from the age of 70. He was born in uh, 1950 to his parents, Louis and Gloria Hinojosa, and he leaves behind uh, a lot of, of, of family members here. He, uh, they raised five children and an adopted son. Uh, many of you may know Fred and um, Hinojosa and some of the Hinojosa brothers here in town. And so certainly our condolences go uh, out to uh, Mr. Hinojosa and his family. Uh, also to the family of Tanya Lee Tucker uh, here locally. Uh, Tanya fought a difficult and courageous battle with cancer for seven years and always believed she would gain her health back and overcome the battle. The way she died is like the way she lived. She wrote her own rules and paved her own way. Uh, she lived, uh, um, unfortunately, for only 44 years and lost her battle with cancer recently. So to the family of Tanya uh, Lee Tucker, condolences go out. Uh, also to the family of uh, Beatrice Salinas. Uh, Ms. Salinas, um, unfortunately, passed away after an unsuccessful surgery this week uh, at the age of 82. Her daughter works for me at uh, First Title Company, and uh, I know how uh, sad and difficult this has been a time for them. She was d definitely quite a quite a lady and lived a, a wonderful life, and uh, certainly sorry for their loss as well for the uh, Salinas family. Uh, Mr. James Edward Kaler uh, lived a good long life, 94 years old, and Mr. Kaler, uh, his, you, you, for those of you who've been involved in Corpus Christi and the Flower Bluff area, may know Lynn Kaler. Um, so we wanted to pass on our condolences to the, to their family as well. Uh, but again, he, he did live a good and happy life for 94 years. He was uh, stationed here in Corpus Christi in Naval Air Station in 1975 and was a, a very uh, successful um, uh, uh, military man who had many awards and medals throughout his career. So condolences to the Kaler family as well. And that is, unfortunately, I have more than I'd like to have today, Judge, but that is all I have at this point. Judge? Uh, yes. Do you have one? Yes, of course. <clears throat> okay, I want to speak after you do. Oh, okay. All right. <clears throat> So we mentioned this when we had a special meeting, but we didn't have the obituary at the time. And he's, he was too important for our community uh, to not read and honor him properly. In addition, I've signed a um, very nice um, resolution that we are adjourning on the 6th of May um, in his honor, and this is the court adjourning in memory of Sam for Keach. Tyner, is that is that correct? That's correct. And just for your information, Judge, we ha have four of those made. They would go to Vicky. That's so nice, uh, Tyner. One, one to Daryl, one to Kim, uh, his daughters, and to uh, Christy, the widow of Sam Jr. Okay, great. And so I'm gonna. I'm going to leave this here as I've already signed it, and then I'm going to ask that you take a look at this too because it may need commissioner signing. It's on another item, but let me let me read this because this is beautifully done, and I can't say it any better. And Sam Fora Keach was a Robstown area resident all for but th three of his 75 years, and he died on April 24th, 2020. He was the former editor of the Robstown Record, which was also known as the Noises County Record Star, and he began his newspaper work as a printer's devil. I've never heard of that term. And a photographer at 12 years old. A 1963 graduate of Robstown High School, he earned his Bachelor of Journalism in 1966 from the University of Texas, Hookham. While at UT, he was managing editor of the Daily Texan, which is a really big deal. By the way, the gentleman was here before you. I thought this was, Sam would have loved it. Jeff Barton, he was also the editor, one of the editors of the Daily Texan. And he worked on the sports and news staff covering some of Daryl Royal's greatest moments. This guy was a legend. He was just a legend here. And, you know, um, at 21, he became the managing editor of the Edinburgh Daily Review. And he returned to family's, family's Robstown newspaper in 1967. 
He was one of four generations of his family to serve as president of the South Texas Press Association. He authored a book called The Family Affair, which is the first 75 years of the South Texas Press Association. That was published in 2002. And he was the historian of that organization until his death. His community service included Scoutmaster, Robstown's Boy Scout Troop 184, and both Vicki and his sons earned Eagle Scouts Award there. In 1983, he was Scoutmaster of the South Texas Troop to the World Jamboree in Canada. He was a Wood Badge trained, a Vigil member, Order of the Arrow, Order of the Silver Beaver Award, and he also served on the Nueces County Memorial Hospital, Northwest Regional Hospital, Robstown Area Historical Muse Museum, Robstown Economic Development, and the Bank of Robstown. And let's face it, he was the driving force behind the Richard M. Borchard Regional Fairgrounds. He loved the fairgrounds. And that's why, of course, we have the great library named after he and his wife. The Noyce, here it comes. Noyce County Keats Library was named in honor of him for his family's 80 years of journalism, informing the public and encouraging the continuation of education of youth in our area. And um, he was preceded in death by some loving um, loving. Um, family members, including his son, Sam Four Keach, in 2017. And of course, his wife survives him 57 years, Vicki. We've already mentioned all of the children um, uh, that we're going to get this uh, resolution to. And then this is important. In lieu of flowers, donations may be made in memory to the Robstown Area Historical Museum, the South Texas Press Association Scholarship, um, or the Texas Newspaper Foundation. He was a newspaper man through and through. A private graveside service was held in Robstown with just his family, and we're going to have, I believe, an opportunity to celebrate with his family his entire life. A celebration of life will be planned for a future date. I don't think, Tyner, we have a date, or do we now? Because this was a while back. No, we don't know, and it was so short notice that we, as you know, that a bunch of us collected money. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, to get something for the family and flowers, and yes. we just didn't meet the, the meet the cutoff for the uh, the viewing. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna save that. I think that's good. For for whenever we have this memorial. Hey, Tanner, would there be any way? I know. I'd, I mean, I, I don't want to have to redo it, but maybe you could do another one. I we, I think we'd probably all like to add our names to. I think that's a great idea. Okay, we'll do. Uh, um, yes, I'll get Margaret to uh, do that, and we'll pass it out, and we'll do one of those instead. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. So. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Yeah, um, what I'm going to say right now, Judge, I, I have to say it. I, I wasn't going to say it, but it's been bothering me, and I think I need to say it because I've been thinking about it. You know, it bothers me that somebody called me last night to the house and um, kind of felt like I was pressured, you know, about voting, how I was going to vote today from the uh, Labor Council. And I really don't appreciate that. You know, I'll try to get a hold of that lady. I didn't talk to her. I'll try to, I'll try to get a hold of her. But, you know, when somebody calls me and talks about an agenda item and, and not asking me but saying why I should, you know, and it really just it doesn't really concern her, I guess, one bit, uh, because that's an agenda item that we discuss here. And so I'm really, I'm really disappointed that somebody actually would call me and try to you know, put some pressure on me, and I really don't appreciate it. And, uh, and uh, for the record... You know, I want this for the record because I want to make sure that it wasn't because of that that I make the decisions I make today. So that's all i got to say. Okay. Uh, any more adjournments? Okay, then we will do the official adjournment at 4, at 4.55 p.m. And we are adjourned. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Tyner. Let me get the mic.